will outline why I believe it was right that I did not intervene in the investigation when I became aware of it, even though Alex Salmond asked me to do so. And finally, although the mistake made in the conduct of the investigation meant ultimately that the action for judicial review could not be defended, I will demonstrate that the decisions taken at each stage of it were legally sound. I'm sure we'll return to all of these matters in detail. However, I want to focus in these opening remarks on the issues around my contact with Alex Salmond on 2nd April and my contact three days earlier with his former Chief of Staff. Alec has claimed in his testimony to the committee that the meeting in my home on the 2nd of April took place with a shared understanding on the part of all the participants of the issues for discussion. In other words, that he turned up to the meeting believing I already knew everything. I think it's worth noting, even just in passing, that this in fact represents a change in his position. On the 14th of January 2019, after the conclusion of the judicial review, a spokesperson issued this comment on his behalf. Alec has no certainty as to the state of knowledge of the First Minister before then, by which he meant the 2nd of April. A brief account of what happened on the 2nd of April suggests, as per his comment in January 2019, that he did not assume full knowledge on my part in advance. When he arrived at my house, he was insistent that he speak to me entirely privately, away from his former Chief of Staff, Jeff Aberdeen, uh, and Duncan Hamilton, who had accompanied him, and my Chief of Staff, who was with me. That would have seemed unnecessary had there already been a shared understanding on the part of all of us. He then asked me to read a letter he had received from the Permanent Secretary. This letter set out the fact that complaints of sexual harassment had been made against him by two individuals. It made clear that these complaints were being investigated under the procedure adopted at the end of 2017, and it set out the details of what he was alleged to have done. Reading this letter is a moment in my life that I will never forget. And although he denied the allegations, he gave me his account of one of the incidents complained of, which he said he had apologised for at the time. What he described constituted, in my view, deeply inappropriate behaviour on his part. Perhaps another reason why that moment is embedded so strongly in my mind. At the time he was showing me the letter and outlining his account, Jeff and Duncan were doing the same with my Chief of Staff. Again, this would seem unnecessary had she and I known everything in advance. Questions have been raised about a conversation I had three days earlier on 29th March 2018 with Jeff Aberdeen and another individual. I've not seen Mr Aberdeen's own account of that conversation. However, I obviously know the account Mr Salmond has given of the meeting, although he also said on Friday that he had not been given a readout of it. Let me say up front that I have no wish to question the sincerity of Jeff's recollection. Jeff Aberdeen is somebody I remain extremely fond of. But it is clear that my recollection is different and that I did not and do not attach the same significance to that discussion that he has. The purpose of the conversation seemed to be to persuade me to meet with Alec as soon as possible, which I did agree to do in that conversation. Jeff did indicate that a harassment type issue had arisen, but my recollection is that he did so in general terms. Since an approach from Sky News in November 2017, and I mentioned this in my written evidence to the committee, I had harboured a lingering suspicion that such issues in relation to Mr Salmond might rear their head. So hearing of a potential issue would not have been in itself a massive shock. What I recall most strongly about the conversation is how worried Jeff seemed to be about Alec's welfare and state of mind, which, as a friend, concerned me. He also said he thought Alec might be considering resigning his party membership. It was these factors that led me to agree to meet him, and it was these factors that placed the meeting on the 2nd of April firmly in the personal and party space. Not unreasonably uh, at all, some people have asked how I could have forgotten the conversation on 29th March, and I certainly wish my memory of it was more vivid. But as I have stated, it was the detail of the complaints under the procedure that I was given on 2nd April that was significant and indeed shocking. That was the moment at which any suspicions I had or general awareness that there was a problem became actual and detailed knowledge. It's also worth saying that even if I had known on 29th March everything I learned on 2nd April, my actions wouldn't necessarily have been different. Given what I was told about the distress Alec was in and how it was suggested to me that he might be intending to handle matters, 
it is likely that I would still have agreed to meet him as a friend and as his party leader. And as I also set out in written evidence, my decision not to record the meeting on 2nd April immediately wasn't about the classification I gave it, not about it being a party rather than a government meeting. It was because I did not want to compromise the independence or the confidentiality of the process underway. All of which begs the question of why I would have gone to great lengths to conceal a conversation that had taken place a mere three days earlier. Let me turn now to my decision to not immediately report the contact. Sections 4.22 and 4.23 of the Ministerial Code seek to guard against undisclosed outside influence on decisions that ministers are involved in and likely to have an influence on, such as changes in policy or the awarding of contracts. This situation, as I saw it, was the opposite of that. The terms of the procedure excluded me from any investigation into a former minister. I had no role in the process and should not even have known that an investigation was underway. So in my judgment, the undue influence that section four is designed to avoid would have been more likely to arise had those conducting the investigation been informed that I knew about it. I didn't want to take the risk that they might be influenced even subconsciously by any assumption of how I might want the matter handled. Their ability to do the job independently would be best protected by me saying nothing. It's also my reading of the code that had I reported it, the fact of my meeting with Alex Salmond would have had to be made public, potentially breaching the confidentiality of the process. It was for those reasons that I did not immediately record the 2nd April meeting or the subsequent phone call on 23rd April in which Mr Salmond wanted me to tell the Permanent Secretary that I knew about the investigation and persuade her to agree to mediation. It is worth noting that the Ministerial Code places a number of obligations on ministers uh, and respect for the impartiality of civil servants and the confidentiality of government business are also obligations imposed on me by the Code. My judgment on that changed when Alex Salmond made it clear to me that he was seriously considering legal action. I felt then that I had no choice but to inform the Permanent Secretary, which I did on 6 June 2018. I also confirmed to her that I had no intention of intervening in the process and I did not intervene in the process. Mr Salmon's anger at me for this, I think, is evident. But intervening in a process that I was expressly excluded from and trying on behalf of a close associate to change the course it might take would have been an abuse of my role. The committee is also rightly interested in the judicial review and the government has now published legal advice that informed the decisions we took. It's clear from that advice that while the government had very strong prospects of defending Mr Salmon's initial challenge, that changed over a two-month period from late October to late December. The concerns raised by Council caused by emerging evidence regarding the role of the investigating officer undoubtedly caused me and others uh, to pause to check if we should continue to defend the case. However, as late as December the 11th, the view of law officers following consultation with Council was as follows. Very clear that no question or need to drop the case. The Lord Advocate clear that even if prospects are not certain, it is important that our case is heard. Senior counsel made clear that his note was not intended to convey that he didn't think we have a statable case. They concluded that, including on the appointment of the investigating officer, and again I'm quoting, we have credible arguments to make across the petition. It was when that changed that the decision was taken to concede. In any legal challenge a government faces, there is a balance of risk. That risk cannot be eliminated, but the task of ministers is to consider carefully all of the advice we receive and consider the broader public interest. And the test in the ministerial code is not the view of external lawyers, but of law officers. Convener, finally, and you'll be glad to hear briefly, um, though I hope to say more as we get into questions, I feel I must rebut the absurd suggestion that anyone acted with malice or as part of a plot against Alex Salmond. That claim is not based in any fact. What happened is this, and it is simple. A number of women made serious complaints about Alex Salmond's behaviour. The government, despite the mistake it undoubtedly made, tried to do the right thing. As First Minister, I refused to follow the age-old pattern of allowing a powerful man to use his status and connections to get what he wants. The police conducted an independent criminal investigation. The Crown Office, as it does in prosecutions every single day of the week, considered the evidence and decided there was a case to answer. A court and a jury did their jobs 
And now this committee and an independent investigation are considering what happened and why. For my part, I am, if not relishing the prospect, relieved to be finally facing this committee. But given all that has brought us to this moment, being here also makes me really sad. And in all the legitimate consideration of this, sometimes the personal and human elements of this situation are lost. Alex spoke on Friday about what a nightmare the last couple of years have been for him. And I don't doubt that. I have thought often about the impact on him. He was someone I cared about for a long time. And maybe that's why on Friday, I found myself searching for any sign, any sign at all that he recognised how difficult this has been for others too. First and foremost, for women who believed his behaviour towards them was inappropriate. But also for those of us who have campaigned with him, worked with him, cared for him and considered him a friend and who now stand unfairly accused of plotting against him. That he was acquitted by a jury of criminal conduct is beyond question, beyond question. But I know just from what he told me that his behaviour was not always appropriate. And yet across six hours of testimony, there was not a single word of regret, reflection, or even simple acknowledgement of that. I can only hope that in private, the reality might be different. Today though is about my actions. I have never claimed in this or anything else to be infallible. I have searched my soul on all of this many, many times over. It may very well be that I didn't get everything right, that's for others to judge. But in one of the most invidious political and personal situations I have ever faced, I believe I acted properly and appropriately and that overall I made the best judgments I could. For anyone, at least anyone willing to listen with an open mind, that is what I will seek to demonstrate today. Thank you, uh, First Minister. And uh, we'll now go on to questions. Um, our uh, committee and, and therefore our report is split into various sections. It's about the development and implementation of the policy. It's about the judicial review and, of course, the ministerial code. And we will attempt to chronologically go through that uh, for ease of the session, although there will be crossovers, that's understandable. So can I ask the first question, please, about the new policy that was put in place and ask you to give us an outline of the development process of that policy? The genesis of the new policy uh, was, of course, the Me Too revelations of late 2017. I don't need to go into detail for people around this table. This was something that rocked the UK, indeed rocked many parts of the world, something that began with very serious historic uh, allegations about people in the entertainment and media business very quickly became something that uh, gripped the political system here in the UK. There were allegations about uh, sexual harassment, uh, including historic sexual harassment uh, at Westminster. And then in late October, and I'm sure everybody around this table vividly remembers this, there were allegations, I think it was mainly in the Sunday Herald at the time, about uh, allegations of sexual harassment in this institution and a concern that there were not proper processes in place to allow those to come forward and that people, women, didn't have the confidence to bring uh, complaints forward. So that is the backdrop I wrote to the presiding officer, I, I believe on the Monday after that story to suggest cross-party discussions. They took place the following day, as I recall. And the cabinet uh, that morning, as I believe the UK government was doing or had been doing, uh, had a discussion about this and decided that we should review our processes. We didn't decide what the outcome of that review should be, but we decided that it was right, given the concerns that had been raised about lack of processes, or at least lack of processes that people had confidence in, that that should happen. Um, that was a commission uh, that was given by Cabinet to the senior civil service. Uh, the Deputy First Minister uh, indicated that to Parliament, I believe that afternoon, that afternoon, I think it was, uh, I took part in discussions in the presiding officer's room here with 
representatives of other parties. And I think it's fair to say at that time, all parties were reviewing their processes as well. I know my party was and did. Um, you've heard evidence, I know, from senior civil servants who were very involved in this work. They did an assessment of the gaps. Uh, there's been discussion about a route map that they had prepared, early drafts uh, of the, the procedure uh, were prepared. Uh, the inclusion of former ministers, because one of the gaps that had been identified was the inability to, under our existing processes, to investigate or address historic complaints. The inclusion of former ministers was there from the outset. It hadn't been expressly requested by me or by the cabinet. That was something that was included because it was perceived to be a gap. Uh, the procedure then went through a, an iterative process of, of drafting and redrafting and changes. Um, I think I would uh, probably summarise uh, three key policy changes that took place over that period from early November to me signing off the policy on 20th of December. Um, firstly, that current ministers came to be added into it. Um, the view being, as I understand it, that it made sense to have all ministers uh, dealt with in the same uh, procedure. Um, secondly, uh, at a later stage, I think uh, around mid to late November, uh, my, my a first minister's role um, in effectively having a sort of gateway uh, part of the process of deciding with the permanent secretary whether an investigation should be triggered was removed so that that was something the permanent secretary could decide on her own and a first minister wouldn't have any role in that decision. And given this was a procedure about politicians or former politicians, uh, I thought that was appropriate. Um, and then finally, uh, the change that was made towards the end of the development, closer to me signing it off, uh, was that in the case of former ministers, uh, a first minister should not be told uh, about the investigation or the outcome until the end of that process. Um, I, I noted uh, Alex saying on Friday that he couldn't understand why that was the case for former ministers and not current uh, ministers. I, I have to confess to being quite astounded that a former first minister wouldn't understand that distinction. The reason why, and uh, to be perfectly frank, my preference would have been given that this was uh, about politicians or ex-politicians for that to have been the case overall. But for current ministers, it's important that a first minister uh, knows of any concerns that have been raised because you have an ongoing duty to decide whether somebody continues to be fit to hold office. So that is the reason for that dis distinction. Um, that's a, a summary uh, account convener, but I'm happy to go into any detail on any of these aspects that members wish. Thank you very much. I'm sure that will be the case. And I go first of all to Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, um, First Minister. I wonder if I can take you back to when the inquiry was announced, and uh, that was in January 2019, and you said at that point, I will answer any question to the fullest extent possible that my government will cooperate fully with all inquiries. The inquiries will be able to request whatever material they want, and I undertake today that we will provide whatever material they request. Why didn't that happen, First Minister? Um, Ms Mitchell, I, I consider that that has happened. Now, I uh, concede at the outset that this committee has been frustrated at not being able to access certain information that it wanted to access, and I, I readily acknowledge that some of that is uh, information and material that is not within the control or the gift of the Scottish Government. Uh, and I think I won't go into that because the committee knows the, the different categories here. Uh, the Scottish Government has made available to this committee uh, copious uh, amounts of information in terms of written uh, information, documents, m written material. And of course, civil servants and uh, now me today are giving uh, evidence orally. The main issue of difference between uh, the government and the committee, and, and I recognise this and I recognise the different views that exist, is around legal advice. And there is a long-standing convention uh, that governments do not release publicly their legal advice. And it's not a convention that is in place for no good reason. Uh, as a minister of uh, some uh, long-standing now, it is really important for the 
the governance of the country and to ensure that ministers are able to base their decisions on the best advice possible, open and frank advice, that that exists. Because otherwise, if you had a situation where legal advice was routinely published, lawyers may start to you know, fashion their advice with that in mind. So it's a, it's a convention that is important. And it's not just one that uh, the Scottish Government uh, adheres to, it's one that many governments, as I understand, adhere to. So, so that has been the basis for that decision. We, uh, the Lord Advocate, of course, has sat before this committee and shared very openly uh, the, the decision-making process around the judicial review and the factors that were taken into account by the government at different stages of consideration. Uh, there was also an agreement, I know, that the Deputy First Minister reached with the committee about sharing uh, some information uh, privately, but also uh, some information that was allowed to be shared publicly, effectively a summation of the legal advice. So we have sought uh, to try within the constraints of that convention to make information available to the committee. I appreciate the committee was not satisfied with that and that coupled uh, with some of the, in my view, completely unfounded allegations that have been made about the basis for decisions that people were taking uh, and particularly uh, you know, allegations that were being made around motives and uh, factors in the consideration of the judicial review, we decided yesterday to release uh, the legal advice and uh, the substantial uh, legal advice has been released. Um, I think the committee has been told there may be other material that we can uh, release later, but the committee can now look at uh, the council's opinions uh, that were given to the government, can track uh, the changing uh, prospects of, of the government, but also crucially, as I read out in my initial uh, remarks, can see that up until uh, well into December, the view of law officers was that it was appropriate that we continue to defend the case. And I'm sure as we come on to the judicial review later, I can go into more detail about why exactly that was the case. Um, openness, transparency and accountability is essential for any government to maintain trust. Um, but the Deputy First Minister has refused to allow the calculation of the costs of the Scottish Government Legal Department spent on the judicial review. That's likely to bring the total cost much nearer to £1 million than the 500 or 6,000 often quoted. He refused, as you've already uh, explained, to release external legal advice that it was clearly in the public interest to do and only did so as late as yesterday when he faced a vote of no confidence. But most frustrating for this committee has been the fact that despite us meeting two years, why we couldn't meet in public, we did all the groundwork in private to ensure that when we did meet last year in the summer, the government knew exactly the information we needed, required, and had already provided some of it. Despite this, in December 2000 and um, last year, 23rd of December, 288 complaint handling documents were sent to this committee, asked for at least six months before. And more generally, we faced delay, obstruction, of obfuscation, and still not receive some information that is crucial to our inquiry carrying out its remit. Is that acceptable, First Minister? Uh, clearly, in the terms you've just put it, Ms Mitchell, it, it would not be acceptable, but you'll not be surprised to hear that I... Well, I, I, I understand the frustration, um, and I'll come on to perhaps share some of that frustration. I, I would not accept the, the characterisation. Um, I, and I'll say this just as a statement of fact, it's not uh, in any we meant to uh, say that I'm not going to attempt to answer the question. I, at, at the outset of this investigation, and members are aware of this, I recused myself from the government's handling of it because I thought that was appropriate given that I am um, the subject of, at least in part, the subject of, of the investigation. Um, the government has made available uh, substantial amounts of written and oral evidence. Um, if, if there are, I'm not aware of what you are referring to that is within the government's control that we, you still feel that we haven't handed over. If, if that is, it hasn't already been made known to, to the government. If it can be, then I'm sure there will be attempts made uh, to, to rectify that. But uh, within the constraints that we operate within, I've already talked about uh, the, the position with legal advice, but of course there are also court orders uh, in place here and there is 
a very elaborate and substantial process that the government has had to go through to release information in line with all of its legal obligations. And I know the committee understands that because the committee has often had to go through that as well. There are other elements of uh, information that it has been claimed uh, the, the committee hasn't had when it should have done, and, and you know, that's for the committee to address, but uh, they are not within the, uh, the control of the government. Obviously, there is uh, material that is... Uh, restricted in terms of what can be published. I'm not sure it's restricted in terms of what the committee can consider because of a contempt of court order and there is the matter of information that was handed over in the course of a criminal trial and I know the committee's had uh, extensive deliberations with other witnesses uh, about that but there is no intention on the part of the government. I, you, when you say these things to me as First Minister I've got to take that seriously um, but there's no intention on the part of the government to withhold uh, relevant information from this committee. The, the final point I would make here, which is part where I will share some of the frustration. Um, as you know, and I should say, I understand why this is the case, so it's not intended to be in case there's any uh, suggestion that it is a criticism of the committee. I have waited a long, long time to be sitting here myself while allegations and claims have been swirling around about me without me having the ability to address them. And as information that has been claimed was devastating to the government's position and proved all sorts of things has come to light, um, including information that this committee has seen, it has proved to be nothing of the sort. Um, and therefore, I suppose there is also frustration on my part where information is not known to the committee. Often what is suggested about it bears very little relation to the, the reality of it. And therefore, what I would say is the more about this, within all the legal constraints that none of us can magic away, uh, I want as much of this to be known out there and public, because while the government made mistakes, and we'll come on to those, there's nothing here uh, that the government uh, has to hide. You mentioned, First Minister, that you've been frustrated waiting two years to give evidence. Most of us here have been in exactly the same position and more frustrated because the delay has been fairly and squarely because the government hasn't provided the information it could have had when it had. But let me turn me to your submission. Um, you say, as First Minister, I wanted to ensure that the Scottish government had robust procedures in place to allow any concerns or complaints by those in its employment to be properly and fairly considered. That hasn't happened, First Minister. Why do you think that's the case? It, it didn't happen in the case of the two complaints that we're considering here because the government made a mistake and a very serious mistake in how it applied the procedure to the investigation against uh, into Alex Salmond. Um, and as I said, I think in Parliament the day the judicial review was conceded, and I've said again today, I deeply regret that. I, you know, those words don't do justice to how I feel about that. Um, I feel sorry for it. I feel very angry uh, about it, uh, and I'm not going to try and suggest otherwise. Uh, that's what went wrong. The procedure itself, uh, and again, we'll come back to this, no doubt, when we talk about the judicial review. One of the reasons why even when the prospects were not as strong as they had been at the outset, the government wanted to continue with the judicial review was that a number of attacks, legal attacks and challenges had been made on the procedure itself, on the, the lawfulness uh, and appropriateness of the procedure. We thought and think that the procedure is lawful um, and sound. The procedure has, itself has never been declared unlawful, despite what Mr Salmond was trying to suggest to you on Friday. And we wanted, given the challenges that had been directed to the procedure, we wanted to find out through a court process whether they were justified or not, because this was, you know, again, despite some suggestions to the contrary, this was not a procedure that was put in place for Alex Salmond. This is a procedure that we intended to be in operation uh, and is still in operation uh, so that anybody who had complaints against ministers or former ministers could if they wanted to use it. So there was a public, legitimate public interest in determining whether any of these fundamental challenges to its, its essential lawfulness were, were justified. Now, you heard Alex say on Friday um, that his legal advice said that he had really good prospects. 
you've seen now the initial note on prospects from the Scottish Government, where the Scottish Government was confident that it could successfully defend um, and rebut all of these challenges. The fact is, we don't know who, who would have prevailed in that because the judicial review, entirely down to the mistake the Government made in the application of the procedure, uh, it didn't get to that stage. But what went wrong, Ms Mitchell, and I, you, you will not get me today in any way trying to sugarcoat uh, or shy away from this, the Government made a serious error around the appointment of the investigating officer. Um, and that's, of course, something that, as well as this committee looking into Laura Dunlop QC, is carrying out uh, an independent internal investigation for the government. Um, can I merely comment that to refer to this as a mistake or um, a serious error, somewhat disingenuous? Uh, if you could let me finish, First Minister. Um, the judicial review um, made it quite clear in Lord Pentland's order that the process was unlawful and it was tainted with bias. But that's for others to go into. Just to concentrate now on your role uh, as Deputy First Minister under fairness to, to work. In your submission, you said, I had no general concerns from 2008 to 2014. Um, when the, you as Deputy First Minister had a key role in that um, procedure then. Can you outline just exactly what that involved? And if it ever occurred to you then that the very high bar that was put in place in 2010, when um, the new Fairness to Work came into operation, that in order to make a formal complaint, the complainants had to put that in writing. And we know that these complaints, given the timescale, were against SNP ministers. That's a very high bar, um, First Minister, given it's someone so powerful, given it the effects potentially and career prospects. Did it ever occur to you that that wasn't um, the best way to encourage people to come forward and to have their complaints resolved? Uh, firstly, before I answer that, uh, Ms Mitchell, can I genuinely, I am not seeking to be disingenuous in my description of the error. I, you know, error, mistake, if there is a, a better word, I'm happy to use it. I am not defending it. I, I am deeply regretful, uh, deeply angry, um, and will always feel incredibly uh, bad uh, for principally the two women who were let down because of that, and also because of the the wider implications in terms of, of cost to the taxpayer. So I, I, I apologise if I'm not using vocabulary that properly uh, gets that across, but I hope you will take it face value that I am not trying to uh, underplay that in any way, shape or form. Um, and just to complete the point, the, the procedure itself, and I, I recognise I, it's, it's a long time since I practice law, but I, I do recognise the interchangeability of terminology sometimes confuses uh, the situation. The procedure itself has not been declared unlawful. Now, had the judicial review proceeded, who knows? It, maybe it would have been. Uh, we were confident it wouldn't be, but we don't know that because the judicial review didn't uh, proceed. The application of it, which is perhaps what people talk about when they say the process uh, was flawed and the terminology you've used, uh, tainted by apparent bias, is exactly uh, what the court said in its interlocutor. But that distinction between the lawfulness of the process and the... Uh, the flaw in the application of it, I think, is one that is important to, to bear in mind. On fairness at work, um, I, I heard uh, Alec talk about the length of time it had taken to uh, develop uh, that policy. I, I had a, I suppose, a wry smile when I heard him uh, say how, uh, or suggest how involved uh, he, he would have been in that. That's, uh, I have to say, not my memory of, uh, of the situation, but we won't. That's uh, me going off at a tangent. Um, it was developed with a lot of input, um, and I, I, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I was intimately involved in every aspect of the development of that policy. I certainly don't recall that being the case, but it, it was developed over a period of time with input from trade unions and others. Um, nothing was formally brought to me under the role, the, the, the Deputy First Minister, which back then uh, was me uh, under that, and I think you've heard evidence uh, to that effect from from others. Um, did I, and, and this probably is something I would reflect on myself, did I spend that much time thinking about whether fairness at work was fit for purpose back then? No, I didn't. And, and maybe I should have done. And I, you know, 
That's uh, perhaps one of the lessons I have to learn out of this. But it was because, you know, if we go back to October, late October 2017, in the wake of Me Too, it was a general sense that people didn't think current processes were fit for purpose that led us to review these processes. And, and one of the things that I think uh, led to a distinct standalone procedure was exactly what you're saying, that there's a lot of focus on fairness at work in informal, on informal resolution, on mediation, um, and perhaps the bar is too high in terms of when things get to, to formal complaints, and also perhaps that kind of approach is not entirely appropriate when you're dealing with sexual harassment uh, allegations. And I think I'd, I, I do have it somewhere, but I don't have it in front of me right now. I think Fairness at Work, for example, cites one of the, the, the ways in which, uh, or, or one of the circumstances in which mediation is not appropriate is where there is a significant power imbalance. So I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, I, I think everything about Fairness at Work is perfect, but it was developed uh, with a lot of input from trade unions um, and it is a policy that remains in place. I'm conscious of time, um, uh, but all I would say, First Minister, it was entirely in your remit as a definite First Minister to look at these complaints, to look at it at an informal stage. And were you aware that there had been complaints raised, all predominantly from females? And you, you certainly always set yourself up as someone who was a champion for women's issues, and yet you didn't pay that much attention to it. I, I was not, um, and again, you know, I think you've heard evidence from others, I, I was not aware, um, and we'll come on to, you know, when I did become aware of, of things, but you know, before the, the November 2017 uh, media query uh, that came from Sky News about Edinburgh Airport, and I'm sure we'll come on to that later, I was not aware of uh, allegations or concerns about in a sexually inappropriate behaviour on the part of Alex Hammond. And, and that is just... Yeah, First it's generally... It was, it um, was five SNP ministers. And can I remind you, Alex Salmond is a key witness to this inquiry. He's not under trial. Your actions are. And if you could focus on that, sorry, uh, that would be much appreciated. My apologies. I was saying I hadn't heard anything, so I was, wasn't putting him on trial for that. Um, I, I don't... With, forgive me, uh, Ms Mitchell, I don't know exactly what you are referring to in terms of five SNP ministers. So if that's something that I can you know, be given in more detail, I'm happy to respond to I'm it, but I don't know right now what it is you're referring to. Yeah. Nothing came to me as Deputy First Minister um, under the Fairness at Work policy in terms of the role that the Deputy First Minister had and still has. Um, in terms of more general concerns about sex, not in relate, re relation to any one individual, have I for my entire working life been aware of uh, problems of sexual harassment and sexism and, and misogyny? Uh, you bet I have. Uh, but to say that that means that things were brought to me um, or that there were things that I could have acted upon back then that I didn't, that's not the same thing. Just for reference, um, it'll be me a last... Um, yeah, could, in, you, could you give the reference to I where will. it comes from? I'll please? just say, in reflecting back to the... This is the FDA. And reflecting back the last 10 years, we are aware of approaches on behalf of around 30 members in relation to at least five ministerial offices. So that was five SNP uh, ministerial offices. Um, you, you're happy to look at that, uh, and I'm glad to pass it over now, to now that you at any time. Give me the reference. I, I, I apologise. I have not been able to watch all of the evidence that has been given to the committee. I've tried to read as much of it as, as I could before coming here today, so I, I recognise now the reference you're, you're talking about. Um, these were not things that were brought to me at the time under fairness at work, um, and you know that means that there is not much beyond what I've already said that I can usefully say on these matters. If you're asking me, does that concern me? Of course, I, I, wouldn't, I don't want uh, to be in a position, I wouldn't have back then, and I certainly don't know where uh, people in government feel that they have any need, formally or informally, to complain about behaviours in ministerial offices. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go on, please, to Maureen Watt. Thank you, Camina. Good morning, First Minister. Um, I'd like to concentrate on the creation of the new procedure in the light of the uh, Me Too movement. Um, when he gave evidence, Mr Salmond questioned whether there was any need to create 
a new procedure instead of, uh, he questioned why fairness at work wasn't simply edited to strengthen the criteria to include sexual harassment. Why did the government take a decision to create a new procedure rather than tinker with the old one? As I, as I heard Alex's evidence on Friday, and I, I may be being unfair to him here, he seemed to be saying he didn't think there should have been a procedure in place that was capable of investigating him, because he didn't think that there should have been, or if there had been a procedure about historic, allowed investigation of historic allegations that should have taken 18 months or so to, to put in place. And uh, that, that is what struck me in terms of that section of his evidence that his his view was it should not not just that the complaints against him shouldn't have been investigated but that it should have been impossible to investigate them because there should have been no procedure that allowed it to happen i fundamentally disagree with that and i know the committee pursued this line of questioning and has with others you know this parliament uh, in fact I, I think it comes to stage three sometime over the next uh, few days is changing its procedures uh, to allow historic complaints against MSPs to be investigated. Why did we decide to, uh, well, firstly, in light of Me Too, we, we took a decision, the Cabinet took a decision on the 31st of October to review its procedures. It didn't take that decision with a preconceived notion of what the outcome of that review should be. We gave the Civil Service an open commission to review procedures. I think given, and yeah, I know, you know, we're, we're talking about this with the passage of some time, but given the profile of the Me Too revelations, given how much attention organisations the world over were doing this at, at that time, it would have been not just remiss of us not to do it, I'm pretty sure it would have attracted substantial criticism had we not done that. So that's the first point. And secondly, uh, as that process started and as the gaps and weaknesses in current uh, procedures were identified, the view was that a standalone process that allowed uh, current or former ministers and allowed expressly historic allegations uh, to be investigated was appropriate. I think some of the, the points Margaret Mitchell made to me about the, the, the setting of the bar in fairness at work and some of the focus in fairness at work on informal resolution and mediation, I think was also part of a consideration about whether that was appropriate for the kind of complaints that we were seeking to put a procedure in place uh, to, to deal with. Okay, um, thank you. Um, yeah, much has been made about the time difference between fairness at work being devised over 18 months or so um, and mm -hmm. the relative shortness of time of the new policy. Was that something uh, that you encouraged to happen, that you wanted it done very quickly? Again, I go back to the, 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 the climate at the time and, and the sort of, for want of a better expression, the sort of consensus of opinion that there was a big problem here, not just in Scotland or the UK, but globally about an inability for women who felt they'd experienced sexual harassment to come forward, a lack of confidence on their part coming forward. And uh, part of those concerns was a perception that there was, it was particularly difficult to investigate allegations uh, of historic uh, harassment. So yes, we felt we had a big problem, not just us, but we had to, to contend with and to address a problem that people thought was was a serious one. So if you if you said to me back then, if if a civil if the permanent secretary or you know the senior civil servants who were were tasked with the drafting of this procedure had they come to me then, which they didn't, um, so I'm kind of uh, speculating here. But if they come to me then and said, first minister, this is going to take 18 months, I would probably have said, get out of here and do it more quickly than that because that's not an acceptable period of time when this is a serious problem that we we need to try to address so yes it was something we wanted to do quickly not cutting corners or or doing it in any way inappropriately that there was trade union involvement as i think the the committee has heard um in fact i before i signed it off on the 20th of december i had um made sure that the trade unions had been involved. So it wasn't a policy that there wasn't a lot of consideration given to, there was, but it was a policy that I think for good reason we wanted to have in place sooner rather than later. And under the Fairness at Work procedure, 
media mediation is an option available in the cases of complaints against current ministers. So why is there a difference between mediation available to current ministers but not in relation to former ministers, do you think? Well, it, Fairness at Work only applies to current ministers. Um, mediation is uh, an option there. There is, I think, a, an open question that people will have different views on. Um, about whether mediation is always an appropriate procedure in cases of sexual harassment and in cases where there is a significant power imbalance. Uh, I, I also think for mediation to be a, a reasonable process, there has to be you know, consent to that on, on both sides. But th there isn't a distinction between current and former ministers and fairness at work, because fairness at work applies only to current ministers. In terms of the procedure which applies to current and former ministers, um, there isn't a, an express mediation uh, pro uh, provision in the procedure for current ministers. There is a, a reference, I think, um, from memory, uh, I'm sure this will be noted if I'm quoting the wrong paragraph here, I think from memory paragraph six, um, has a, a, a reference to seeing whether there's any prospect of resolving things, uh, which is not in the, the part of the procedure for uh, former ministers, but that's not a, an express mediation uh, provision. And, you know, why is there that in one and not the other? I, I, I'm not sure I can fully answer that, and it's maybe something that, as we review all of this, and Lauded and Locke's report will be part of that, we want to, to think further about. I, I suppose if I was to offer any uh, thought, is that with a current minister, you're, you're more likely to be talking about people who are still working together, maybe if there's an opportunity to resolve something because it has genuinely been a misunderstanding, um, then that is a provision that should be there. With a former minister, it's somebody who's not still in the workplace, so perhaps that is not, not seen to be as appropriate, but it, 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 that is perhaps an aspect that we will want to, to think about as we complete these reviews, or that review. Um, it's clear from our evidence uh, that prior to the introduction of the procedure, Complaints were sometimes handled informally. For example, we heard from Dave Penman that, uh, of the Civil Servants Union that um, he talked about con uh, concerns about um, instances being handled informally. For example, uh, staff were moved on so that they wouldn't have to work uh, with the minister or the person that they complained about. Um, do you think that was... Or, or sometimes people could give an apology. Do you think that that was a satisfactory way of dealing with um, complaints or concerns? So I think I'd, I'd answer that in two ways. Sometimes that will be a satisfactory way of dealing with a particular complaint because it will be satisfactory to the person who's complaining. They will prefer to have it dealt with informally. An apology might suffice. So I wouldn't say that it's never appropriate for that to be the approach that is taken. The second point I would make, though, perhaps goes back to, to Margaret Mitchell's questions to me. And the fact that, you know, Margaret Mitchell is reading out evidence to me that says there were complaints, or, or sorry, concerns from trade unions about a number of ministerial offices. And at the time, as Deputy First Minister, who had a role in fairness at work, that never came to me. So that does raise a question in my mind, to use Margaret's terminology, is the bar set too high or is there an over-reliance on informal resolution and is it the case, and I'm posing this as a question rather than a fixed view, but it's certainly a question in my mind, is there or was there an over-reliance on informal procedures so that certain things that perhaps should have become more formalised and be dealt with in a different way were not? And I think that is a legitimate question to be asked of the government and it's certainly a legitimate one for us to reflect on. Can you tell us... Um if this policy or procedure was discussed at Cabinet and how often, you know, during the iteration of the process of drawing up this new procedure was discussed at Cabinet? It wasn't discussed uh, particularly at Cabinet. Um, I'd have to check Cabinet minutes to see, uh, you know, how many times, uh, if at all, it was. We have a thing uh, which you'll be aware of uh, at Cabinet called uh, SCANS, which is uh, just, you know, things that ministers have to bring. It doesn't have a full cabinet paper, but things that, and it may be of, that it, it was raised under that. It, the permanent secretary, you know, kept me updated in terms of how the development of the policy, uh, the procedure was was progressing. 
Um, I think the first draft of it I got sent was uh, towards the end of November, um, and uh, I, at that point, I think that was a, at the point where the role of the First Minister and effectively being a bit of a gatekeeper with the Permanent Secretary's complaints had been removed. Um, I had, before that, the 22nd of November, I had formally written to uh, the Permanent Secretary because there was a view that, uh, given that not just former ministers but current ministers had been included, the interrelationship that that then created with the ministerial code meant that there should be express ministerial authority for the procedure being developed in that way. Um, and. Then, of course, I ultimately signed it off on the 20th of December. And a couple more questions, uh, Convener. Um, at the time of the commissioning of this new procedure, were you aware of any concerns being raised about the behaviour of any current or former minister? Uh, at the time we commissioned it on the 31st of October, uh, no. Uh, as I said in my written evidence and as we'll no doubt come on to, I became aware through a media inquiry of a, an allegation um, about the former First Minister uh, some days after that at the start of November. And did that influence the way you looked at the policy? No. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> you know, it's okay. Um, and uh, just finally, um, do you think the policy which related to the civil service should have been discussed in Parliament, as somebody suggested? Um, I'll come on to the Parliament a bit in a minute. Um, I, I was a, maybe a bit too quick. I was definitely a bit too quick to, to answer there because that's, that's obviously one of the, the suggestions that's been made, that this policy was somehow a bespoke Alex Salmond policy. And, uh, you know, even in the days when uh, we were besties, you know, Alex Salmond has a tendency to see most things being in some way about him. <laughs> and I hope he takes that in the spirit it's intended. Um, but... It wasn't. No, it wasn't. And I think to I think to see it in that way really ignores what was happening globally at that time. This was about the Me Too revelations. Now, you ask, does did the sky thing then influence my views on it? Um, no, it, it didn't. I think the danger, and you know, I, I can't say there was no subconscious kind of you know, uh, thing in my mind uh, about that. But the danger, I think, then would have been had I started to, to, to influence the development of this policy in a way that somehow protected him. You know, if I had if I'd taken my red pen and or black pen as it is just now and gone like that with former ministers because I had this, you know, this sky thing had put a lingering suspicion in my mind, then I think I would legitimately be sitting here right now getting a lot of criticism. I, I didn't do that. The policy was not put in place because of Alex Salmon, but nor did I allow any, even subconscious, I hope, uh, considerations about Alex Salmon to influence the decisions I, I took on that. And just the question about whether you think these should have been debated in Parliament. Um, I think no would be the answer to that at the time, I mean, now, yeah, I, I don't know what would have happened had, had it been debated in Parliament. Uh, to the best of my knowledge and recollection, and I will be corrected on this if I'm wrong, I don't think fairness at work was ever debated in Parliament. These are HR policies, and, and the procedure is fundamentally an HR policy. Um, and I, I don't think it would have been appropriate for it to be debated in Parliament. Sim similarly, you know, in a way that Obviously, Parliament is legislating in terms of the, the situation with investigating former MSPs, but that's because of the legislative underpinning of the standards process. The idea that you would have legislated for a government HR process uh, or even debated it in Parliament, I think, is something very different. OK, thank you. Thank you. I think um, Andy Whiteman has some questions on the development of the policy. Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, First Minister. Um, you've said quite clearly that you had received no concerns about Mr. Salmon's any behaviour, any alleged behaviour by Mr. Salmon before the Sky News inquiry. Um, one of the civil servants whose complaint um, ended up in the court, in fact, said to the journalist Danny Garavelli, uh, 
If I'd complained, it would have been swept under the carpet and I would have suffered in my career. I never saw anyone in a senior position in the Scottish Government tackle the First Minister on his behaviour. You reflected a moment ago about whether it might have been better had you been more aware, for example, of the concerns expressed about five ministerial offices. Is the fact that civil servants in the Scottish Government have had concerns, may indeed uh, currently continue to have concerns, something that you will now take more seriously in the aftermath of all of this? Uh, yes, but I, I hope it is the case that I have taken it seriously previously. Um, yeah, I, I made a comment in opening remarks about soul searching on this, and these are aspects that I have deeply thought about in the, the wake of this. And I want to try and briefly, because I, I know time is, is marching on, but I want to try and sort of unpack your question a little bit. Um, I did not know, you know, so I, I now know there was a, a an incident that Alex Hammond apologised to somebody for back in 2013. I did not know that at the time. I did not know uh, of any concerns about Alex Hammond's sexual behaviour back then. I, sorry, alleged, I am not... Yes, I am not yes please be careful any, with I, your I, words, I'm sorry. First Minister. Um, I, I did not hear con concerns about that back then. Um, you know, part of me wishes I had. If there had been concerns, I'm not saying they would have been well-founded, but I didn't. If you ask me, and I think I referred to this briefly in my written submission, um, Alec, like many people can be, so I'm not particularly singling him out other than that this is the basis of the, the question. He was a tough guy to, to work for. Um, he could be very challenging to work for. If Alec was displeased with you, um, he would make that pretty obvious. Um, and there were times where I did challenge his behaviour in that respect, uh, when I, I witnessed uh, situations where I thought he had, or was perhaps risking crossing a line. But one of the, one of the things I have thought about um, is whether those of us who had worked very closely with Alec for a long, long time had become a bit inured to that that kind of behaviour, and I'm talking about that, not, any, not anything allegedly sexual, um, and whether we had a, a higher threshold for that than perhaps people in government in 2007 had. So uh, is that something I think about and thought about? Yes. Do I want to have a, have a situation where anybody inside government who feels that they are being unfairly treated by any minister on any basis and in any way feels that they have the confidence to come forward and that their concerns will be treated seriously, absolutely. And I will continue to try to do what I can to make sure that that is the case. OK, thanks. C can I ask a fairly basic question? Um, you say in your written evidence, um, for example, that you recognise that too often that organisations too often closed ranks in defence of men accused of inappropriate behaviour and that it could be particularly difficult for quotes, historic allegations to be raised. Uh, you've mentioned historic allegations a number of times this morning. Can you just be clear what you mean by historic allegations? Because on the pedantic meaning, obviously all allegations relate to something that happened in the past. Could you be clear about what you mean by that? Uh, it's, it's often the basic questions that are the hardest uh, <laughs> to answer. I, I, and I, I'm not entirely sure I'm going to give you a, a completely technical answer to this, because it's a good question that I possibly haven't thought about enough. Uh, I suppose what I mean, thinking about it um, in the moment, is that you know you, you have people, uh, and in the context of sexual harassment allegations, it tends to be men rather than women. You have men in positions of authority or power or status over the people that are complaining, which makes it difficult for them to bring those complaints uh, forward at the time the person they're complaining about is in that position of power or, or status or authority. And it can be only when they are no longer in that position that somebody can feel able to come forward. So I suppose in a general sense, that is partly what I mean by historic. Once the individual be complained of is not in the position that they were in that was perhaps the inhibitor to the complaints coming forward. Um, it probably has other potential meanings as well, but I think in broad terms, that's what I mean. 
Okay, could I, in relation to that, ask you the same question I asked of Mr. Salmond on Friday. Do you think, as a matter of principle, there should be a procedure for investigating complaints of sexual harassment against former ministers in the Scottish Government? Yes. Ab unequivocally, absolutely. Because otherwise, you... You, you don't have that ability. Off politics, perhaps more than any other walk of life, people in positions of political power are powerful people. And therefore, it presumably is difficult, more difficult, not impossible, for people to bring forward complaints. So if, if that ability to hold somebody, you know, somebody like me to account stops the moment you cease to be in that position of authority, then clearly that is closing off the ability for you to be held to account should complaints come forward in the future. So I, I think very clearly, and I think that is the way this is going with organizing, including this organization. And that's what I suppose I just fundamentally found difficult to grasp about Alex evidence on Friday, that he seemed to be saying, albeit qualified it a little bit, that the complaints against him shouldn't have been investigated and shouldn't have been capable of being investigated because there should have been no retrospective policy in place. And I, I fundamentally disagree with that. So yes, there is a fundamental disagreement between you because he said, I do not think you can make that argument. Legally, I've been informed that you could perhaps try that argument pre-2010 when there's no such policy, but it would be very difficult to make that argument and to make it legal or lawful. So there's a fundamental disagreement between you on that point. O yep. On that point and um, others. In the... Um, in terms of the um, relationship that, you, that the Deputy First Minister had and the First Minister had in Fairness at Work and the new uh, procedure, um, as Deputy First Minister under the Fairness at Work, you would have been passed um, a copy of a complaint if, if informal resolution had failed uh, in relation to any complaints against current ministers. You were never, that never happened, of course. Uh, but under the new procedure, it's you, the same person, but now as First Minister, who has that responsibility. Why did... Mr. Sam, does First Minister not have the role that you now have as First Minister? Or to put it another way, why, does you, why did you as Deputy First Minister have that role, whereas the current Deputy First Minister uh, does not? Mr. Sam tried to explain that in terms of conflicts with the ministerial code. Do you have a view? I'm not sure I do, um, or not one that I, I feel I can articulate to you now. I, I don't recall um, why particularly it was the case that the Deputy First Minister was in that role under fairness at work. Um, and again, and I can appreciate that people will think, how can that possibly in the, be the case? In all my years as Deputy First Minister, I, I wasn't really consciously aware very often, if at all, about fairness at work or the fact, you know, obviously I knew I had that role, but it wasn't something that, that crossed my desk. Um, the the dis Discussions around the development of the procedure were very much, um, in this respect, about you know trying to, I suppose, avoid. And remember, this was in the wake of Me Too. And you, you read out something else from my evidence about the perception that organisations, people, closed ranks against these kind of views. This was a procedure that was covering current and former ministers, i.e. politicians. And therefore, my view was that the First Minister, as a politician, potentially of the same party, should not be in the, the role of either deciding to investigate a complaint or doing the investigation. So that was the thinking behind the development of the procedure. I'm not sure, without uh, going back into the dark mists of time and seeing if there's an explanation there, I, I could sit here right now and give you a full explanation of why the Fairness at Work policy developed exactly as it did. OK. Were you ever advised during the development of the procedure that the retrospective element whereby it applied to former ministers uh, was of um, doubtful legality? I do not recall being advised of that, which, uh, no, I don't, don't believe I was. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't recall being advised of any concerns about the fundamental legality, I, I would have assumed, uh, and now know, uh, obviously you've heard evidence from people that legal advice was taken on an ongoing basis as the, the procedure was developed. Uh, paragraph 13 of the procedure where the former minister was a member of an administration formed by a different political party, where, where that's the case, the, the permanent secretary is given the role of informing the party leader of the outcome of the investigation and any uh, action taken. 
the end of this process seems to be a little bit strange because what is the leader of that political party to do with his information? What if the former minister, for example, is no longer a member of that political party? One of the criticisms of the procedure seems to be it ends in this rather strange circumstance where you're passing very sensitive information over to a leader of another political party who may not even be the leader of that political party when the minister being complained of was a member and the minister may not be a member as well. Uh, have you got any concerns about the uh, kind of end point of this procedure? Um, the, the thought processes at the time were about um, the, the need, if, if a complaint in the, the context of an HR process was upheld against somebody who had been a former minister, uh, then the, the party of which they had been part should have an awareness of that you know, in case they held positions of authority within the party, it would have been for the party to, to decide what to do with that. Uh, so that was the thought process there. Like all, given what we've been through in the last couple of years, um, I think all of these things are, are legitimate areas to probe and to question. And finally, for now, convener, um, given that the new procedure was to be made applicable to former ministers, of whom must be dozens, I don't know, 40, 50, uh, since 1999, what efforts were made to inform them of the fact that they might be made the subject of complaints under the procedure? Uh, we didn't, and uh, I think it was you that pursued this line of questioning on Friday, that there had been a, a, a suggestion that we would uh, inform, I, I think, uh, former First Ministers, I think a, a letter was drafted um, and the decision was taken and I, I don't have a, a very, you know, I don't have a crystal clear recollection of this. I think uh, at the time we decided I would have been part of that. I think I decided that given that this was an HR policy that it wasn't necessary and wouldn't necessarily have been appropriate to go to external consultation beyond the kind of trade union consultation that we had. So that, that was... Uh, that led to the fact that we, we didn't do what you have suggested. OK, I think that draft letter has not been disclosed to the committee. The government, uh, I please supply it. I yesterday. I am happy. I see no reason why it wouldn't be okay. or shouldn't be, so I'm happy to uh, undertake that that will be done. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. Yes, the committee will discuss that in its private session afterwards. I move now to Alistair Allen. Thank you, convener. Um, First Minister, you've, you've mentioned that the process wasn't declared unlawful, um, but can you explain for people who perhaps don't understand the, the distinction between the process between being declared unlawful and the application of the process being declared unlawful, what that means? So, the procedure is still in place. So, if, if a complaint about a current or a former minister came in again, that procedure is still extant and could be used. Um, there were a number, I think the initial judicial review petition had eight grounds of challenge, uh, some of them about the application of it, but some of them about the, the fundamental lawfulness of the procedure itself. So it was ultra viris, we, it shouldn't have been retrospective. Uh, and none of those were tested in court because of what happened with the judicial review. So none of those concerns have been established one way or the other. So the procedure itself has not been declared to be unlawful and could be used, although, uh, as I said, we've got uh, Laura Dunlop doing some independent internal work uh, for the government uh, on aspects of that. What went wrong here was that I, when there were complaints to be investigated and the pr procedure effectively was activated, in the appointment of the investigating officer, uh, which is a part of the procedure, a mistake was made because, as it turns out, and I'm summarising here, the investigating officer had had prior contact with those who were making complaints. So it was in how the procedure was used that the flaw was identified, not in the fundamentals of the procedure. And I, I know that is uh, difficult to, for people to grasp, but I, I hope I've explained it reasonably clearly. Thank you. Last week, Mr Salmond seemed to wholly reject uh, the idea that complaints against former ministers were legally possible. Um, when he was asked about whether, in principle, he supported it, he said, uh, I don't think that you can make that argument. It would be very difficult to make that argument and to make it legal or lawful. 
So even although the Court of Session didn't rule the procedure itself unlawful, was the inclusion of former ministers, in your view, uh, unlawful or created difficulties? Uh, no. Um, I think uh, one of the civil servants you heard from, James Hine, made this point. You know, by, by definition, uh, the government uh, created this procedure, it was signed off, legal advice was taken uh, along the way, so the government considers that the procedure is lawful. Uh, Mr Salmond challenged aspects of that. As I said earlier on, one of the reasons why there would have been a public interest in the judicial review going uh, to a full judicial conclusion where a judge could have decided is that we would have got a definitive answer on that. Um, so, it, you know, we, we don't know what the outcome would be, but the, the government's position is that that aspect of the procedure is lawful um, and nobody has established to the contrary. So I would also question the idea that complaints or a complaints process against former ministers uh, would even be necessary. He said that I think it would be difficult to understand why coming out of the Me Too movement and the range of huge issues that were discussed in Parliament on the 31st of October, anyone would think or believe that it was absolutely required in the Scottish Parliament uh, that there was a policy on former ministers. Is he, is he not making a fair point about that? Um, uh, and from his perspective, I'm sure he is. From my perspective, I... So, in Parliament that day, which, if my memory is right on this, I think it is, the, the John Swinney answered the question on the afternoon of the Cabinet meeting. He was said, saying that we had decided to review our policies. It, it wasn't a, a debate. I don't think it was a debate at all, but it wasn't a, a discussion of a new policy. Um, I just... And this is a, a kind of personal reflection on public debate at that time, I think it would have been very hard to draw a conclusion at that time that historic complaints and the relative difficulty in investigating historic complaints wasn't a pretty central part of the Me Too concerns, because it, it was. Um, and therefore, to, to come to a conclusion that nobody would have thought that that was a legitimate or a priority issue, I, I really struggle with uh, as somebody who paid a lot of attention to that debate at the time. When asked about what's since become known as the Edinburgh Airport incident, um, Mr Salmond said that because of the atmosphere at the time, November 2017, um, perhaps people were overreacting in a number of ways. Did you feel that people were overreacting to the Me Too movement uh, in November 2017? I, I don't think people were overreacting. I don't think the Scottish Government overreacted. Um, I don't think Parliament overreacted in the steps it took. I, I think, uh, what, three, three and a half years, or not quite that, over three years on, I suspect a more legitimate criticism is that the world has ultimately underreacted uh, to, to some of the concerns that were raised there, because I think, um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not sure that women would necessarily say it's got an awful lot better. So I don't think there was an overreaction. Um, and I certainly don't think there was an overreaction on the part of the government. Any sexual harassment procedure against current or former ministers may, of course, uh, result in complaints being levelled at powerful people who have both the means and the inclination uh, to challenge those complaints in court. Shouldn't the Scottish Government really have been readier for a, a judicial review challenge to the procedure? For instance, it appears from the evidence that civil servants uh, treated the procedure like any other employment policy, with legal checks being provided by employment lawyers. So if, you, if you'd have thought that the handling of complaints under the procedure might end up in court, shouldn't the government have had public lawyers scrutinising whether uh, complaints handled under the procedure would be robust if they were challenged in judicial review? Uh, so with hindsight, um, Dr Allen, I think that is a legitimate comment and reflection. Um, you know, none of us, certainly I, wouldn't have wanted to be sitting here at the culmination of everything that's happened over the past uh, couple of years. So. Yes, we have to think with hindsight of all of these things and consider whether we should have done things differently. Unfortunately, you don't have that hindsight when you're doing these things. And, and we couldn't have anticipated. Uh, maybe we should have done, but we didn't at that point 
anticipate what has unfolded since. It was an employment procedure, um, albeit with uh, particular features that make it appear to be much more in the political sphere. I absolutely uh, accept that, but it was an employment procedure. And the government took legal advice and had legal input as it developed that procedure. And I think, obviously, again, having looked back at all of this, I wasn't uh, aware of all the correspondence at the time, but you know, I think the government was ready for a, a judicial review. And until something came to light that hadn't been known and appreciated earlier, the government was confident in its ability to defend the procedure and, and the legal advice that was published yesterday, I think, demonstrates that. The, the note of prospects, which uh, I think was late September, um, you know, like any piece of legal advice will, you know, on the one hand and on the other hand, and will rank risks uh, of successful challenge. That's in the nature of legal advice. But across all of the grounds of challenge, the government was confident, as confident as you can ever be in a, a legal action, that it could succeed. Um, and we know now that that changed, and I won't go on just now, because I know we'll come on to that in more detail later. Some have claimed to us that this procedure was created to get Alex Salmond. I don't offer an opinion on that, but I suspect you may. It, it wasn't absolutely emphatically not. And I just say to people, and you know, again, this is stuff we might get into later on. Alex Salmond has been, and I've said this many times, one of the closest people to me in my entire life, and some people around this table know what I mean by that more than, than others might. I would never have wanted to get Alex Hammond. Um, and I would never, ever have wanted any of this to happen. If I could have, short of brushing complaints under the carpet, which would have been wrong to be, if I could turn the clock back and find legitimate ways that none of this would ever have happened, uh, then I would. Alex Hammond has been for most of my life, since I was about 20, 21 years old, uh, not just a, a very close political colleague, a friend in my younger days, somebody I looked up to and revered. You know, I had no motive, intention, desire to get Alex Hammond. Turning to the, the development of the procedure itself, can you, can you set out what role you personally Played. You've given some indication of this, but what role personally you played in the creation of the procedure? And I mean, prior to signing it off. Uh, not a day-to-day -day central one by any stretch of the imagination. And again, you know, I know people who, uh, which is most people, understandably, and would have been me before I was in government. You know, th not being as familiar as I am with the day-to-day -day workings of government, would think how could that possibly be the case? But you know, for any minister, particularly a first minister, you're dealing with, you know, a multitude of things every day, ranked in order of priority and importance, and that shifts and changes. Something like this is kind of done almost at arm's length. You've got civil servants doing it. You will be kept up to date uh, periodically when appropriate. At key moments in something like this, you'll be consulted if there is a, a particular policy issue that, that requires to be uh, discussed or that requires clear ministerial authority. And I, I think I said earlier on, I would, in the development of this policy, I suppose, identify three uh, particular issues that fall into to that category. Um, and I was you know, consulted and, and had a part in the procedure at, at these stages. Um, the most significant intervention was giving the express written authority for a procedure that included former ministers and, and current ministers. Actually, that at the time was more about the inclusion of current ministers because of the interaction with the ministerial code. And it was current ministers that were added in to the policy at a later stage. As you've heard from others, former ministers were actually included from the very initial draft. There's been some discussion about the, the role that the First Minister should have in the complaints handling process. Uh, Mr Salmon told this committee that he was surprised that the First Minister did not have a role in, in that part of the procedure. Now, you've touched on this, but can you explain why, in your view, um, a First Minister um, doesn't have the same role in the procedure as they did in the original policy, Fairness at Work? Well, I mean, we've gone through the Fairness at Work you know, it's the Deputy First Minister that is more centrally 
involved uh, when a complaint is, is lodged than the First Minister. Look, my view, and this is, this is, you know, I can not just offer a, an abstract view. I can tell you, I, I thought it was important. And again, this is in the context of how best to describe this, the world kind of having changed in the realms of all of this because of Me Too. So the old ways of doing things were what were in the spotlight and being, in some respects, considered to be inadequate and wrong, that they led to too much reliance on informal resolution. You know, they gave powerful folk too much opportunity to evade accountability or, you know, people closed ranks. So I, and this was Me Too driven, I thought in a procedure that was there that had it been used at all, would have been used for current or former politicians. It was best for a first minister, a current politician, to be as far removed from that as possible, so that there was no suggestion, um, you know, ironic given where we are, there was no suggestion that a first minister of the same party as somebody to be complained about could be trying to influence how the investigation was, was taking place for political reasons, to protect their you know, colleague or to protect their party from reputational damage. Me too seemed to make it more important that we didn't have those perceptions and those risks. And that was the backdrop to, to some of these key decisions that were taken in the, the development of the procedure. Finally, convener, uh, you mentioned there the culture change although I don't think you used those words, but the culture change that was taking place around Me Too. Um, the Permanent Secretary has told us in the past that that culture change was being reflected in the UK civil service as well. Was it something that you sensed was being acted upon or um, it, people had an enthusiasm for across the civil service in Scotland? Did people have to be told this was a good thing to do? The civil service, and again, you've got experience with this, the civil service will, um, you know, if... if the cabinet decides something is a priority. It's their job to, to get on and do that. So it's not that they were, you know, to describe the civil service as personally enthusiastic would be, I think, to, to misdescribe their role. They were acting on the instructions and the request that the, the elected cabinet had given them. But I think everybody at that time was, I mean, I, I don't know about all of you, I, I, I remember the Me Too stuff being really quite shocking, not in the sense that, God, you hadn't known that this kind of stuff happened, but the fact that it was coming out into the open, that people were prepared to confront these things, was, was a big moment. I remember, as I'm sure others did, doing interviews at the time, talking about a kind of watershed moment. So there was a sense that, that we had to live up to that. We had to be prepared to, to meet the moment. Now, you know, three years on, people, some people think that was all an overreaction. I don't, I think it was right to try to do that. I regret the fact that because certain things weren't done the way they should have been done, we're sitting here and what I deeply regret is that that then allows aspersions to be cast on the motives of what we were doing at the time, which I think were absolutely right and proper. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Marto Fraser. Questions in this section, convener. Ah, right. Jackie Bailey? Um, no questions in this section either. Alex Cole Hamilton. I have no questions in this section. It's complaints handling we're after. All oh, right, well, that's very refreshing. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I have. <laughs> uh, Stuart McMillan does have questions in this session. So could I ask uh, Mr. McMillan then to lead us on to the complaints handling session as well and take all your questions? Okay, thank you, Convener. Good morning, First Minister. Uh, First Minister, prior to contacting the Permanent Secretary uh, at the point when you thought that legal action was actually uh, against the Scottish Government was actually going to be, take place, uh, did you have any involvement in the formal complaint handling process? No. Okay. Uh, after the contact with the Permanent Secretary, did you have any other or any sorry involvement? in the formal complaints handling process? I wasn't involved in the handling of the complaint or the investigation of the complaint. Okay. Uh, certainly, another aspect of, the, of this is that much of the focus of the committee has become about the questions of meetings and recollections and conclusions of which certainly are not going to help what's happened in the past, the present, uh, or future complainers of sexual harassment. 
But what certainly will help uh, is the correcting of the errors uh, in the complaints handling process, and uh, something you've obviously touched upon earlier. And our evidence has highlighted that clear mistakes were made in the division of the responsibilities between those tasked uh, with that role uh, of communicating uh, with uh, complainants uh, and also those tasked with the role of investigating complaints. Uh, do you accept that this went wrong? And uh, certainly, and what can be done to avoid it actually going wrong in the future? I unreservedly accept that things went wrong in that respect and you know, have given an apology today for that. Um, we are uh, reviewing, I know this has been referred to by me uh, many times already today and others have referred to it previously, but Laura Dunlop QC is reviewing these aspects uh, and these matters for the government um, right now. I'm not uh, sure exactly when uh, we are going to get her report. I think the Deputy First Minister has been uh, corresponding or will correspond with the committee on that. Um, so that will be an opportunity in addition to whatever this committee uh, wants to, to reflect on or suggest, that will be an opportunity for us to, to consider why these things happened institutionally and what needs to be done to ensure that should a situation like this occur again, it wouldn't happen in the future. Some of the evidence that we've heard as a committee uh, has indicated the possibility of a deciding officer or an investigating officer being independent of government. Is that something that the Scottish Government would consider? We'll consider any recommendations that the committee puts forward. It's not one I've particularly given any consideration to to date. Uh, but if it is a, a recommendation that we get, of course we'll consider it. Okay. Um, just I want to touch upon a question from earlier on. We've heard that uh, a concern uh, about Mr Salmond himself was uh, handled by him. Uh, giving uh, uh, an informal apology, and something that's been touched upon earlier, uh, and that only years later did the, the person concerned feel able to make a formal complaint. Now, this uh, clearly makes it look like the formal procedures under the, uh, the FAW process were not good enough. Uh, do you accept that? In relation to the specific, I'm not sure I can draw any particular conclusion because I wasn't involved in that at the time, I didn't know about it at the time an apology was made. So I have no uh, direct knowledge of exactly what went on then, uh, what happened in terms of the apology or, or what the basis of the, the person involved uh, was for accepting that as a, a resolution at the time. I, to be frank, only know about that, what I have since been told uh, by Alex Hammond or heard more generally in the the wider proceedings that have been underway. So I, I couldn't say that I can, I couldn't say categorically that that particular incident meant that there was a flaw or a failing in fairness at work. I think generally, as I've already commented on, you know, I think there is something to reflect on there, particularly about sexual harassment and the appropriateness of informal resolution over more formal action being taken. Okay. Could I remind all members, please, to be general uh, rather than specific in talking about individual complaints, etc. Sorry, Um uh, The Permanent Secretary uh, certainly told this committee uh, that her direct line manager, the, the head of the UK Civil Service, wanted all Permanent Secretaries to ensure that their procedures could tackle the challenges of Me Too. And the official report shows us that MSPs of all parties spoke in favour of more being done to actually tackle the issue. Uh, did you feel that, uh, that you have got a broad base of support for the idea of putting in place uh, a new procedure to tackle sexual harassment? I certainly wouldn't speak for uh, other governments in terms of what we actually did. It is factual to say that the Cabinet Secretary at the time, Sir Jeremy Haywood, wrote to the Permanent Secretary, I think, later the week, that Cabinet gave the Commission to review processes. And that reflects a point I've made already. This was something all organisations were doing, reviewing its processes. I, at the time, I can't remember the exact date, I had a discussion with Theresa May, who was Prime Minister at the time, about this matter, because she was concerned about it and was you know, taking steps to, 
uh, review Conservative Party processes, and obviously the UK government was was looking at these matters as well. But I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go from that to say the UK government somehow endorsed what we did. You've uh, heard, uh, which I wasn't aware of at the time, but I'm aware of now, and actually don't think it's particularly significant that the, the cabinet office had commented, not particularly about former ministers, but you know some comment that it felt uncomfortable to have a policy relating to current or, or former ministers. So I wouldn't I wouldn't claim that endorsement, one way or another, for what we did. I think what we did was done for the right reasons. I think we have a procedure that uh, has not been declared unlawful, and I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to labour that point because it hasn't been tested in court, um, but a mistake was made in its its application, and nobody can get away from that. Um, in terms of endorsement, I, and again, I, I know you've heard from trade unions. I think, and I don't want to speak for them, and I certainly don't want to misquote their evidence. I think there was a general agreement that putting, looking at procedures, putting a procedure of this nature in place, applying it to former ministers was not an unreasonable thing to be doing. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Minister of the Court now. Um, in your Mr McMillan, can I, can I stop you? Did you say Ministerial Code? Yes. I would prefer to leave that till after the break. Okay. If you've got anything further on the implementation of the no, policy. No, I'm fine, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much and good morning, First Minister. Um, I, can I just note, though, that the procedure that, that you discussed with some of my colleagues hasn't actually been used since uh, it was last used with Alex Salmond, um, and it's essentially been lying on the shelf gathering dust. So we have concerns that the procedure itself isn't robust enough, given that it's not been used. Um, can I explore with you the confidentiality of complainants, something that I think you and I will both care about? And can I start with the issue that I raised with you, along with Willie Rennie at FMQs last week? Um, there was a series of meetings prior to the meeting on the 29th of March, between yourself, Jeff Aberdeen, um, Alex Salmon's former chief of staff, and a senior member of your team. At one of those early meetings, the complaints against Alex Salmon um, were revealed to Jeff Aberdeen. Could I ask you, who authorised the senior member of your team to have that meeting? Was it you? Was it the permanent secretary? Or were they simply freelancing? Um First of all, before we go on to that, can I just say for the record, I was not claiming that the procedure had been used for complaints other than Alex Salmond. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that the procedure is still extant and hasn't been declared unlawful. Um, convener, I, I want to answer this question as fully as I can, but uh, like the rest of the committee, I am under uh, legal constraints uh, as to what uh, I can say. Um, in terms of uh, meetings, I think I would uh, not accept Jackie Bailey's characterisation of it. I certainly, uh, you know, was not at uh, the the meeting that has been described. Uh, neither uh, should I say were uh, people who are seeking to attest to the the content of that meeting. What I would say is that, as I understand it, uh, James Hamilton, who is uh, conducting the independent investigation under the ministerial code, uh, has evidence from uh, the people who were at that meeting. Um, I wasn't, therefore I cannot uh, give uh, a direct account. Uh, what I can say is that uh, the account I have been given um, has assured me, uh, or given me assurances, uh, that what is uh, alleged to have happened at it didn't happen in the way that has been uh, described. Uh, but as I say, as I understand it, James Hamilton has the accounts of uh, those who were at the meeting. Um, I understand uh, the, the person who's been described as a, a senior government official um, is willing and has offered to give private evidence to the committee uh, on this matter, and that's for the committee to decide whether uh, they want to take it uh, take it up. So the, to describe this as a meeting that was authorised and that it happened in the way Jackie Bailey is suggesting is not something I would I would accept. Uh, obviously, the constraints that I am under, unfortunately, mean that it's not possible for me to go much further than, than that. What I would do, though, and what I can speak to um, is, and I don't want to stray into territory we'll come on to later, um, but the, the discussion I had with Alex Hammond on the 2nd of April um, in terms of the identity of complainants, uh, I, I heard him, you know, he seemed very certain um, on Friday that a complainant had been named uh, by 
somebody in government at a meeting he wasn't at, but seemed less sure about whether a complainant had been named at a meeting he was at. Alexander was open uh, with me uh, about uh, the identity of one complainant because he knew he had been told about it and there was no suggestion that I can recall that anybody um, in the government had told him he knew about the identity of one complainant uh, because he knew about the incident because he had apologised to the person uh, concerned. The other complainant, and I can't, what I can't recall is if the name of the other complainant was uh, shared openly on the 2nd of April in the way that uh, the, the one I've just spoken about was, but he also knew the identity of that complainant. And I remember him talking about how he had gone through the Scottish Government Flickr account to find out who had been with him on particular days. So the point I'm making is that on the 2nd of April, I don't recall any suggestion from Alex Salmond that he had been told about the name of a complainant via, uh, or, or in the way that is being suggested. Um, what I do know is that he knew the identity of both complainants in one respect, because he knew about the incident, and in the other respect, through his own investigations. Thank you, First Minister. I'll come on to exploring that in a minute, but can I take you back to my question, which was the point at which complaints against Alex Hammond were revealed to Jeff Aberdeen. Um, did you know the meeting was taking place? Uh, not to the best of my uh, recollection. Uh, let me be clear, somebody in my team meeting, Jeff Aberdeen, uh, back then would not have been something that was particularly Indeed. newsworthy. Jeff Aberdeen's a friend of, of most of us and a, a, a I, former colleague. I would colleague. agree with you. It but, wouldn't be newsworthy. But I, but I know, I don't, uh, I don't recall uh, that being the case. But, Can I just also say for the record, uh, convener, um, that based on, and remember I wasn't a party to this discussion, um, but based on what I have been uh, told about it, I don't accept Jackie Bailey's characterisation of it. OK, you might not accept my characterisation of it, but um, it, Jeff Aberdeen's um, conversation with Kevin Pringle and Duncan Hamilton QC um, is confirmed in written evidence to this committee. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that they're not telling the truth? Or are I'm you not, saying that Jeff Aberdeen isn't telling the truth? I'm not casting uh, aspersions on uh, the veracity of, of anybody else. That's not what I'm here to do. What I would say is that uh, Kevin and Duncan also weren't at this Correct. discussion. So, you know, this is... But, but they are corroborating something well, that Jeff Aberdeen said. So is Jeff Aberdeen's recollection incorrect? I, I don't know, because I don't know what Jeff Aberdeen... I don't know directly what Jeff Aberdeen is, is saying about this. What, what I do know is that uh, James Hamilton has the accounts of uh, the people who were at uh, that meeting and therefore uh, will be able to properly consider this. This yeah. committee, it's not for me to tell this committee how to do its work, obviously, but I, I listened to the Lord Advocate yesterday um, say that while there are certain things this committee cannot publish, it is not prevented from considering. And I say again, I, I understand that there has been, I actually understand there has been evidence given to this committee that, that denies that allegation. And I think there's been an offer of private evidence as, as well. Can I move you on to the name of a complainer being revealed to Mr. Aberdeen? Um, and then him communicating that subsequently to Mr. Salmond. Um, I'm sure you will agree that that is an extraordinary breach of confidentiality and in any other employment would be a sackable offence. So can I ask who authorised the senior member of your team to reveal that name of one of the complainants to Jeff Aberdeen? Was it you? Was it the permanent secretary? Or were they freelancing? Um, I am not accepting that that happened. So therefore, I am clearly not accepting that that was authorised in the way that Jackie Bailey... I accept that this is a matter of contention. Um, and unfortunately, there are legal constraints in terms of what we can discuss publicly at this committee. But that is not a, a constraint that in his consideration, James Hamilton um, is under. So I'm not going to... Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and just accept the premise of, of questions that are being put to me where I, I dispute the premise of the question. Um, and the next thing I would say, which I, I don't know for certain, uh, but based on what I said about uh, Alex Salmon's knowledge of the identity of complainants and the basis for that knowledge when he spoke to me on the 2nd of April, um, I, I did note in Duncan Hamilton's uh, written submission yesterday that he said something along the lines of this was communicated in the days after Alex Salmon had had uh, his letter from the government. Certainly, 
in relation to one of the complainants, uh, Alex Salmond was pretty clear he had found out through investigations of Scottish Government social media accounts who that was. And in relation to the other one, which must have been the case, and this is the bit I'm, I'm perhaps just speculating on, must have been the case when he got that letter because he knew about the incident because he had apologised to the person. So my assumption would be that he would have known that without anybody having to tell him uh, in terms of that complaint. And, and I know from what he told me that he uh, found out the identity of the other one through his own investigations. Can I ask you, First Minister, because you, you've worked with Kevin Pringle. You would count him as a friend. He's saying that he heard this information. You've worked with Duncan Hamilton. He is a QC. He is attesting to the same information about a complainer's name being revealed by a senior member of your team. <laughs> Leaving aside that they weren't in the room, you, tr you trust what they say to you and have done in the past. But Jeff Aberdeen, who was in the room, who you describe as a friend, are you saying that he is lying about this? I'm not here to make that accusation of anybody. Um, what I am saying is that Kevin and, and Duncan weren't part of that discussion. I wasn't part of that discussion. And the two people who were part of that discussion, I have, I have heard accounts of Jeff's version. I have not heard that directly from Jeff. And in terms of the, the other party to that discussion, they have a different uh, account of that. Um, the committee, it's up to the committee to decide how, whether in private it can hear directly from these people. Um, and James Hamilton, of course, has the accounts of these people. So there is a, a clear difference uh, here. The, the point I am making is that because of the reasons I have set out in, in relation to one complainant, where, I, where Alex Salmond uh, knew about the incident because he had apologised to her, um, the, the, the knowledge of the identity of that complainant uh, may well have been known, and my assumption is that it would have been known to Alex Hammond at that time for these reasons. But the particular uh, version of this that I wasn't party to um, is not one uh, that I know is accepted by the person that was in that discussion. In response to me and to Willie Rennie at First Minister's questions, you said you had no knowledge of this at all. At what point did you speak to your senior official about this? Um, when there was a suggestion uh, made um, about this, I can't remember uh, the exact uh, date, uh, but I, I can check that for you if, if you want. I can't remember the date. So it predated First Minister's questions? Uh, I think you can take it uh, as read that when I uh, said that to to the best of my knowledge, let, let me reiterate, I wasn't at this discussion. No, so no but you've I'm spoken. Not capable, you've spoken to the but senior I, official. I do not believe, uh, based on what I have been told, that that account is is accurate. Um, but that is based on not actually being party to that discussion. And as I say, there are others who will. And, and this committee could, uh, I'm sure, speak privately, even if it can't do so publicly, to the individuals concerned. So just so I'm clear, you spoke to the senior official before First Minister's questions last week, and therefore the answer you gave to both myself and to Willie Rennie wasn't necessarily strictly accurate. Sorry, I don't follow. Okay, it's really simple. Um, we asked you about your knowledge about this, and you said that there was absolutely nothing happened with revealing the name of a complainer and that it was out with your knowledge. No, That's the, clearly not the case if you've spoken to an official in advance of our questioning last week. Um, I, I think I'd have to go back and check the official record. To the best of my knowledge, what was being alleged didn't happen, is what I was, was seeking to convey. I'm sure we'll all check the official record. Um, can I ask, in, in your discussion with the senior official, did you investigate this? Was there any disciplinary process that was gone through to arrive at a conclusion that this wasn't said? Um, the, the clear view of the, the person who is being accused of this is that this didn't happen. And uh, you know, I am not able to go into, for the legal constraints that I am under, uh, the reasons uh, why that is the case and, and the reasons and what uh, may actually uh, be the situation here but others can do that uh, and 
you know, James Hamilton is one of them. And I say again, I, I don't know of any reason why the committee cannot, at least privately, speak to the individuals concerned. Are you not worried that a senior member of your staff was freelancing in this way? I don't accept that characterisation. OK. Can I move on, convener, to um, the leak to the daily record? Because this, again, mm. concerns the confidentiality of complainants. Um, when did you become aware of the leak to the daily record? Uh, I became aware there had been a query to the Scottish Government from the daily record on uh, sometime, uh, I think, in the afternoon of, from memory, quite late afternoon of the 23rd of, of August, which is the day before the story uh, ran in the daily record. Um, that's when I, I became aware of it. Um, so I, okay. I think I think just my understanding was there were actually two stories. I think one on the 23rd and the other perhaps on the 25th, which actually had details of complainants. The first, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, talked about complaints against Alex Salmond, but the second leak went into details mm. of those complaints. Um, where do you consider the leaks came from? Mr. Salmond believes it was somebody within your team. The ICO identified a small group of people, 23 people, that would be broadly consistent with Mr. Salmon's view. So I'm curious to know where you think the leaks came from. Um, I don't know where the leaks came from. Uh, I can tell you where I know they didn't come from. Uh, they didn't come from me. Um, they didn't come from anybody acting on my authority or on my instruction or at my request. I am as certain as I can be that they didn't come from anybody within my, my office. Um, as you said, the, the second story uh, had some considerable detail. I heard Alex Salmond say uh, that that is detail that could only have come from the decision report. I was never sent a copy uh, of the, the decision report. Um, the one other thing I would say about this is, I've said all along, and. I would keep saying, I, I was of the view that I should not act in a way that tried to sweep these complaints under the carpet. And therefore, I would not have acted in a way that blocked any sort of public comment about the outcome of this, had it been the case that that was what the government thought was appropriate to do. That is not the same thing as saying that I wanted this to be in the public domain. Since I first became aware of what Alex Salmond was facing, the thought of it becoming public, the thought of having to comment on it, horrified me, absolutely horrified me. It made me feel physically sick. Um, I would have been perfectly relieved, very relieved at the, if it was legitimate and it wasn't because I was trying to sweep it under the carpet, if it had never come out into the public domain. There was no part of me wanted proactively to see that get into the public domain. I had nothing to gain from it and only a lot of pain and grief associated with it. OK. My understanding is your office was sent a copy of the decision report. Um, and so the leak contained confidential information about the two women involved um, and I think we would both agree that that is a matter of very serious concern and regret. Um, I have, however, been told that the Daily Record were given the story of the complaints about Alex Salmond in order to spike another story that they had about you. Is that remotely true? Not, uh, that is not even something I had heard before. Can I just say, uh, your understanding that you started that question with, I, as I think you know is inaccurate, that no, my office wasn't sent um, a copy of the decision okay. report. Um, my principal private secretary, uh, when he appeared before the committee, um, wrote afterwards just to confirm that, because I think there had been some confusion between the letter that the permanent secretary wrote me on uh, the 22nd of August to tell me that the investigation had concluded and you know what was happening there. But my office was not and has not since been shared a copy of the decision report. So uh, just to be clear about that, and I think the committee has been made uh, very clear about that too. So now you can tell me what the story was about me that I was I don't know. trying to spike. I was asking. I'm, I was I'm asking intrigued. you. And I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, can, can you know, I just, do, do you reveal that I, publicly do, without do you checking with I, you. Um, just think how implausible. That, I've never heard that before. So that's a new okay. part of the conspiracy that I'm hearing today for the first time. Um, but 
Imagine how impossible, implausible that is. So we have a, an investigation that starts with two complaints uh, against Alex Salmon that the government uh, is investigating you know, throughout much of that year. And we just managed to time the culmination to spike some unknown story about me. That's an incredible coincidence, uh, which is why it didn't happen. Indeed, it is an incredible coincidence, yeah. but it gives you an opportunity to rebut that, which, is, I just which is very helpful. But can I take you back to the seriousness of the leak? Wherever it came from, it was clearly really concerning. Why didn't you or anybody on your behalf report the matter to the police? Uh, well, firstly, I agree about how concerning the leak is. Um, it's, it's one of many aspects of this that deeply troubles me because... Um, I don't know where it came from, and you know, as, as you take, take a, put, put aside the serious nature of the issue we're dealing with, it always troubles a, a politician when they don't know where a, a leak comes from. Uh, but I don't. Um, what I do know is that I would not have wanted, if if you'd given me the chance of this whole sorry matter never being in the public domain legitimately, I would have bitten your hand off for that. I never wanted to be publicly commenting on allegations of this nature against Alex Salmond. There is no part of me wanted to be in that position. It's also the case that you know, the government didn't benefit in any way from this leak. Now, OK, I appreciate that with hindsight, but it was this leak that had allowed some people from day one almost to cast the government as as the, the aggressor, the guilty party on this. So I don't know where the leak came from. I emphatically know it did not come from me or anybody acting um, on my authority or uh, instruction. In terms of, the, there obviously was investigations within the Scottish Government uh, and Mr Salmond uh, raised the matter, reported the matter to the Information Commissioner's Office. There was a, an investigation and then I think a review of that investigation by the Information Commissioner's Office, including by, and forgive me if I'm not getting the terminology right, it's criminal investigation uh, section, and they did not find evidence uh, that it, it had come from uh, within the, the Scottish Government. H my, they... my, my recollection is that they did, um, and uh, it was well, a limited you... number of people that it could have come from. If... But, but I'm, I'm not going to argue the point with you. My question it's, it's quite was... An important point. My question was... Why wasn't it reported to the police? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm happy to go away and reflect and think. I, I don't know whether that was something we considered. It, it wasn't, uh, okay. as far as I'm aware, uh, reported to the police by uh, the Scottish Government. Can I just, in terms of the ICO investigation decision letter, uh, which is dated the 6th of March 2020, uh, we are satisfied that there is no evidence to corroborate the complaint that an employee of the Scottish Government unlawfully obtained and disclosed personal data relating to Mr Salmond. Uh, we are also satisfied that there is no evidence that the Scottish Government acted in breach of Article 5.1 of the regulation in relation to the processing of Mr Salmond's personal data. Um, Mr Salmond has pointed to, and I probably won't be able to find this now, a, a comment, I think, when the decision was being reviewed at his request, where somebody said they were sympathetic to the hypothesis that it could have come from within the Scottish Government, but they had no evidence of that. And in fact, they expressly said that there was also, uh, it could also be uh, said that there was a possibility that it came from other sources as well. So to say that the Information Commissioner said that it came from the Scottish Government, uh, I would put to you, Ms Bailey, is not true. Can, can I then ask you again, First Minister, who else knew about this who else had details of the complaints that would have leaked that to the press? Um, so in terms of the, the numbers of people or the, the identities of people within the Scottish Government who would have had access to the decision report, I would have to sort of check and, and give that to you. I did not have access to the decision report. My office didn't have access to the decision report. Um, I think you've heard uh, evidence that, uh, that the, the, the matter was referred through the Crown agent to the police, but... Um, as I understand it, the police didn't take a, a copy of the decision report. Mr Salmond and his lawyers obviously had a copy of the decision report. I, I say that simply as a statement of fact. I do not know where the leak came from, and I cannot uh, say that emphatically enough. I wish I did know where the leak came from. Like everybody else, I can hypothesise and speculate. I do not know. What I do know uh, emphatically is that it did not come from me or anybody acting on my authority or instruction. Will you ask the police to investigate now? 
Um, I'm not. I'm happy to consider that, but I think well, the, given your concerns, which I share, well, surely we should do. I, that. I'm not. It's not me saying I want to consider that is not an indication that I don't think it is serious. Um, but and I think you heard a little bit of this from the Crown agent yesterday. Uh, the way these things uh, are reported for criminal investigation here would be uh, through, and I, I will stand corrected if I'm getting any of this wrong because I'm not an expert on the legal basis, but the ICO review as part of its criminal uh, review team looked at this and had they thought there was evidence, they would then have referred it through the police or, or the Crown Office. The fact that they have already done that and decided there wasn't evidence of that would simply lead me to believe there may not be much purpose in doing what you're asking me to do because that process has already been undertaken. But given that you have asked me, I'm not going to sit here and, and answer it definitively right now, but given that you have asked me, I will consider it and come back to you when I've had the chance to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, well, we're at the time we should take a break, but I know that Murdo Fraser has a very specific supplementary to Jackie Bailey's session. So quickly, please. Yeah. Th thank you, Convener. Good morning, um, First Minister. C can I just follow up briefly, if I may, the line of questioning from Jackie Bailey about the um, release or the alleged release of the name of a complainant to um, Jeff Aberdeen, which is an incredibly serious issue, you would accept, and would be an appalling breach of privacy. Um, we've, 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 we've heard what Jeff Aberdeen had to say. Let me just read you what Duncan Hamilton said in his, in his uh, submission. I can also confirm that I was told the name of a complainant by Mr. Aberdeen in the early part of March 2018. I cannot recall the precise date, but it was very shortly after the 7th of March, the date Mr. Salmon received this letter. The name of the complainant had been given to Mr. Aberdeen by a senior government official. I confirm I am aware of the identity of the government official who gave the name of the complainant to Mr. Aberdeen. The fact that the, the government official had shared that information with Mr Aberdeen was reported to me and to Kevin Pringle on a conference call. I had never heard of the individual named, but Mr Pringle had. And in his written submission, Mr Kevin Pringle uh, basically corroborates that. So here we have a statement by Jeff Aberdeen, corroborated by Duncan Hamilton and corroborated by Kevin Pringle. You're a lawyer, you're well aware in the rules of evidence of the importance of corroboration. You've suggested that the senior official we're talking about has a different version of events. Who would corroborate that alternative version of events? Um, you, so you would have to, and you know, it's not for me to tell the committee how to do its work, but it's, you, you started your question to me there um, with the statement, I think, that we have heard from Jeff Aberdeen. I, I'm not aware that the committee has heard from Jeff Aberdeen. If I'm wrong about that, I apologise. Um, and has certainly not, uh, as I understand it, certainly not orally uh, heard from the other person. It is open to the committee to test that privately with either or both of them. Um, James Hamilton, I understand, has accounts for uh, from both of them and will be able to, to make uh, his assessment of that. Uh, my understanding, and I was not a party to this discussion, is that that did not happen. Now, in a, a discussion where there are two people, uh, then clearly if you've got a different account, then people have to decide taking account of the whole uh, the whole picture, which we're not able to do today, unfortunately, because of the, the constraints upon us. But what I would say is, as I said already, uh, Duncan and Kevin were not party to that discussion. The bit of the evidence, and you know, I am, I am making assumptions here and I want to be very clear about that, but the bit of the evidence from Duncan that you read out about how this is information uh, after Mr Salmond had received uh, a letter, I think on the 7th of March, my assumption based on what I know about this and based on what Mr Salmond uh, shared with me is that by that point, I can't work out how Mr Salmond would not have known that from his own knowledge at that point. Uh, I, I think, and again, I will stand to be corrected, I think Jeff knew uh, at the time about the apology to this individual in 2013. So the fact that there was a knowledge of the identity of this individual may well have been the case, but you know, I can only say what I have been uh, advised about this 
uh, conversation. I wasn't party to it. It would be serious if the, the identity of a complainant was revealed. I absolutely accept that. But that is not what I understand happened in the way that is being uh, set out. And as I say, it is open to the committee to take uh, evidence, even if it is in private, from both of the people who were party to that. I come back to um, another point, and again, my, you know, if my recollection is wrong about this, then no doubt uh, somebody will say so. But I do not recall Alex Hammond giving me any suggestion on the 2nd of April that he had known the identity of a complainant, uh, a complainer, because it had been told to him by somebody in the Scottish Government. I repeat again, one of the complainers he knew about because he knew about the incident. Uh, you know, if, if you are openly saying you've apologised to somebody for an alleged incident, then clearly you know who they are. And I do remember him telling, I don't remember if he used the name in the second complainer, but he had identified the second complainer by going through the Scottish Government Flickr account. So I'm trying here to tell you what I know from uh, my own recollection and my own direct discussions. Um, I've gone as far as I can in telling you uh, my understanding of a, a discussion that I wasn't party to. Thank you, First Minister. But it doesn't get away from the fact that we have a statement here that two other individuals will corroborate. Mm -hmm. I, I've given you the opportunity to say you might corroborate the alternative version of events that you put mm -hmm. forward, and there is no corroboration for that. In effect, what you're saying is the evidence that has been presented to us is untrue. Now, why, why, would, why would Jeff Aberdeen, a very senior person in the, in the history of the SNP, now pursuing a career in, uh, in financial services, as you're aware, why would he give evidence that was untrue? I've not heard or seen Jeff's own evidence, and I'm, I'm very conscious of that. I cannot, I am not, you know, all of these people in you know, this will be a feature of much of our discussion today. You're talking about, you know, personal relationships that, that go back a long time. You know, the people we're talking about here, I have worked with and known and considered friends for a long time. I'm not here to, you know, cast aspersions on anybody's, you know, bona fides or sincerity here. But it, clearly there are differing recollections and differing accounts. I can speak more clearly about the accounts or the conversations I was part of. I am telling you what my understanding is uh, of a conversation I was not part of. Uh, and in terms of, you know, clearly a couple of things, people who, and you know this because you're a lawyer, uh, people who are told about something that happened in a conversation that is not necessarily, they were not part of that, that is hearsay uh, evidence. Um, in terms of who corroborates on the part of the, you have to look at the, the bigger picture. Um, and it, what I'm saying to you here is, I, I can think of why the name of a complainant might have been known at that time. Uh, that does not mean it was uh, revealed or identified in the way that has been said. And I, I'm not going to repeat everything I've said about the 2nd of April, but Mr Salmon knew the identity of both complainers in one case because, as he told me, he had apologised to her. her. It, that's my recollection of, of how he knew the, that complainer and the other because he'd done his own investigations to find out. But, I mean, you're absolutely right, First Minister, we do not have evidence in front of us from Jeff mm -hmm. Aberdeen. But we have evidence in front of us from both Duncan Hamilton and that. from Kevin Pringle, both saying that he told them this version of events. So either they are not telling us the truth, or the senior official you refer to is not telling the truth. Um, look, I, I don't think I can go much further than I already have on this. I keep saying it's not for me to tell the committee how to do its work, uh, but it is open to the committee um, to speak to the two people who were party to this discussion in private to try to get a sense of, you know, is there a direct clash of recollection or is there a misunderstanding in what actually happened? Okay. That's Mr that's Fraser, that's could yeah. you be quick? I'm yeah. very aware of the timing to just refresh one, this one, Just one final question, uh, Convener. I mean, this is clearly a very serious matter mm -hmm. because there are very serious claims that have been made here about the release of a complainant's name, which, apart from anything else, would be illegal under GPR, GDPR. It's a, it's a breach of privacy and potentially a criminal act for which we have corroborated statements from witnesses alleging it has taken place. Have you had this matter investigated in the Scottish Government? Uh, look, these are matters that are under investigation uh, by this committee, by an independent... No, no, I'm talking advisor. about the police. Uh, are the police no, investigating this? I, I and if not, not, why not? I am not aware of the police investigating that. I don't, 
I don't instruct the police, uh, contrary to some suggestions that have been made. Uh, so but, it's but, up but to the respect, police. First Minister, as head of the Scottish Government, do you not have a responsibility to protect the privacy of complainants who work within the Scottish Government who have made complaints? Yeah. And the allegation, a very serious allegation, has been made here about the release of a complainant's name, which is a criminal act. Surely you, as head of the government, should be taking action on that. I am trying to respect the processes that are already underway into these things, this committee and the inquiry into the, the ministerial code. Um, these, are all, these are matters that are being considered by both of those. And I, rightly or wrongly, Mr Fraser, and people can draw their own conclusions from that, but rightly and wrongly, I am trying to allow these processes to, to run their course. Uh, the police do not need my authority to investigate any matter that they wish to investigate. Um, Mr Whiteman, you've assured me this is a very short supplementary, so please make it so. It, it is, just to confirm in the ICO, so the, the, the review of the decision by the criminal investigation team, uh, which was reported to Levy McCray on the 20th May 2020, says at para 4.8, there remains the possibility that the leak came from elsewhere. The list of stakeholders who had access to the internal misconduct investigation report includes the original complainants, the QC, the First Minister's Principal Private Secretary, the Crown Office and Procurator to Fiscal Service, and Mr Salmond and Levy and McRae, as well as relevant staff members of the SG. So it appears from the Information Commissioner's report that the First Minister's Principal Private Secretary did have a copy of the internal misconduct investigation report. I think you said previously that your office had not got a copy. So my, my understanding, and I think uh, my Principal Private Secretary has written to the committee on this, is that that is a, a misapprehension from the internal government uh, investigation into this, that he did not get sent, my office did not get sent the decision report. Um, if there's further clarification we can usefully, usefully provide on that, we will do. But I did not get sent the uh, decision report and my office did not get sent the decision report. Okay, and finally, the kind of uh, leak of the name of a complainer or indeed the leak of a decision report Anyone in Scottish Government who did leak or make public or communicate to a third party such information, that would be a dismissal offence, wouldn't it, fairly clearly? It would be, I would imagine so, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, everyone. And in line with the agreed mitigations to allow us to meet safely in person today, I will suspend this session for around 20 minutes. So we will reconvene at 11.35. Uh, can I remind members and everyone else to observe social distancing when leaving the committee room and during the break, and I now suspend this session.
Good morning and welcome back to the 15th meeting of this committee in 2021. And this is an evidence session with the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, MSP. I can confirm that the First Minister took the affirmation at the start of this morning's evidence session. Uh, before um, we suspended, we were discussing the theme of complaints handling. Uh, we'll stick with that and I therefore go to Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, convener. Good uh, morning, First Minister. Thanks for coming to see us today. Um, I'd like to continue the theme of discussion around uh, confidentiality, around complainers. But before I do, I have a couple of very specific questions, just around the way you phrase things, because I think that words matter. Um, and I was very struck that in your opening statement, um, to describe uh, the revelation of the investigation, you used the phrase that I think you always have done since these allegations came to light, and that is that Alex Salmond informed me of the investigation on the 2nd of April. Um, do you accept that there's a difference between having knowledge of a specific complaint and investigation and having awareness that someone might have come forward with a concern? Yes. Okay. With that in mind, can I ask, when did you first become aware that a civil servant may have come forward in 2017 with a concern about historic behaviour on the part of Alex Salmon? Not a formal complaint or an investigation. When did you just have awareness of that as a, a reality, that somebody had come forward? So I, and I'm not trying to play with words here. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, answer your questions as directly um, as I can, um, based on my recollection of conversations uh, that I had. Um, we'll come on to the 29th of March. Uh, so I, partly from the November Sky query, which we may or may not come on to, and then my conversation with Jeff Aberdeen, I had an awareness that there was um, a, an issue with concerns about Alex Salmond and that they may be in the form of a complaint. Uh, but it wasn't until I read the Permanent Secretary's letter on the 2nd of April that I knew beyond any doubt uh, that any general concerns or suspicions I might have had actually became detailed and actual knowledge of the fact there were two complaints, that there were by civil servants, that were being investigated under that procedure and what the nature of the complaints was. So if it was just about Sky News in the airport, that wouldn't have actually been a complaint in your government. But, so just to be crystal clear, um, you did have awareness that there might be a concern raised within the civil service about Mr Salmond in or around that time. So from the 29th of March, um, and this, I think, is a distinction from the, the 2nd of November, uh, the 4th of November, I think that query was, um, I... I had, and you know, we'll come on to this, and you know, it's a frustration for me. You know, my recollection of the conversation with Jeff is not as vivid as I wish it was, which I think perhaps tells its own story. But I came out of that and went into the second of April meeting. Um, I, I will ask you about the 29th of no, March no, but later I'm, on. Okay, for, I'm trying to answer your question. Yeah, so, of course. what I'm saying to you is, ahead of the second of April, I, I had an awareness there was. A complaint. Uh, no doubt, I had uh, suspicions of what the nature of that might be, but but that's what it was—a general awareness, uh, a suspicion that no doubt I had all sorts of theories for in my head. But it was reading the permanent secretary's letter that he showed me on the second of April that gave me the knowledge and the detail behind that knowledge uh, of all the things that I've spoken about. And forgive me for interrupting there. Um, no, and that comes back to that distinction between knowledge of a complaint and awareness that something might be going on. Can I just, final question on this bit. Um, did you have awareness before the 29th of March that there might be complaints or concerns emerging within the civil service? Uh, not specifically, but again, this relates, and I know you've, uh, I think, uh, heard some of this from the permanent secretary. So. The 4th of November Sky query that I spoke directly to Alex Hammond about on, on more than one occasion over a, a couple of days left me, for a variety of reasons uh, that I can go into or not, as you wish, um, with just a, a sense of unease. I, I can't put it any more strongly than that. One of the reasons, I think, that led to that was that uh, I had been made aware, that the, just for the chronology of this, the Sky query came in on a Saturday night, I spoke to him on the Sunday. I was made aware on the Monday that him and or his lawyers had been phoning 
uh, people within the civil service, and I spoke to him again about that. And I can't, I can't put this any more firmly than I'm about to put it to you, and I, I'm sorry about that. That, and the way that that was raised with me, just led to a sense of unease that that, him phoning, or these phone calls, whether they're from him or his lawyer, had stirred something, kind of poked a hornet's nest. So I didn't have knowledge of uh, specific uh, complaints, but I, it wasn't something I thought about every day. It wasn't something that I lay awake at night at that point worrying about, but I had a lingering suspicion that there just might be something in the ether, in the undergrowth that could surface. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think the reason I ask about your phrasing is because when all this broke in the media, you gave several calculated and selective answers on national television to people like Sophie Ridge and Andrew Marr, and then had to reverse those positions when certain information came to light. Can you see why people might feel misled by your description of these events? Um, so looking at this as a, I was going to say dispassionately, but that's not the right word because that's not something that's possible for me to do. But yes, I, I can. Um, and to try to explain things, um, again, as openly as I can. Firstly, this is all stuff that, and I don't want to labour this because it's not of any interest to the committee and it's not, it's not, me, it's not me appealing for sort of special treatment here. This stuff's deeply personal for me and it's really quite hard to talk about. And at times, if I have appeared as if I'm cagey about it, that's one of the reasons. One of the other reasons, you talk about interviews with Andrew Marr and Sophie Ridge, uh, I think, I don't think this is true of the Sophie Ridge one, if it's the one I'm thinking about, but certainly Andrew Marr, uh, at the time he first asked me about this. At that time, what was also con I was very conscious of is that there was an ongoing investigation. I was really, really uh, worried that anything I, anything I said about this at any time would cause headlines, news, commentary. I was always trying to avoid doing that. So if I, if I appeared as if I was not being as, as kind of open and discursive and full, that was another of the reasons. The other point about the sky thing and why I didn't, I, I think it's a point Glenn Campbell has made as well, when the, the government investigation process became public, that I, I didn't refer to that. that. Although that had left me with lingering suspicions, at that point, that story had never run, it had never surfaced as far as... As far as I knew, there was nothing to it, although you know, I did have some concerns that there might be something to it. Uh, so I had nothing to base that on beyond what I'm telling you here. So yes, I do understand why people might see that. And I, I would just say to people that there are a lot of factors here, not least, you know, I've, I've seen commentary to the effect that I always seem really uncomfortable when I speak about this. I am really uncomfortable when I speak about this. We were talking here about serious allegations that have led to the breakdown in a relationship with somebody that was really important to me on all sorts of levels. So I do feel uncomfortable when I speak about this at a human level, um, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to answer questions as First Minister, and I, I am trying to do that. I appreciate that, First Minister, but you understand that this comes to the very heart of what we're considering. Your knowledge of these events really matters, mm -hmm. and the fact that you had to reverse your position of what you knew and when on Andrew Marr has left people with some considerable doubt. I will move can, on. Can, can I, yes, of forgive course, me, just, the, the other point about Andrew Marr, and again, you know, I appreciate people watching this may not see this. I, I think when Andrew Marr, uh, you'll be loving the fact that he's featuring so heavily in this discussion right now, um, when he came back to ask me this, I think I made the point that I felt two issues were being conflated. I, th I thought the question I was answering the first time was around the Scottish Government complaints, whereas what I had had previous knowledge of was, was the Sky query, which is a different thing. So sometimes one of the other reasons here is that different things have been conflated when they are actually separate. OK. Um, I'd like to move now to the issue that Murdo Fraser and Jackie Bailey were discussing with you before the break about the confidentiality of complainers. And we have had it corroborated, um, the, the assertion that a name of a complainer was given to Jeff Aberdeen. Um, if true, that's an egregious breach of confidentiality. Um, and you told Jackie Bailey that you don't accept it. You confirmed that you'd spoken to the senior official who's accused of this um, when you learned of it. Um, is that the reach of your investigation into this issue? Um, I know that... So at the moment, I am trying to respect the, pro the other investigative processes that are underway here. Um, I know that 
uh, I, I can't speak for Jeff Aberdeen, but I, I know that James Hamilton has an account of this, and as I say, it's up to the committee to decide what it does. Can I just... Jackie Bailey suggested earlier on that I had somehow contradicted myself today against what I said last week at First Minister's Questions. I have the official report here, and I did not. What I said was not that I didn't have knowledge of this allegation. What I said was that, to the best of my knowledge, the allegation wasn't true. I can read the official report, should anybody want me to. That, um, with respect, James Hamilton is investigating your actions, not those around you, but I mean, he might have a, a judgment to make on those as well. We, we will discover that. Um, nevertheless, it is a sackable offence to, to breach confidentiality in that way. So um, would you be surprised that the senior official that you asked about this as the reach of your investigation denied it? Um, look, I, I'm not sure, convener, I can say much more about this than I already have, and I've, I've tried to be as expansive as, as possible within constraints. What I... I do know is, I mean, we're talking about breaches of confidentiality and GDPR, and, and actually I think these issues are, are even more fundamental than that. I don't disagree. If this happened, it would be as serious as you're saying, but I, I've set out why um, I am not uh, sitting here accepting uh, as fact that that happened, because I, I think there is a, an alternative explanation of that. But I can only, in talking about GDPR and confidentiality, um, the person who told me the identity of certainly one complainant and certainly gave me the impression he knew the identity of the other, and I can't remember if he told me the name, was, was Alex Salmond. Okay. Um, final question on this bit, and then I will move on, I promise, convener, to other aspects of confidentiality. I mean, this revelation, if it happened, well, it clearly not Jeff Aberdeen for six. He had a telephone conference with Kevin Pringle and Duncan Hamilton. We also understand, I believe, that he reached out to a former civil servant um, who he was very close with as well, um, clearly reeling from this. Um, yet, I, I understand you've not attempted to contact any of them? Um, I haven't uh, attempted to contact Jeff Aberdeen about this because I think if I had, and I was sitting here saying that right now in front of this committee, I would probably be okay. getting criticised for... I mean, I, I don't have it in front of me, convener, but, you know, the, the initial letter I got from this committee asking for written evidence, I think, had words to the effect that I shouldn't be comparing stories with, with other witnesses. I've tried to respect the processes of, of this committee. I, I fully understand your position there, um, First Minister. The reason I'm labouring this point, I dare say the reason Mr Fraser and Ms Bailey are labouring this point, is that if this is true, this may turn out to be one of the biggest failures of the complainers at the heart of this, that their name was passed to the um, emissaries of the man they were accusing. Um, and it just feels like that you've just taken the word of the person who's accused and, and not investigated. I, I won't proceed any further can, can, on that can matter. I just, of course. I, the, I don't want anybody to think that I don't treat this seriously. But this, and I say again, you, you've said things there to me about Jeff's account that certainly to the best of my recollection, I've not heard. So I, I've not seen Jeff's account. Um, it is open to this committee to have Jeff and the other individual who were actually party to this discussion in front of them, at, at least privately. And... You know, I can only say so much about a conversation I was not party to. Um, what I do know is that Alex Ammond himself gave me the, uh, or shared uh, openly at the meeting on 2nd of April, the identity of at least one and possibly two of the complainers. And, and to the best of my recollection, did not give me any indication that day that he had got the identity of a complainer for some, from somebody with, with the description that you're using. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move now to the leak to the daily record. I won't cover that in and of itself because I think Jackie Bailey's done that very well. Um, but I find it curious that the day before the leak to the daily record, the government was about to press release the fact of the investigation um, and were only stopped by legal action uh, from Mr Salmond. Um, was that press release prepared with your consent? Uh, so the chronology of this is that I was uh, written to by the permanent secretary. I'd, I'd I can't recall whether the committee's got that letter. Um, I don't see why it wouldn't have. Um, on the 22nd of August, um, I think I've got the letter somewhere here, but I'll go through it from, from memory right now, telling me that the uh, investigation had concluded, that certain things had been upheld, that uh, a decision had been taken to refer, I think, three matters to the police. By the time the permanent secretary wrote to me, that referral had taken place. And that letter on the 22nd of August told me that there was further consideration 
about uh, putting into the public domain some very limited information, and uh, th but that decision hadn't been taken. I was so it was not my press release. It was not a press release I was preparing. As I understand it, I, as I think I understood it at the time, but as I certainly understand it now, uh, the the reason for that was that the government also had a requirement at that time to answer a freedom of information request, and the the question was whether well I can't remember the exact phraseology of it, but would have required that information. Um, on the day of the, if I get my dates right here, the 23rd of August, when I think the Permanent Secretary decided that a limited amount of information would be put in the public domain, that was notified to Alex Salmond, his lawyers uh, threatened interdict action and the government decided not to. The query from the Daily Record came in later. I understand the government made Alex Salmond's lawyers aware of the query from the Daily Record and, you know, it's not for me to say it. Alex Hammond at that point clearly decided not to take action against the Daily Records. Um, so that's my, my knowledge of the chronology of that. That's very helpful. Thank you. A uh, very brief question on this. Um, were the complainers asked if they were happy for the, the press release to go or that limited uh, amount of public information? I, so I wasn't... It wasn't me as the decision maker in this process. I th Now, from aware? memory, again, I'm going to check this. I, I think they had certainly been told that there was limited information going to go out. What I can't recall, and I would need to check, is whether they had been asked their opinion or just advised of it. Two final short questions, if I may convene. Um, it's odd, but the, the police had advised, expressly advised, against releasing information of this kind, considering it had been passed to Crown, or the report had been passed to Crown as well. Can you see that, taken together, these two things, the press release and then the leak, um, looked like a determined attempt to splash this information in order to damage Alex Salmond, irrespective of what that might mean for the complainers. So I think if you want to see it that way, you can certainly see it that way. And I should say, I, I'm now commenting on things that I, I, I know about, that I wasn't centrally in, involved in the decision-making uh, around mm -hmm. at the time. But I, I would go back to the fact that, as I understand it, what tipped the balance in favour of putting in some... Uh, limited information into the public domain was the freedom of information request that had to be answered. Um, and that was the, the basis for, for that consideration. What I would say, and I've said it before, and I can't, I can't speak for anybody other than myself here, I, I did not want ever to be in a situation where I was standing in front of a camera talking about allegations of this nature against Alex Salmond. I had no desire for this to be in the public domain. I certainly would not have tried to illegitimately block it because that would not have been appropriate but you know I, I think when I I, th I think I did know that because of the, the the threatened interdict a planned press release hadn't it couldn't go because there had been interdict action threatened I, I see I, I recall that feeling quite relieved about that because it meant that I wasn't suddenly facing this thing coming into the public domain I never wanted I never wanted any of this to happen and I certainly wouldn't have had any desire to see this forced into the public domain. Forgive me, First Minister, I wasn't suggesting it was necessarily you that had the desire to push that information out there. I've, my final question, you'll be glad to hear, Convener. Um, around this time, the report of the investigation was also passed by the Permanent Secretary to the Crown agent um, against the wishes of the complainers at the heart of this. Was that the right thing to do? Um, I, I think, on balance, yes, it, it, it was the right thing to do. It wasn't, so when the Permanent Secretary wrote to me on the 22nd of August, that referral, it wasn't just that the decision had been made, the referral had been made by that point. Um, one of the things I found myself doing, and I, I'll answer it specifically in relation to this, in terms of all of the charges that are being levelled at me or the government generally, is to almost pose the counterfactual. Um, had we done the opposite, by we, I'm just talking generically here. So had the Permanent Secretary sitting with allegations, complaints that she'd gone through a process and thought had substance to them, and on the face of it involved criminality, um, alleged criminality, not passed that to the police. And that had then later come out. I think the questions that would be getting posed would be just as serious, but from the opposite perspective. In fact, that would have been criminality against people who have agency and the capacity to make decisions about what they want done with what's happened to them. And these women expressly said they didn't want a criminal... Uh, involvement. I think government has, and I've, I've read some stuff, I don't, 
I will have it in here, but I'm not going to start looking through it. I think ACAS guidance talks about, you know, sometimes there is still a, a, a need to refer something to the police, even when people don't want that to happen. The Scottish Government's got a duty if, and I use that in a kind of not a technical sense, although it maybe is true in a technical sense, um, to if, if it thinks criminal acts have been uh, committed to, to do something about that, I would... I would think, I don't know how strongly the opposition was expressed by the two complainants, um, but I think on, you know, these things often come down to, to judgment. And I think much of what we're discussing here today and much of what we will discuss here today, the things we are being criticized for, I am being criticized for perfectly legitimately. I understand why people are doing that, but had I done the opposite, I would also be getting criticized. Um, and that's perhaps just a reflection of the invidious, almost impossible situation that's placed a lot of people in. Thank you, convener. Alistair Allen. Thank you, convener. Um, to build on some of the questions there, one of the questions asked there by Mr. Cole Hamilton, um, you've described this, the circumstances around the, the press release, and indeed, Mr. Salmond, described to us and his view is remarkable the fact that the permanent secretary uh, had planned to, to make a press statement on the 23rd of August announcing the outcome of the complaint against him. Um, did the permanent secretary or anyone else in the government subsequently seek to give a formal explanation of that order of events and the reasons behind them? To, to you? To me? Well, the the permanent secretary's letter to me, I can dig it out exactly if people want me to quote from it, indicated, this is the one on the 22nd of August, that the issue of uh, issuing a press comment was still under consideration. And then uh, and the freedom of information. So that's been uh, what I understood then and what I've understood since was that the reason for deciding on the balance of judgment uh, to do that was that there was this outstanding freedom of information request that, that had to be answered. You know, and I, I think it was asking the question, have complaints or concerns been raised about Alex Salmon's behaviour? So that was the judgment that was made. Again, I, I, you know, I play the, the counterfactual. Um, had we, were we sitting here you know, a couple of years on and, and this had all come to light that there had been a government investigation that nobody had known about, that it had upheld complaints against Alex Salmon and put in a drawer? Now, people can draw their own judgments on which course was right or wrong, but I bet my bottom dollar I'd probably be sitting here right now answering questions about why we thought it was appropriate to just keep it private. So these are really difficult situations, really difficult judgments. Did, did government, me, the rest of us, get every single one of these judgments right? Possibly not. That's for others to judge. But I think at every step of the way, uh, there was a real effort made to get it right. Now, the other thing I've tried to do, and actually it's not that hard because of my past relationship with them, I've tried to see it from Alex Hammond's point of view. Given... Given his position, given what he's gone through, I, subjectively, I'm not surprised he takes a different view on some of these key judgments. That's understandable, but it doesn't <coughs> necessarily make him right and the government wrong. And that's just the, the fact of the matter. If I can turn to, to one of the other issues in that case where uh, Mr. Salmond took a, a different view, speaking to us, and, and where you take a different view, um, it's a, a matter of record that Mr. Salmond uh, was uh, of the view that you should uh, intervene to advocate the use of arbitration in the complaints against them. I asked him about that last week, about whether arbitration for a public law matter uh, related to sexual harassment in this case uh, would not have been inappropriate. Now, that was something he refuted. Should the Scottish Government have looked at arbitration in your view, or uh, do you continue to take the view that your government was right not to go down that line? So, Alex Hammond uh, wanted me to intervene on, on two, uh, at two points on yeah. two issues. Firstly, uh, before we got to the point of arbitration, uh, he wanted me to intervene to effectively persuade the permanent secretary, secretary to agree to a process of mediation. Arbitrate, and that would have been mediation, as I understood it, between him and the complainers. Um, it was later that he started to seek a process of arbitration of, of the procedure. Um, now, the, I suppose the, the government considered, you know, 
in terms of the process that was underway at the time, these things were considered. They came to the views that, that these weren't appropriate things. I, you know, I, I think if you want my view um, now, I think mediation, particularly as I understand it, the complainers didn't want that in a situation like this would not have been an appropriate thing to force uh, into a process that didn't in and of itself account, uh, allow for that. And then arbitration of a, a public procedure where the issues were very much kind of public law issues. I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but it's not immediately obvious to me that arbitration would have been the right thing to do that or necessarily a quicker or cheaper or more effective way of, of dealing with these things. But these were things the government looked at in the course of the investigation. The issues for me are not so much whether I think mediation or arbitration should or should not have happened. The issue for me was it appropriate for me to intervene in the process to try to bring either of them about. And I don't think it was, given the nature of this process <coughs> and my lack of role in it at that stage. And again, posing the counterfactual, had I done so, I think I would be facing serious criticism um, on that score as well. In fact, when this first came to light, I think from the questioning of me in, in the chamber, that's what people thought that they were about to sort of start to level at me. Um, and I don't think the treatment of me would have been particularly favourable. I don't think MD around this table would be sitting here patting me on the back today had I sought to intervene and influence the course of that procedure. Because the final point I would make, I'm not questioning that Alec thought that both mediation and arbitration might in their own terms have been appropriate. But I also had the strong impression that in terms of both of them, they were devices to stop this, these complaints coming to the point of, of decision. And therefore, had I intervened to try to bring them about, I would have felt that I was effectively colluding with him to try to, to thwart the direction and the, the natural course of an investigation. And I think that would have been a, a heinous, egregious breach of, of my position. I appreciate the distinction you make, uh, First Minister, between arbitration and mediation. Um, it became clear last week that Mr Salmond uh, does not believe that the original complaints under the procedure were so much made in bad faith. Uh, rather, he seems to believe, or he indicated, that um, in his view, various people were trying to manufacture allegations against them after that point. Um, he cites a variety of emails sent out to past and present members of staff, particularly to women around this time. He believes those, or he's indicated to us, that he thought they were a fishing exercise uh, rather than offers of support. Um, what's your understanding of all that and of all those communications? Well, the, the ones that uh, I know have been uh, raised particularly are the ones sent by the SNP. So on two occasions, uh, one at the time of Me Too, we sent, we, we, we developed, I think other parties were doing the same, we developed not a new procedure, but a different route for people to raise complaints. So an independent uh, route, a, a lawyer uh, was there that people could go to speak to if they didn't want to go through the, the more internal route. Um, and we sent that out, I think, in an all member uh, email uh, around about the, the end of October. And I, I think that also went to, to staff or some communication around that went to staff. And then uh, secondly, after the situation with Alec had become public. Uh, again, communications went to, I think, uh, all members and to uh, members of staff, particular members of staff. That was a duty of care move at a time, you know, when you've got high profile situations like this, I think most organisations should and are right to perform that duty of care role of just saying to people, not fishing exercise, but if you've got any concerns, here's how you go about raising them. I, I really struggle, really struggle to see from a, an objective perspective, and I, I appreciate, and I'm not, it's not a criticism, I appreciate Alec can't be objective in this, um, but from any objective perspective, uh, I think that is not just a reasonable thing to do, but a perfectly appropriate uh, thing for the SNP to have done. Beyond that, I, I really, it, it dismays me to hear suggestions that people were concocting or making up uh, allegations. A number of women came forward and they came forward of their own free will. Did they support each other as, along the way? Some of them evidently did. You know, did people in the SNP, people who work with Alex Ammon, talk to each other, support each other? Absolutely. To try to suggest that is something it's not, I think is, is seriously wrong. Um, to this day, 
I don't know the identity of every single complainer in the criminal trial. Some of those whose identities I do know, I don't know them well. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, they don't all know each other well. The idea that this was some concoction or plot is, is just not based in any semblance of fact or any semblance of credible evidence. On the issue of the, the government's legal advice uh, in the actual process, um, what role can I ask does, does legal uh, does external counsel, I should say. Um, can, can I intervene here, Mr. Allen? Would you mind if we left that till we get to the ju judicial review section, please? Uh, I think okay. it would make our um, splitting up yep. of our chronological decisions more sensible. Okay, in that case, um, can I ask uh, more generally um, about um, the evidence, as it were, behind um, your position? I asked Mr. Salmon this question about the, the evidence that he could provide uh, behind. Uh, to back up his position. So, um, Mr. Salmon, for instance, has implied to us that there are many documents which have neither been able to be led in the criminal trial nor released to this committee, which back up his uh, position <laughs> on the claims he made in committee last week. Um, do you have a view on all of that and on why they have or haven't been released or, or the, 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 um, the conclusions he draws from these facts? Uh, I, I think it's fair to say I do. Um, I mean, uh, firstly, just I heard him say last week that you know the first minister says I've got to produce evidence. You know, it's it's not for me to produce evidence. I've already gone through two court cases. I, I'm not suggesting, and wasn't suggesting that Alex Salmond has to evidence his innocence of criminality. That that was done in a court, and that's beyond question. But if you're going to to pose the uh, the suggestion uh, or put forward the suggestion that there is uh, some kind of plot or as I think he described it, concerted malicious campaign. Mm -hmm. I do think there is a, a need to evidence that, and I have not heard evidence of that. There, there has been references repeatedly to material that was handed over to his defence uh, as part of the criminal trial. By definition, that is material that must have been seen by the police, by the Crown. I understand there were applications to have that material introduced into the criminal trial and the court decided it was not relevant. I, I would just, I suppose, put forward the view that if, there, if this material showed what Mr Salmond wants us to believe it shows, then somebody in the police or the Crown or the court might have seen that too. The fact that they didn't, I think people should draw some conclusions from. Um, in terms of the, the messages that have been quoted, uh, I, yes, I have tried to find out you know, where they're from, who they're to, you know, what the context is. And every single one that I've managed to, to get to a point where I can have a view myself, they are completely not the opposite of what he's trying to suggest. They're taken out of context, misrepresented, twisted. Um, what they show um, in terms of what I have seen are people supporting each other, uh, people... Uh, talking to each other, yeah, a bit of gossip about what was going on. Uh, remember, this was a massive thing for the SNP, particularly for people who had worked closely with them. And also, people cooperating with police inquiries. People, the SNP and individuals in the SNP were being asked to cooperate with police inquiries. And some of what's been misrepresented as trying to find or concoct evidence is actually people cooperating with the police at their request. So I have seen nothing that comes within a million miles of backing up that central assertion that Alec was making, that there was some kind of coordinated attempt for whatever motive, and the motive seems to be on shifting sands as well, the more I listen to it. Uh, I, I have seen nothing that comes within a million miles of demonstrating that. Finally, in that case, uh, convener, uh, if I can rewind a little, um, you alluded to this earlier on, but one of the first things we looked at as a committee uh, was workplace culture. We obviously heard evidence on that from Sir Peter Housden, the former permanent secretary in the Scottish Government, uh, who offered opinions about the workplace culture and uh, offered comments about the First Minister's, the former First Minister's place in it. Um, is there anything more you want to say about the issues that he raised and that you alluded to there? Uh, no, look, the, the point I agreed with, um, I'm sure there was more than one, but the point I agreed with with Alec on Friday is that this inquiry is not into him. This inquiry is into me and the government, and I accept that without reservation. I, I'd simply make the point it's impossible to, 
to, to properly uh, consider all these things without straying into you know, the, the allegations that were made against him. I'm not here to, other than to, to uh, rebut or explain my own actions, to, to cast aspersions on Alex Salmond. I've, you know, I'd dearly love to get to a point uh, where I don't have to think about Alex Salmond's behaviour or alleged behaviour ever again, um, to be perfectly frank about it. He was a tough guy to work with. Personally, I didn't experience that very much, maybe the nature of, of our relationship. Um, but he was a really tough guy to work with. Sometimes that was justified, sometimes it wasn't. And, you know, there would be times where I would, you know, tell him he'd gone over the score. And maybe, as I think I said to Andy Whiteman earlier on, maybe those of us who'd worked with him for so long became a bit inured to that. So we didn't see it when it was, or didn't appreciate it from the perspective of people who weren't so inured to that. But, you know, these are reflections that are not particularly germane to the committee's questioning of me. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Jackie Bailey has a short supplementary directly related to one of Mr it, Allen's questions. Indeed it is, and it's to the text and WhatsApp messages. Um, can I ask you about those um, that we discussed with Mr Salmond? Um, I'm excluding those messages that the committee have seen that we regarded as not relevant to our inquiry. But I'm thinking of the messages that we have yet to see this afternoon. Messages between Peter Morrill, Chief Executive of the SNP, Sue Ruddock, Chief Operating Officer, and Ian McCann, Compliance Officer. Um, given that you're also the leader of the SNP, did you ask to see those messages? Um, I've made inquiries about the messages to satisfy myself. They're not my messages, uh, but I've... So, you know, if you, if you take the ones between Sue and Peter, uh, the ones that have been quoted, the ones that I have seen, you know, they are just not as presented. Uh, you know, Peter's given his own account of his messages, you know, it is, and, and you know, if, if, and I don't know, if the committee gets to see the full version of one of the messages that, you know, pressuring the police has been taken from, I think you see a very, very different impression from that. You know, these are messages about, from people who were cooperating with police inquiries, supporting each other, uh, the, that message I've just spoken about, if I'm getting my dates right here, was the day after he'd been charged. I mean, just, just pause on this for a moment. This man that we had worked with, campaigned for, helped to get elected twice as First Minister, on the part of some of his people like me, considered him a really close personal friend, was just, had just been charged with a number of serious sexual offences. I defy anybody in that position not to be really upset a bit angry, um, and for that perhaps to come across in their communications. But the idea that that suggests some kind of plot or conspiracy is actually quite offensive, uh, given the years of loyalty that the people being accused of that have shown to, to Alex Hammond. You know, he quoted four messages uh, on Friday that I have taken steps to kind of make sure I, I could satisfy myself uh, are not untoward. And, you know, they are just... One of them, as I understand it, because I've been you know, told this by people whose messages they are, one of them I think the committee has seen um, as part of what it saw previously. Um, you know, and others are just about people. You know, there was one where he said something like, um, hey, where is it? Yeah, tell me, tell me the evidence I want or I'll, and I'll get it for them. What that is is somebody... Uh, who had made a complaint, who'd spent hours and hours and hours with the police and... Uh, First Minister, can I stop you there, okay. please? Um, our committee is going to see some messages later on that we um, requested of the Crown Office and I don't think it's appropriate for us to be taking a view on them before we've okay. read them in context. My apologies, I, I was trying to answer I know, a question. I know. Suffice yeah. to say, Fine. these messages and the committee will draw its own conclusions. I, I'm not saying I've seen all of the ones that the committee will see. I have no idea. Uh, but these are people who were upset, at times angry, talking to each other, supporting each other, and crucially, cooperating with police inquiries. And seen in context, I think any objective person will draw that conclusion, certainly based on what I've seen. Well, well the, the committee the will draw its own conclusions yeah, The convener later on. is right to remind us of that, but, but I'm not asking about the messages and the, con the content of them. I'm asking whether you've seen them and whether you're, you're reassured by them. Uh, so, I, I don't know if I've seen all of the messages okay. Alex Hammond is referring to, because I don't know all of the messages he's referring to. I have seen 
uh, or I've had an account of uh, the ones he has quoted. And yes, I am satisfied that they are not, as he is suggesting, in terms of the motive and what lies behind them, is anything like what he is suggesting. I'm sorry to press you on this, but, but I'm asking, have you asked to see them all as leader of the SNP? Have you asked to see them all? I, I don't know what all is, Ms Bailey. OK. I, you know, I, I don't know what all means in this context. Fine, I'll leave it there. Thank okay. you, convener. I have two more requests in this particular section on complaints handling. I have Margaret Mitchell and then Andy White. And it's now good afternoon, Mr. First Minister. Before I get to my substantive point, it would be good to clarify just some time scales here. We know Fairness to Work took 18 months to um, develop. This procedure took three months. Um, can you confirm when the claimants, uh, the complainants, finally decided that they, they would officially complain? Um, I, uh, if you give me, I can find that uh, this is stuff I only know in the way you know, because I, I now, well, not quite in the way you know it, but this is stuff I am telling you with hindsight. So, um, as I now understand it, uh, the, the official complaints were made in the January, uh, although there had been some informal uh, contact in the uh, the latter part of the previous year. Okay, thank you. And can you tell me when the procedure uh, was uh, published on the Scottish Government website? It was published in February of uh, 20... So I'm getting my years mixed up here. 2018, that would be... Um, I can find the date. I want to say the 8th, but I'm not... 100% sure that it's precisely the 8th, but February, and there's been an issue made of why did it take so long to publish it. Um, we were also doing some uh, work to review the ministerial code for the same reasons out of Me Too, and the decision had been taken to publish it all together. Right. So when was the um, policy signed off? The 20th of December. That, uh, you'll be aware, is being disputed by the, the First Minister and... Um, I am the First Minister. ...by the former First Minister, um, just in his last submission. So it's maybe something that... Um, we what what does, he dis does, does he dispute it's, it's, the date of the sign-off of the policy? I wasn't was aware he did that. It was three months in the development. It started in November, mm -hmm. December, January, and then published immediately, it was signed off, which would be February. Yet the complainants, if you just said, made their um, complaint in January before um, he is alleging the, the complaints procedure was signed off. Again, I'm uh, in this context, it might feel a bit unusual here. I'm jumping in maybe wrongly to defend the former First Minister. Um, I, I'm not sure. So he, he certainly disputes a lot of this, but I wasn't aware, and maybe I'm wrong, that he disputes it was signed off on the 20th of December. He obviously has an issue about the fact that it wasn't published straight away, and therefore why were complainants aware of it. But um, it was signed off on the 20th of December. There were no changes made to it after that, um, and it was published in February. Was that ideal? No, it, it wasn't. But it, the, the reason for that is that there was other work, related work, underway. And, of course, as, as we know, uh, that uh, one of the issues around the judicial review is that one of the concerns here was that it, it was in operation before it had been uh, published in the way that you're talking about. Can you tell us when the complainants first came forward? Um, I... Uh, I can find these dates because these are dates that I uh, only became aware of uh, afterwards, but I think they came, one of them, I, th I think they were around November 2017 in terms of concerns first being raised, um, but then the formal complaints uh, were in January 2018. Yeah, I, I merely say there's a discrepancy then about how long it took to develop this process from beginning to end. But don't understand what you say the discrepancy Well, it was so three months um, in the making. So if they only came forward in November, December, that would take you to the end of January before the, um, the procedure was signed off. I, I really am not sure I'm following. The, the procedure was in place from the 20th of December. It wasn't published until February, but the procedure was in place and clearly being used. The, the dates that the complaints came forward is a separate, I mean, I know very related, but it's a separate issue. The, the, the procedure was signed off on the 20th of December. Um, I, I know that because I did it. 
Right. But the complaints only came forward in November. What happened in October? If it's a three-month period from beginning to so end... So, I, I, convene up with... I, I, with I'm, my apologies, I am not I'm following this line of questioning. There. All I'm going to leave hanging in there, and others can look at it, um, and we can go back and check C things. Given the three months of pol policy, complainants came forward in November. I, I don't understand no, the three months hold, hold policy. On, hold on, First Minister, and, and please, Margaret, could, could you go to the beginning of, of your query again? Yes. Because I, I think when it is When did the confusing. work start on developing the process? The Cabinet commissioned it on the 31st, commissioned a review on the 31st of October. I think you've heard evidence from James Hind that the first draft of the policy which he was involved in was the, the 7th of November. So the work on the procedure started at that early November stage um, and concluded with the procedure being signed off on the 20th of December. Um, the dates of the complaints are not, you know, are separate from the, the development of the procedure. I know the two things are obviously in practice connected, but the, the procedure was developed and signed off in that timescale and in you know, a parallel track, the emergence of complaints. Okay, I'm going to leave that there because I don't think we're going to get too much further with that um, first minute. I'm not sure I'm going to get much further with it, that's <laughs> for sure. And um, turn now to the issue that Alex Co Hamilton raised, and, and that's the fact that we know the complainants did not want to um, report their complaints to the police, um, but it was on the basis of the IO report and the Premier Secretary's final decision this was done. We have a submission from Police Scotland came in in January and um, it makes clear that during the handling process, Scottish government's officials made contact with the police. The initial contact was in 5th of December via email. On the 6th of December 2017, there was an in-person meeting. And between the 30th of January 2018 and the 3rd of August 2018, there were um, another six meetings. The purpose was to seek advice on so the Scottish Government approach to the sexual harassment procedures and to the Scottish Government's obligation in response to allegations. Now, Police Scotland tell us this, and please bear with me because it is very important. Police Scotland provided advice at the meeting of the 6th on 2000, of December 2017, advising that where criminality was suspected and individuals, um, the individuals, that's complainants, should be directed to support and advocacy services to enable them, that's complainants, to make informed decisions about whether or not to report matters to the police. So it's very firmly in these individuals' hands. And then it says, um, this advice was reiterated on several occasions throughout an ongoing contact between 2017 and, 2000, and August 2018. A number of hypothetical questions were posed during email and telephone contact around the criminal justice process. Police Scotland advised without specifics, no appropriate response could be given and no assessment of risk could be made. And it was further emphasised that individuals should be directed to the relevant support services. As it appeared, the hypothetical questions were predicated on a set of circumstances and the Scottish Government responds to that cir circumstances rather than a generic procedure. It was highlighted that Scottish Government staff were not trained to undertake such investigations or to engage with victims. Despite this, First Minister, the Scottish Government officials continued with this investigation. Why? Um, look, I, I, and I know that you will find this answer 
unsatisfactory, and I understand that. I, I can't answer that question directly because I, I wasn't involved in the handling of the investigation. I've read uh, the, the letter from Police Scotland. I, I wasn't aware um, at the time of all of those contacts, contacts with the police, and I, I'm not aware of uh, the detail of them. You know, clearly there is aspects to all of this that the Scottish Government needs to, to consider, um, and you know, this committee, I hope, will be part of that process of consideration. I'm trying today, the convener, uh, I suspect, thinks I'm taking too long to do it sometimes. I'm trying to be as open with the committee as I can, but there are there is a limit to, to, to the degree to which I can comment on things that I just wasn't party to and at the time didn't have knowledge, because that is asking me to get inside other people's heads, um, which is not always a good idea, but, but to second guess decisions other people were taking at the time. And, and I will try to, to be as helpful in that as I can, but there are limits to my ability to do that. So is it your position, First Minister, that you knew nothing about this police advice and that Scottish Government officials had been told that the staff were not trained to undertake some, such investigations or to engage with victims? Did that, was that kept from you by these um, I, civil servants, so these remember, um, Scottish Government officials? And if so, who were they? Um, I'm mindful of the convener's uh, stricture earlier on, which uh, I've probably breached in a number of ways about naming civil servants. As it happens, you know, uh, we can provide as much information on that as, as you, you wish. Look, I, I was not aware at the time of these interactions with the police or, and the detail and the content of these interactions uh, with the police. Um, this is an investigation that uh, I had no role in. I wasn't involved in the handling of the, the investigation. Now, you know, you may well be raising issues that we have to, and this committee may also want to reflect on these issues. I'm not suggesting otherwise. I'm simply saying if you, your question was why did a civil servant, having been told X by the police, decide to do Y? And, and I cannot today sit here and answer that question because I, I don't know the thought processes and the, uh, the decision making that lay behind that. Can I ask you, knowing what I've just read out, was it, impro was it um, appropriate for s the Scottish Government officials to go ahead and carry out this investigation? I mean, th that is a matter the committee will want to uh, have its own say on. I think it was appropriate. In fact, I think to not have done this would have been inappropriate when complaints came forward that they were taken seriously and investigated. I now know, and we all now know, that in the course of that investigation, uh, those conducting it got things wrong. Um, and what we particularly know is the uh, appointment of the in investigating officer and contact that the investigating officer had had, and that was the, the focus of the, the concession of the judicial review. Um, so I, I'm not sitting here saying that there was nothing else that the civil service got wrong in the conduct of that investigation. Um, that's partly what this committee is here to, to say. But I cannot equally sit here definitively right now and say any particular action that any particular civil service civil servant took was inappropriate. Uh, the context of this was a government trying, in the light of Me Too, everything we've been through already, to properly investigate complaints that had come forward. We know it made a mistake, and this committee may decide it made, made more mistakes than that. Um, but I, I cannot sit here on things that I was not involved in at the time and second guess the reasons why every single action and decision was taken. First Minister, they ignored the fact they weren't trained and they shouldn't have been dealing with victims' complaints. That advice was absolutely crystal clear. They ignored that. You said they made mistakes. Well, they weren't trained to do it. And apparently you knew nothing about this. And more than that, the complainers' right to decide for themselves whether they would take this, um, their complaints forward. Having spoken to the people who were trained to speak to them, that support and advocacy service was taken completely out of their hands. Do you understand why you would not have had this dilemma should they report to the police, should, and despite them not wanting to? Because it was quite clear 
the Scottish government officials should never have been anywhere near this investigation. At that point, it should have ceased and the complainers um, uh, should be referred to support and advocacy and the choice would therefore be with them. Can I intervene here? Because I think um, for the benefit of clarity, there, there's two different things here. That, um, Kavira, could you let the, the First Minister no, then maybe no, give some no, clarity? I, no, I, I would like some clarity myself, thank you. Um, I, I think that what we're talking about here is two different things. I think the first thing was about the development of the policy. Yes. Uh, yes. The first thing was about the development of the policy and advice um, that was asked for and given. Uh, by the police about the development of the policy and then the implementation of that policy, which um, was about whether there should be independent trained people involved in that in such serious cases. And I think, Deputy Convener, you then got on to whether it was appropriate for the matter once investigated to be passed on to the police. I appreciate that, Convener. Yes. But you're just wrong. <laughs> it was 2000. Well, okay. Can was, I then? Can I tell uh, you why? Um, no, these no, approaches no. were made uh, in Convener, 2000. Deputy Convener, Deputy Convener, this is a crucially important Deputy point. Convener, and you're well, shutting it down. Um, no, I'm Convener. not shutting it down. I'm trying to get some clarity for myself. So if you right. let me finish, you can okay. come back and clarify. Absolutely. What I picked up beyond the development of the policy was that there was an issue about whether it was appropriate for the civil service, therefore, to have passed the complaints on to the police for a police investigation. Yeah. Right. Well, if that wasn't the case, and there was no confusion in your mind, Deputy Convener, about that, can I then supplement your question with that as well, while we're on the subject of the police? That's, I appreciate you trying to be helpful, but it confuses the, the issue. The issue was the investigation officer's role. And when they approached the police, these um, Scottish government officials, it was to look at how the procedure would be developed. And then they, they gave some hypothetical questions. And from that, the police began to suspect that this wasn't just a procedure, they had something in mind. And they were told quite clearly that they weren't trained and they shouldn't be talking to the complainants about that if criminality was suspected. And therefore, and therefore, they should have gone to advocacy services and the complainants should have had the ability to complain for themselves. Now, you appear to be totally unaware of that, First Minister. Um, Does that mean that the officials didn't report this to you? No, no, they didn't report this to me because they were conducting an investigation that I was not meant to be be party to. I, 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 I have to confess, and I take responsibility for this myself, I am a little bit confused about what exactly you are trying to get from me here, so I will do my best, and if I'm getting it wrong, I know you'll jump in and tell me. Um, there was advice taken by the police, as I understand it, both on the development of the policy and then they were going to the police, I think, taking advice that perhaps was more about the, the application of that policy. Was that always right and appropriate? Did they always follow uh, the, the right uh, advice there? That's what I cannot sit here and say categorically because and that's something that the, the committee is looking at. What I, I do know is that these complainants made complaints to the Scottish Government. So I, I do, I think I would uh, push back on the idea that the Scottish Government should not have tried in any way to investigate them. Uh, th there is perhaps a question about the appropriate moment uh, and was the right moment chosen to refer to the police and that is something that the committee may want to say something about. There is then the question of should that referral to the police have happened um, given that and as I said I think Alec Cole Hamilton I, I don't know how strong the views on this were uh, on the part of the complainants, but that they didn't want uh, that. Now, I do think on some occasions there are duties on public authorities to report um, suspected criminality, uh, even if others don't want them to do that. But on, on what, what the complainers wanted, what might have been a better way for the complainers, you know, I, I don't know if the committee has taken 
views I know it would have to be done privately but from complainers themselves because you know there was then a police inquiry where presumably people had to decide the extent to which they wanted to to, to make complaints to the police that would be investigated in, in that way. I, I can't speak for complainers and I, I do think, I, again, not a criticism of the committee, I think one of the, the genuine worries I have here is the, the extent to which this whole process has kind of sidelined and silenced the voices of complainers and I know that's not what anybody in this committee has wanted or uh, tried to do. So I, I keep saying it's not for me to tell you how to do your work and it's certainly not. Um, but if you want to know what the complainers thought, then perhaps trying to speak to them would be a better way than trying to get me to second guess their views and then what that should have meant for how the government did things. Let me just reiterate that the first approach to the police was before the process had been signed out. It was the handling. And um, that was in the beginning of December, uh, 5th and 6th December with various meetings thereafter. And it was made clear at that point that it wouldn't be appropriate for the investigation officer that carried out the investigation and, and for the people who spoke to the complainants to, to carry out that role, that at that point, beginning of December, if they knew about something, if they had concerns, they should have been a pro, uh, the complainers should have been referred to the appropriate people who were trained and, and could Properly, I'm sorry. properly give them the advice to decide if they wanted to go forward with the complaints. And while this whole process is about the complainers, they were denied that opportunity and that decision was taken out of their, their hands because of the Scottish Government's handling of the complaint. And that goes to the very essence, First Minister, of our remit. And it goes to what we have to look at to make sure that this never ever happens again because as things stand, there's absolutely no possibility, I think in everyone's mind, that anyone would want to come forward with a complaint as a, as a result of how this was handled. So, in many ways, I don't disagree with a lot of what you said there. And, you know, people can take this in whatever way they want. I hope the committee doesn't take it as a criticism because um, it's not intended in that way. But the fact that everything you've just said in your last few sentences there is true, it leads me to think it is quite extraordinary that the complainers or complainers' voices haven't been, not heard publicly, but heard um, more strongly in the process of this inquiry. That's a personal opinion, and I'm just going to stop it there. Um, I, I think the most important people in all of this are not me, uh, obviously in terms of parliamentary scrutiny, of course it is, not Alex Salmond, it is complainers who were let down by the mistakes that the government made. I'm happy to, if the committee reflecting on the official report of this thinks there's more I can provide here, I'm happy to supplement in writing. I think, and, and I'm, I don't have the police letter in front of me, which is why I, I, I'm, I'm acting on memory here. I think some of what you quoted to me there was police advice given effectively in the abstract about a policy and what to do in particular hypothetical situations. The issue then of when you had a real situation, did the civil servants follow that advice or not, is, is a separate issue. Um, and you know it's an issue the committee may well have, have views on. Uh, so I think I've probably gone as far as I am able to, both in my understanding of the questions and my understanding of what lies behind them. But I am, I'm happy if it would be helpful to the committee to try to follow up in more detail in writing. I think that would be very helpful and to know exactly who met with the police and to know who ignored this. And just to, to point out again, um, First Minister, the police formed the view that the hypothetical questions were predicated on a set of circumstances rather than a generic procedure. And it was made quite clear to them in these circumstances these people carrying out this development and speaking with the complainers and ignoring them wishes that they were not trained to do so and they should have been referred to advocacy services. I, I am not sitting here arguing against what you're quoting to me there. I'm simply saying that uh, I think this needs proper consideration of which this committee is part in terms of the, the advice in the abstract and the hypothetical and whether 
uh, that advice was properly applied when the hypothetical became uh, actual complaints. If the committee wants to put in writing some particular points of clarity or further information, I will do my best to answer that. That would be very much appreciated because it's absolutely essential to make oh, sure this never, God. ever happens and this kind of advice is never, ever ignored again by Scottish Government officials um, and I'm sure, First Minister, you wouldn't want to be party to, to that happening within a government that you lead. You will get nobody agreeing with you more strongly than me that I never want a situation like this to happen again. And I would like to think complaints like this wouldn't have to come forward again, but that we don't make mistakes here. But equally, I don't want to have a situation where, uh, because of the experience of this, there is a reluctance on the part of government to properly investigate complaints or a reluctance on the part of complainers to come forward. And that's going to be a difficult thing to make sure we get uh, right overall. And I, I remain hopeful uh, that this committee will be part of the process. But I do think complainers' voices themselves uh, matter in all of this as well. You just seem to have missed a crucial point. It's not for the uh, government Ms. Mitchell to Ms Mitchell will spend half an hour on one complaint. question. To so take I... them on board and then refer them to the the piece who are the people who are qualified and trained to deal with the complainers. Can you have the last very short place. word on this, please, First Minister, and then we really I'm not must sure. move on. So I think you can raise a question about whether the complaint should have been referred to the police earlier in the process. Um, I'm not sure about just handing them over for advocacy and effectively not doing the complaint. I, I don't know whether I think that would have been right in this situation, but I'm not, I'm not sure I'm helping the situation here. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm helping bring clarity to this situation. Where I, I absolutely agree is that the centrality of complainers' uh, wishes and voices can't be ignored, and the determination to learn from the mistakes that were made here is absolute on my part and uh, the Scottish Government's part. But, you know... There is always a, a different path you can take on everything. And I suspect on this, had we taken the different path on all sorts of aspects of this, it might not have resulted in us not sitting here. We'd just be sitting here and the questions would be coming from a different perspective. I think any consumers would welcome knowing that if they did come forward, they would be dealt with properly and referred to the proper services in the future. I, that would give them, I think, please, some now, comfort. Can I just intervene here? Um, can I say, Ms Mitchell, that I asked the First Minister to have the last word on that. We've been half an hour on one question. And I think, I think we really must move on now. So, before Mr Whiteman winds up for us in this particular section, I have very quick supplementaries. And please make them very quick. Maureen Watt and Stuart McMillan. Maureen Watt. Thank you, convener. I mean, First Minister, a lot of this has been covered in earlier evidence sessions with uh, senior civil servants. But the ACAS guidance on sexual harassment states that if complainers do not want to tell the police, you should still encourage them to do so. You might still need to report it, but should always tell the person affected if you're going to do this. Now, um, I have, in my earlier uh, questioning of civil servants, been quite um, keen to find out the um, appropriateness and the qualifications of many of those involved in HR procedures. Um, and it took a long time to tease out those who were qualified and those who weren't. But I think in this situation, the Scottish government seemed to be have been um, acting within clear employment guidance in reporting this matter to um, the police. So uh, I'm not asking you to tell us now, but do you think this is a paragraph uh, in the procedure? And um, I think in our reporting, uh, in our report, I would like to make a point about asking whether enough qualified HR specialists uh, are involved in uh, Scottish Government. I think that's a fair question. I, I can't answer it today um, in terms of how many civil servants in the Scottish Government are HR qualified and uh, versus how many should be, but I think it is a perfectly fair and legitimate question. Uh, the ACAS guidance, I think, uh, that you've quoted there was what I was searching for uh, a wee while ago, and it is there and clear. I think the, the procedure itself uh, talked about the, the possibility of complaints being referred to the police. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the view that 
because the complainers said it was a preference that that shouldn't happen, that it shouldn't have happened equally, um, I, I take the view that there is, as the ACAS guidance sets out, a wider interest that has to be considered. Okay, kindly, uh, Mr McMillan has said that his question was already uh, answered. So, Andy Whiteman, please. Thanks, convener. Um, I'm just um, loath to continue the previous conversation, but the, the letter from the, the evidence from Police Scotland, which I have in front of me, is to the effect that they provided advice at the meeting on the 6th December, advising that where criminality was suspected, individuals should be directed, and then going on to say that Scottish Government staff were not trained to undertake such investigations. Uh, on my reading, that's the police saying that Scottish Government staff are not trained to undertake investigations into potential criminality, and I think you would probably agree that that is not their job. Um, and a, a reasonable explanation might be that Scottish Government staff did not believe at the outset of the complaints that there was, in fact, potential criminality that only arose uh, later. So I think it's important for the record to set out what the police's concerns were correctly. Um, so just to conclude on the handling of complaints, I think I'm the last word on the handling of complaints uh, stream. Um, in your written evidence to the committee at page eight, you said in relationship to the meeting on the 2nd of April, uh, I quote, I made clear to him, that's Alex Salmond, that I had no role in the process and would not seek to intervene uh, in it. Mr. Salmond, in his evidence um, from last week, um, said, and I quote, there's no doubt the people at the meeting, Mr. Aberdeen and Mr. Hamilton were there, certainly Mr. Hamilton was there when Nicola said that, and she said it to me in a private meeting as well, that she was anxious to assist. It's from the official record on Friday. In a written evidence submitted yesterday, Duncan Hamilton QC states that his recollection was that, and I quote, we discussed mediation. My clear recollection is that her words were, if it comes to it, I will intervene. So your own written evidence says that you made clear to Mr. Samad you had no role and would not seek to intervene. Mr. Uh, Hamilton's recollection is that your words were, if it comes to, I will intervene. Can you explain that contradiction? Um, I certainly will uh, attempt to. I believe I did make it clear that I would not intervene. Um, I also know, and I'll maybe expand on this in a minute, that uh, I was perhaps uh, trying to, how, how would I best put this, let a long-standing friend and colleague down gently, and maybe I did it too gently, and he left with an impression that I did not intend to give him. I, I think I was clear, and certainly intended to be clear. If you look at the the statements that are being made, um, and I, you know, I don't recall the particular words, but I'm not, I'm not quibbling with the, the sentiments behind them necessarily, because I can't, uh, I can't recall enough to do that. But you know, the things that you know, if it comes to, I'll intervene. If it comes to what, um, I saw, I think, in a, a written submission from Mr. Salmond, him saying something like, "I'll intervene if at an appropriate time." He said on Friday that I said things like, you know, the permanent secretary has to come to me first. You know, in the procedure, the permanent secretary it only tells me at the end. So all of that says to me that I was possibly couching, I'm not intervening in terms that were, given the relationship between us, not as blunt as they maybe should be. I had no intention of intervening. And crucially, I did not intervene in the process. And that is is the case. You know, during this discussion on the 2nd of April, um, to be blunt about it, my head was spinning. I was experiencing a, a maelstrom of emotions. I'd been told something pretty shocking by Alex Salmond. And there were probably, not probably, there were a number of things in my head. A, a very strong instinctive view that I couldn't and shouldn't intervene. The kind of dealing with a friend and perhaps that leads to some of what I was saying. And also, yeah, there were things going through my head. Is there, you know, I was thinking about, which we'll come on to later on, the kind of ministerial code, the, you know, is it, should I be reporting any aspect of, of this? So that's the kind of, these discussions, and everybody knows this, these discussions don't take place in a kind of antiseptic, sterile, devoid of human emotion environments. But I did not, inter I 
did not intend to intervene and I, I did not intervene. And while I know it's more complex than this, I think in terms of his anger towards me, um, I think that is the root of it with Mr. Salmond. Okay, thanks. My final question uh, relates to the, uh, all of this becoming very public on August the 23rd. In the review of the criminal investigation teams uh, uh, looking at the, the, the leak the, in the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, in that review uh, report uh, uh, at 4.2, it, it says that the leak came a few hours after the Scottish Government had notified their intention to publish a press release, and very shortly after Levy and McRae had given notice of their intention to apply for an interim interdict. The effect of the leak was to defeat the court action because the information was by then in the public domain. And the Information Commissioner Review Team also go on to say at 4.3, I've also considered the statement of Detective Chief Superintendent redacted, helpfully provided by Levy and McRae. Now we're aiming to get a copy of this statement. I'm not sure if we'll be successful or not, but nevertheless. The statement confirms that a meeting on the 21st of August 2018, which we talked about yesterday with the Crown Agent, uh, the Chief Constable, the Detective Chief Superintendent and the Crown Agent were present. The police were offered a copy of the internal misconduct investigation report but refused to take it. Furthermore, at that meeting, Detective Chief Superintendent voiced concerns about the Scottish Government making a public statement about the outcome of their investigations. Were you aware of the concerns that had been voiced by the Detective Chief Superintendent at that meeting? Uh, not at the time, no. Um, as I think I said earlier on, I was told by the Permanent Secretary, by the time I was told by the Permanent Secretary about referral to the police, the referral had already happened. Um, and I didn't know at that time what the police's reaction to it was or what the police had said or, or what they were doing. So you were never told even after that event? Um, what the con just a minute, you were never told after the event what the concerns had been that the Detective Chief Superintendent had raised about making a public statement? So. By after the event, do you mean in the days around that? No, I mean up till now. Well, I've, I've do you heard... have any knowledge? Do you have any knowledge of what those concerns were? Uh, I, I've, I know what is now being said. I've read what you have said. I don't think, from the best of my recollection, I don't think I was aware of that at the time, and I've not had detailed discussions about what the views of of the police were in that respect. Okay, well, we don't know what the concerns were at this meeting. We don't, so know, I, what, we I, don't know the I, concerns. In detail, I don't know either. Okay, that's my only mm -hmm. question, yeah. really. We don't know the concerns that were expressed at that meeting. We're going to try and find out, but you don't know what those concerns were either. Is that, that's the case? Um, I, I, no, I, I, I think I've assumed, I'm trying to kind of make sure here I'm being, you know, I kind of assume that they didn't want public uh, release because it may... In, uh, get in the way of a, an investigation or whatever. That's just a presumption, though. You don't, you I don't know. I think that's just a presumption. I'm, I'm not... I don't think I can be 100% sure that that's never been said to me, but I don't think that has been said to me. I think my... Uh, what I've just said there is in the realms of presumption rather than actual knowledge. OK, so you don't know and we don't know what those concerns... The, the, we don't know and you don't know what the concerns of the Detective Chief Superintendent voiced at that meeting were. At this moment, we don't know. Um, I, I don't think I... No, no beyond know presumption. Okay. We'll try and find out. Thank you, Convener. So nobody in this room knows anything about that. Then. <laughs> we'll now move on to the uh, judicial review section. And uh, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Convener. If, if you'll indulge me, I have a number of, of, of questions in, in, this, in this area. Um, can I start, First Minister, and ask you, um, what was your role in relation to the judicial review, to what extent was there ministerial oversight of decisions that were being taken? Um, so my formal role, I was named as an interested party in the petition. Uh, it was a petition against Scottish ministers, of which I um, am one, although it's, as you know, it's a, a collective de designation. So I was, uh, I was involved in discussions about prospects of success uh, and the changing uh, sort of fortunes of the changing uh, perceptions of those prospects of success as we went through. Um, my involvement was greater at particular junctures. Uh, it wasn't something I was being briefed about or talking about every single day. It wasn't something. Um, so just, you know, I remember having discussions with uh, SGLD, the Scottish Government Legal Department, around the time the petition was being, uh, was going through the process of ultimately being served in the Scottish Government. Uh, initial views on prospects of success. I uh, knew that there were 
uh, discussions in, I think, uh, early September into mid-September about preliminary issues that I was kind of aware of the, the views that were being taken. By preliminary issues, I mean, um, were we going to oppose permission to proceed? Uh, things like time bar, were there any parts of this that we consider time barred? Um, there was a preliminary issue about you know, the designation, whether it should have been against the permanent secretary or just Scottish ministers, and the issue which I know the committee heard about from Mr Salmond about whether there was uh, a case for assisting at that stage because of the criminal procedure or whether reporting restrictions. So I was aware of all of that in the early days. I then saw the note, uh, which you have now seen, of prospects, which I think was late September, um, and saw uh, initial uh, pleadings, uh, no, the initial government answers to to the pleading. So, so it was that kind of. I was, I've been as a minister. I've had not lots. I, I hasten to add, but there's been some big, high-profile judicial reviews against the Scottish government. That in my min so minimum pricing, for example, being one of them, it was not an unusual degree of uh, of involvement or oversight. I mean, obviously, given who was taking the Scottish government to court, made it slightly unusual. Um, and then the, I suppose the next period where I would have been uh, particularly aware of the detail of what was going on was around that end of October point. And then clearly, I'm not saying there was nothing in between there, clearly the next key point would have been into December and ultimately the period where we decided to concede. Okay, thank you. Well, that's, that's helpful. I'll maybe want to explore some of the detail with you, if I can. But it sounds like you were you know, quite well briefed all the way through the process. Uh, and can I, I ask you, up for a fall here. Um, can I ask you, um, your chief of staff was also involved, I understand, and attended a number of meetings, presumably to, to represent you and to feed back information to you. I think she, uh, and again, if I'm getting the detail of this wrong, I uh, will stand corrected. I think she attended three meetings with council, um, would have seen the stuff that was coming across my desk. That, again, is not unusual. Um, I mean, you, you'll understand this, Mr Fraser, I'm a, I'm a lawyer by background. There is a natural kind of interest in some of this stuff that goes beyond the sort of ministerial interest. It's, it can be a bit weird, but that's it. So she was involved to the extent that she will be involved in a lot of things to make sure she's hearing anything that, need, that I need to be aware of and, and representing my interests. I was named on the petition, so that's not unusual. But she didn't have, you know, a, a, an involvement that was any way unusual um, for a chief of staff. Thank you. Um I'd like to take, take you through some of the legal advice that we obtained. Now, I think it's fair to say you'll, you'll recognise the committee's frustration. We've been trying to get hold of the legal advice for, for months. There have been two votes in Parliament. The, the government has not uh, acceded to, and it's only with a threat of a, a vote of no confidence in the Deputy First Minister. But finally, do we see some aspects of the legal advice? We don't know for sure if what we've seen so far is the entirety of the legal advice, but it's all we have to go on uh, for now. Um, and perhaps you can tell us if there are, there are parts that are, are missing uh, from what we've seen. Um, you, you, you referred earlier in um, questions, uh, in response to questions that were asked by Margaret Mitchell and by Alistair Allen about the uh, note on prospects that was prepared by uh, external counsel on the 27th of September. Um, and you said, if I heard you rightly, you said, uh, that um, uh, council were confident, and that was the term you used, I think, council were confident about the case the Scottish Government had. I've, I'm just having a look at the joint note by senior and junior council by Roddy Dunlop, QC, and Christine O'Neill, uh, and they say this at paragraph six. We think there is a real risk that the court may be persuaded by the petitioner's case in respect of the ground of challenge based on procedural unfairness, and they go on to say, we consider the defence to be perfectly statable. However, it would be wrong to pretend we do not see vulnerability in this regard. Um, I wouldn't categorise that as confident. I, th I would categorise that as a, as a nervous uh, judgement on the prospects. So I, I wouldn't, um, in, in any kind of proper legal sense, and other, other people may take a different view of this, I... Um, I don't think, and I've not gone back and checked all of this, so it may not be 100% accurate, but I don't think in all of the, the legal action, judicial review action, that I have had ministerial involvement in oversight of um, during my years in government, I don't think I've ever seen 
um, an opinion that says 100% this is a cast iron case, there is no risk of of losing this. You, the, you, you get the, the risks ranked in order. And actually, this would be, this note of prospects would be at the more optimistic end of some that I've seen. It, it, it highlights what they consider to be the greatest vulnerability. It turned out not to be the greatest vulnerability, uh, but says we should stress that we do see an answer to this point. Um, and that is actually the kind of thing in a legal opinion that does give you confidence if, you've ha if you're having uh, a potential vulnerability pointed out. In fact, maybe the, I mentioned it a moment ago, um, and I've not gone back and looked at all of the opinion and all the legal advice on minimum pricing, so I'm, I am speaking from recollection here. But in the early days of minimum pricing, and it's a, a subject I cared deeply about, was very associated with, losing it in court would have been, you know, posed great questions for me, um, as well as being really regrettable from a public health policy perspective. But in the early days of minimum pricing, um, I think if you were to apply anything like the test you're applying to this note of prospects, we would never have done it. Because particularly in those early days, the, the, the view on our prospects of success were actually not that confident. But we took a view that this was an important public health policy. We thought we could argue it, and therefore it was worth doing because of the importance of it. Um, and that's just the nature of, of this. And so in the context of all the legal opinions I've seen in different court cases, that actually is probably at the more optimistic end of the spectrum. OK, I'm, I'm not going to argue the toss with you on that, because um, it, to be fair, the council's opinion says there's a statable case. So I think it, is, it was reasonable for the Scottish Government to defend what, what was a statable case. Let, let's jump to the 31st of October, because we have nothing in between that and the 31st of October. Now, on the 31st of October, there's an urgent note by senior counsel, uh, Roddy Dunlop, uh, and this, this has emerged because um, what's happened is it's been disclosed at that point that Judith McKinnon was the investigating officer and there had been this issue of prior involvement identified at that point. And if you read uh, paragraphs uh, 9 and 10 of that opinion, uh, senior counsel is clear this presents a very real problem indeed, he says, and he goes on to say in paragraph 10, uh, it would be wrong for me to suggest that this revelation is anything other than an extremely concerning one. He goes on to say, uh, paragraph 13, um, he, has had be, he is so concerned by this, he is sufficiently concerned by this, he's had to contact uh, the Lord Advocate to express his concern as to the potential repercussions for the wider case. And then at paragraph 14, there is discussion then of the uh, uh, choice that needs to be made as to whether the case can continue or indeed whether the petition should be conceded at that particular point. So is it fair to say at the 31st of October that the case is in real trouble? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think I would use that uh, phrase. Other people might use that phrase. Again, this turned out to be more unusual and much more problematic than we realised at this stage. Uh, but again, having, in my experience, and I can only speak from my experience, it is not unheard of during a, a process of litigation uh, to have lawyers say there's issues cropped up that cause them real concern. That is, that is not unheard of and, and unusual. This note it says all the things you say, but it is clearly also considering uh, the options and identifying further work that, that has to be done. Um, after that uh, opinion, was submitted by Roddy Dunlop. There was a, a consultation with council, I think two days later. Um, I wasn't personally at that. And as a result of those discussions, and at that point, the discussion was round the interpretation of Article uh, Section 10 of the procedure and the differing interpretations that we thought that was open to. And the conclusion out of that was that it was a point, not that it wasn't a point we should be concerned about and not that it wasn't uh, a point of vulnerability and certainly not that it wasn't a point that weakened our prospects of success but that it was a point that was arguable and defensible and that the government thought that uh, argument could be made and therefore the decision was taken uh, to to continue and actually right up until I think the 11th of December and I think you've got this as well views of the law officers was that across the petition, um, including on the issue of the appointment of the uh, investigating officer, there was a 
a stateable case and uh, arguments that, that could be made. So I, I know we're seeing this in the context of a, a judicial review that's very high profile, very sensitive, that obviously has turned out to be incredibly so. But in terms of the process of litigation, this kind of thing in general is not, in my experience, hugely uh, unusual that problems are identified and assessments are made of whether they are fatal problems or problems that can be overcome. And there was, and you heard this from the Lord Advocate, right up until the point where it became unstatable, there were wider issues that we were weighing up. I mean, firstly, you have to be certain that you've got a statable case um, and, you know, the degree of confidence that was there that that the argument could be put. But there was a wider interest, and I think it was a legitimate interest. There were eight grounds of challenge that had been made to, to the procedure and to its application. And therefore, the government, this, the government wanted, if possible, to hear from a court whether it thought those challenges were well-founded or not, so that we could have confidence, uh, hopefully, that whatever, you know, might have happened in the Alex Salmond case or whatever turned out to have happened there, we had a procedure that was lawfully based and, and sound. So that was the wider legitimate interest the government had in all of this. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, I mean, it is a pity. We did have the Lord Advocate in front of the committee yesterday. And it's a pity we could not put these questions to him because we did not have sight of the legal advice until uh, six o'clock last night. Um, we then have a, a, a lacuna in the information provided to us because it jumps from the 31st of October to the 6th of December. Now, there must have been more consultations, notes and meetings held during that period. Are these going to be made available to us? Um, I am happy to, to look at what more is able to be made available or what more is there to be, to be made available. But my, my understanding and, and recollection of that period from the uh, end of October through to the beginning of December is it was a process of adjustment of pleadings going on in both directions. I think, I, I, don't have the exact date in front of me. I think at some point over that period, uh, Alex Salmon's lawyers introduced a new ground of challenge based on this, and that then uh, triggered uh, a review based on that that led to the early December note. So to say it's a lacuna, I mean, I, you know, I, I wasn't a litigation lawyer, so I don't uh, know this from the perspective of, of a lawyer, but these periods in litigation where there's adjustment of police uh, pleadings, Andy Whiteman probably knows more about this than, than I do, um, is not, again, it's part of the litigation process. Okay, um, we, we know you attended a meeting on the mm. 13th of November with Council. Can you tell us who was at that meeting and what was discussed? Uh, I was clearly at it. Uh, senior and junior Council were at it, uh, from memory of the Permanent Secretary, was at it, Liz Lloyd, my Chief of Staff was at it, I think SGLD was, was represented. That was part of, I, I requested that meeting and, and actually that was kind of part of what I think was a proper thing I was doing was kind of testing myself whether as a result of what had come to light and as a result of the 31st of October position we actually did still have a statable case and and that's why I requested that meeting and I came out of that meeting satisfied that we had a statable case that we thought not just in some theoretical abstract way but based on on, on actual consideration of what the government in, had intended around Section 10, that we could argue the interpretation that we thought should be attached to it. Of course, what happened uh, later in December was things emerged, not, not about the interpretation of uh, Section 10 per se, but about the extent of the actual contact between the IO and the complainers that changed that judgment and also to be fair gave rise to suggestions that the the government had not been as open about this as it should have been which was not intentional but gave that impression okay so a decision was was, was a decision taken at, at that meeting to proceed with the case and were you party um, to that decision i don't i don't think so i don't think that was a decision meeting that there, there had never been any question there had never been a point at which the decision had been taken not to proceed or mm. we got to that point. This was part of a process of me saying, and, and this maybe is given the, the high profile of this, would I normally meet with counsel in a judicial review? Probably not. Um, and it was just basically me getting an assurance that for all, because this note, the 31st of October note, which actually when you read it is not as it has been presented by some uh, in this, but you know, it, it kind of raises concerns. So I, I just wanted to make sure we weren't uh, in some way prolonging a judicial review that was 
was dead in the water. And I was satisfied out of that meeting that that wasn't the case, that we had a statable case and were confident that we could continue to put those arguments. Okay, um, just to quote you again from paragraph 14 of Roddy Dunlop's um, opinion of the 31st of October, uh, Halloween as it turned out, um, he says this, depending on the information available on Friday, a swift decision is going to have to be taken whether the issue is disclosed and any argument based thereon uh, then resisted, or B, the issue is disclosed and the petition then conceded as a result thereof. So who took that decision? Um, I think the consensus that emerged, I wasn't at that meeting, I think one of the law officers, uh, uh, we're not meant to usually say this, obviously, but we're, we're in a different position with legal advice. I, th I think uh, the Solicitor General was present at that meeting and the consensus out of that meeting was that there was a, a, a con a case that continued to be statable and that there was a perfectly credible and arguable interpretation that could be on uh, Section 10. Thank you. Um, we jump to the 6th of December, which is the next uh, date for which we have documentation for. On the 6th of December, again, the, the situation deteriorated uh, to an even more dramatic extent. And the joint note by senior and junior counsel says this uh, in uh, paragraph 4. Um, we are now jointly of the view that these grounds of challenge are more likely than not to uh, succeed. And they go on to say, uh, and I think this is at their conclusion, um, uh, th paragraph 31, um, or paragraph 30, the, the option is to concede the petition. The other option is simply to press on regardless. That is in many ways even less attractive. The expenses will be far higher and the trumpeting far louder uh, if the case proceeds to a written judgment. And there's a real prospect uh, of damaging criticism from Lord Pentland. Uh, and they conclude, our own view is that the least worst option would be to concede the petition. So why didn't the Scottish Government at that point take Council's advice and agree to concede? Well, I'll come on to the point about Council's. I will not comment on the trumpeting uh, comment. I'll leave others to draw their own uh, conclusions on that. Um, all I would say, and people can decide whether it's in relation to that or not, is the more likely than not um, terminology that has been used publicly around this has always been attributed to the 31st of October. It's actually, you know, into to the 6th of December. On the, so in terms of law officers, you know, on the 11th of December, so again, I wasn't at this, but there was uh, a meeting involving uh, law officers and uh, the view of law officers, so in the days immediately following that. And remember, external counsel's views are important. We instruct them and we pay them. But in terms of the ministerial code, my duty is to make sure I'm abiding by what the law officers say. So what the law officers on the 11th of December, uh, the ex opinion they were expressing is that there is no question or need to drop the case. The Lord Advocate was clear that even if prospects are not certain, it is important that the case has heard. Senior counsel made clear that his note was not intended to convey that he didn't think we had a statable case. They tested most of the arguments, including the appointment of the IO, and concluded that we have credible arguments to make across the petition. So that was the, the view expressed by the law officers in the days after that opinion. So the, the, the charge that has been made against me is, is that I willfully allowed a judicial review to proceed against the legal advice and therefore I broke the ministerial code. With respect, as you now know, uh, I was acting in accordance with the views of the law officers, not acting against the views of the law officers. And, you know, they come to these views taking account of external counsel's opinion and, and the wider, wider interests. So, you know, the other uh, comment you've seen, I think, from that discussion is uh, the Lord Advocate being clear that we should not concede with a stress on the benefit that would accrue from a judicial finding, A, that it was right to have a procedure in such circumstances, and B, it was right to have this procedure. Um, so that speaks to that broader public interest that I was talking about. We thought we had a statable case, and it's clear that Council was not arguing at that stage. That changed later. But at that stage, Council were not arguing we didn't have a statable case. We thought we had credible arguments to make, and we were also taking account of that wider interest in getting a determination on the many grounds of challenge that Alex Salmond had made to both the procedure and to its application. I think, I think the reason I, I raise these issues and, and the reason they're relevant to this inquiry is that we were de dealing here with public funds. Now, when the 
the concession eventually came. We'll come on to that in a moment. Um, the award of expenses was done on the <laughs> highest level available to the court. Uh, and th those expenses are only awarded, in the words of Lord Hodge, where the defence has been conducted either unreasonably or incompetently. So that's a, that's a really serious charge to lay against the Scottish Government and the law officers in terms of their conduct of this particular case. The point uh, I would put to you is it was very clear by the 6th of December, if not before, that the risks of proceeding with this action were very high and therefore you were risking public funds in continuing with the action. So I think every time a government defends a legal action, it is risking public funds because there is never a guarantee you're going to be successful. I, I don't want to keep go back to this point, but on minimum pricing, you know, if I had taken the risk averse approach on minimum pricing, we'd have thrown in the towel on that before we got started. So, you know, there are sometimes good reasons why you have to defend in order to establish a uh, wider points. Uh, you can't do that if your case is unstatable, but if you think you've got a statable, arguable case and indeed credible arguments up to the 11th of, or as late as the 11th of December, then I think uh, that is, is the case. Um, in terms of the, and I'll come back on to the issue of expenses in a second, but in terms of that, uh, you know, taxpayers' money, and I, I feel very, very, very sorry for, for that. Um, and I expressly said that earlier on. Um, but we had a procedure here that was not just being challenged in terms of its application to Alex Salmond. It was a procedure that was being challenged in its fundamentals. And in terms of that wider public interest, including, you know, should we have complaints again that required this procedure to be activated, were we on solid ground using it? And that, so in the wider taxpayer public interest, that is not insignificant, I would argue. I'm not an expert um, and I'm not going to pretend to be today on the reasons for the award of expenses at certain levels. Um, my understanding is that, you know, much of what went really wrong in the case, catastrophically wrong, which then probably does lead to your characterisation there, was in that later stage of December when it became clear, I believe not intentionally, that there was information and material that hadn't hitherto been uh, disclosed and that changed wasn't just uh, very very bad in terms of the, the duty of candor that is on uh, litigants but it was also the factor that changed that judgment about whether there was a statable case or not okay um, thank you for that I mean I, I, I do understand the argument that says it was it was reasonable to use public funds uh, to try and push this even though even though the prospects were receding but of course the Scottish government did not in the end subject this to the judgment of the court because the court reached no view on 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 the basis of the, the policy it was a concession mm -hmm. on one ground so the court never actually got a point to determine uh, the issues that mr salmon had raised um, so you, you you highlight what happened later in december on the 19th of december we have this astonishing note from senior and junior counsel uh, and i have to say i've never seen anything quite like it uh, in terms of what it says about the conduct uh, of the case. Uh, the uh, council refers to the uh, regrettable way in which the document disclosure was unfolded, the extreme uh, professional embarrassment uh, that they have faced uh, in court. They say that the, the havers uh, who are cited for the, the, the commission hearing will expect a torrid time in the witness box. Uh, they say the late nature of the revelations uh, are unexplained and inexplicable. Um, there are acute difficulties to them in the way that they have on instructions pled uh, the case. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is catastrophic, is it not? That was catastrophic, and that's what led to the ultimate concession. So you're, you're right that we didn't get to the point we wanted to get to where we got a judicial determination of all the grounds for challenge. The point I'm making is that up until around that point, we thought that was a statable, credible, arguable position to be in. That completely change that um, and for the reasons that you've set out there that fundamentally changed uh, the, the position in, in the court case and had I at that point said no we're, we're steaming ahead anyway that is where I would potentially uh, be sitting here with some justification probably a lot of justification for the charges that are being made of me but I, I don't think that is the case because up until 
I've read out the position as late as the 11th of December. It was the opinion of law officers that we had a statable case with credible arguments. And for that reason, as well as the wider public interest, we should continue. That that you've described there was dreadful, catastrophic. That is uh, the heart of what went wrong in the ju judicial review. And of course, it then reflects what went wrong in the application of the procedure. And I'll defend our decision making throughout this judicial review, including up to that, where it was right that the decision then followed that we would concede the case. Um, I will not defend what led to that note because I actually share your views of it. So who is to blame for that? Well, look, ultimately, you know, I'm responsible, I'm the head of the Scottish Government and you know, I am not going to sit here and start to sh chuck blame about in other directions. Um, I was not involved in the investigation. I was not aware of the error at the time. Um, but I'm the head of the Scottish Government, which is why I've apologised for it uh, today. Um, I think I apologised for it on the day it, the, the case was conceded in Parliament. Um, and part of what we are doing in all of this, this committee being part of that, but the, the Laura Dunlop review that I've already spoken about, is trying to learn those lessons ourselves. I'm just, you've been very patient, Convener. I've got one more question because I know others will want to come in. Um, the, the former First Minister, in his evidence, claims that the Scottish Government only conceded the case when senior and junior counsel threatened to resign. Is, is that true? Uh, that's not my understanding of, of the position. So this note came, there was, I, I remember speaking, I think I was in London uh, on that day or the day after it might have been, but I think it was on the day that things were going very badly wrong. I, I was in London speaking to your former boss at the time, Mrs May, um, and speaking to the Lord Advocate on my way back up the road when it was clear how much trouble at that stage the, the case was in. And, and I think I saw him in person the following day uh, in this building. Um, and that, you know, there was then a process over the next period when we reviewed. I mean, a, a government even thinking we're in a catastrophe, you have to go through a proper process of review. The Permanent Secretary commissioned the, the note, uh, note is a bit of a flippant word for it, the, the piece of advice from Sarah Davidson, which the committee has seen um, before now. And that then led over that, uh, it wasn't the happiest Christmas and New Year period uh, I've ever spent, I should say, um, to the, the, the concession of the judicial review. And, you know, do I think that is all deeply and horrendously regrettable? Yes, but, but what is regrettable is the, the error that then progressively came to light that got us to that point. I actually think the handling of the judicial review uh, was legally sound. You can argue, people can take different views about whether all the decisions that were taken were uh, the ones they would have taken, but the decisions taken in the conduct of the judicial review, in, in my view, were legally sound decisions. And they were taken uh, in line with the views of the law officers, which as far as I'm concerned, in terms of my responsibilities under the ministerial code, is the test I need to pass. Uh, you have very skillfully avoided answering my question, which is, did the junior and senior counsel threaten uh, no, to I, resign? I, sorry, I think I did. I, I'm not aware of them threatening to resign, but what, what I, I know is, and I know this partly as, uh, as a former lawyer that didn't have that kind of experience or anything like it, but a lawyer will not carry on with a statable case. Uh, sorry, with an unstatable case. Uh, that was a potentially uh, catastrophic <laughs> slip of the tongue. Um, a lawyer will not argue an unstatable case. So the, the position of counsel at that point would have been, if we had said we're going to carry on with an unstatable case, I'm absolutely sure they would have withdrawn from acting and they probably, uh, I'm pretty certain they would have made that clear. But, but the way that is put forward is, suggest that we were going, no, 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 we are going to carry on. And they had to force us into that position by saying that, that they were going to resign. The government, the government was not going to ignore what was in this 19th of December note. There was a process of consideration and review that had to be done there. And that culminated in, in what you know uh, off the back of the Sarah Davidson advice that came over the Christmas and New Year holiday. Okay. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. Now, I have a supplementary um, to what Mr Fraser was saying from Alex Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> convener. Um, I'd just like to come in on the advice received from senior counsel at Halloween on 31st of December. First Minister, you've um, compared 
uh, another judicial review which had uh, shaky grounds uh, in the form of the minimum unit pricing. And the difference between these two uh, judicial reviews is that one is about public health and alcohol policy, and the other, at its heart, has two vulnerable human beings. Um, I'm struck that in one, when he laid out the options, senior counsel said that with an advantage of concession was that, uh, and he makes the interesting suggestion, that the procedure could be reset, safeguards put in place, and allow a renewed investigation of the complaints. So can I ask, um, at that crossroads, was the views of the complainers sought to inform your decision to proceed? Uh, I, I don't think so, to be frank, but I would want to double check whether that was done in any way. It certainly wasn't something I did personally or, or and, and, you know, I, is there an argument that should have been done? I guess that argument can be made. Can I, can I say, in, in, in using the, the comparison with the minimum unit price, and I'm not trying to underplay the seriousness of the issues here, and one of the things that I think is quite hard with this is when you're talking about litigation and legal, you know, and statable cases, you kind of strip the, the actual human impact out of things. And I'm not, I'm not intending to do that. I'm just, I'm trying to describe... I'm not trying to describe to the committee the process of litigation. The committee knows that, but I'm trying to describe the, the, the factors and the tests that ministers have to apply and consider when we are taking decisions on the conduct. And so there are comparisons, even though the circumstances are completely different. Um, so I, I don't think the complainers would have been asked their view at that stage, but I will check and I can come back on that uh, more, more definitely. But certainly... And I, again, I don't want to overstate this as being a big part of, of the decision making, but I think in my mind, it would definitely have been the case that whatever you did would have an impact on complainers. So, you know, defending this, remember at a time when we thought we could cr argue this with credible arguments, that it might have been better for complainers for us to prevail that we had done this properly rather than put them through that whole process again. Um, so these are judgments. They're, they're not black and white. The reason I ask is that the failure of the judicial review is one of the reasons that to this date, those two complaints have never been fairly or properly adjudicated. Um, and, and you say, yes, every decision you took in that process would have affected the complainers. Did you consult them at any point? I've not spoken directly to or, or, sorry, your the complainers. Um, I think you have heard evidence about points at which the complainers were consulted uh, and spoken to, including by the Permanent Secretary, which, of course, is one of the points of contention or in the judicial In the review. context of the judicial review um, and the decisions you took. I, I, I would want to check that. I am not sure of the answer to that. Okay. Uh, my apologies. Thank you, Convener. OK, thank you. We're almost at half past one, so I think uh, this is an appropriate place to, to break in line with the agreed mitigations which are allowing us to meet safely in person today. So I'll suspend this session again and I think we should reconvene at two o'clock. Remind members and everyone else to observe social distancing when leaving the committee room and during the break. And I now suspend this session.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the 15th meeting of this committee in 2021. This is an evidence session with the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, MSP. And I can confirm that Ms Sturgeon took the affirmation at the start of this morning's evidence session. Uh, when we broke up, we were um, talking about the judicial review. We'll carry on with that, and I'll now go to Dr Alistair Allen. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, we spent some time before the break talking about external legal advice. So can I ask you, First Minister, um, what role does external counsel play in determining the government's position, uh, legal position usually? And did this case in any way depart from that? Um, I think it's quite hard for me, maybe that's just a, a kind of deficiency in my own communication skills to kind of almost scientifically answer the first part of your question. You know, external counsel in, you know, a, a serious piece of litigation play a big role. They conduct the litigation, they, you know, draft the pleadings, they give advice, as you've, you've now seen. And their advice, I suppose I would say, is very, very important. And it's, it carries a lot of weight. And then it is, I suppose, weighed uh, with other factors. The, the sort of, in some judicial reviews, the, the, the small p political public interest issues and of course for ministers uh, on matters of this seriousness the, the views of the law officers which take account of all of these things are what matters in terms of the the ministerial code um, did this happen in the same way as other litigations so um in, in terms of the conduct of the litigation put to one side the the catastrophic error that material or became evident at the end of december which i like to think is not in any way normal um, I suppose you'd have to ask litigators and, and government lawyers whether the conduct of the litigation was anything out of the ordinary. In my experience, bar you know, the, the, seriousness of the issues, seriousness of the issues that emerged that ultimately led to the, the loss of the judicial review, I, I wouldn't say it was particularly out of ordinary. For me, um, you know, this was a former first minister taking the government to court. It was my former, you know boss, friend, mentor, long-time associate taking the government to court. It wasn't in that sort of sense normal. Um, and I don't think, you know, it, it didn't lead, in my view, to a significant or a significantly appreciable difference to my degree of involvement. But of course, um, there are elements that, that me, me, mean it didn't feel entirely normal. And I can't remember if this is absolutely correct, but from my memory, um, you know, meeting with counsel, for example, to kind of satisfy myself that we still had a statable case and, and discuss it directly with them would not be absolutely a routine thing for the First Minister to do in every piece of litigation. Thank you. you we've mentioned already, well, we've, we've talked a fair bit about the timeline of all this and we've looked at how the 6th or perhaps arguably the 11th of December was a crucial date in terms of the, the advice being offered. Um, was a more crucial moment the, the view, um, a change in the views or a, a view expressed by the law officers rather than merely by external counsel? Um, so the, obviously external counsel were, were conducting the litigation. So in that later part of December, the commission on diligence, the, I can't remember if that's the technical term of it was happening and they were conducting that. So they were at the front line and you know, uh, you know, the, the, there is maybe an element to which I owe them an apology as well, because the, the conduct of that was, was not what you would ever want it to be. And, and they were in a situation they should not have been in, in terms of documents coming to light that, that hadn't previously come to light. Um, so that obviously they were at the sharp end on the front line informing the view that Murdo Fraser read out copious uh, quotes from, from the 19th of December uh, opinion later on. Obviously, then the Lord Advocate uh, and law officers have to take account of that. There was discussions, I, I think I said earlier on, I discussed on the phone on my way back up from London, I think on the 19th, uh, the deteriorating position. I saw the Lord Advocate the following day. Um, I don't want to sit here and quote him, uh, but I think by that point, you know, he was pretty much of the view that this was, if not uh, unstatable, fast becoming unstatable. So, and that then led to the the process that was commissioned by the Permanent Secretary, I think on Boxing Day, 
and then ultimately that led to the Sarah Davidson advice and the decision we took, which, you know, formally, technically, and I think she said this before, the committee that was the permanent secretary's decision, but I would not want to leave the committee with anything other than the, the impression that I was involved in that. I was being properly consulted and I was part of that decision and I, I stand by um, that decision. Finally, convener, <clears throat> again on matters of timing, as you're aware, there has been an accusation put to this committee that the Scottish Government assisted the case uh, to allow the criminal trial to take over and the judicial review to be stopped before it reached a decision. Those are obviously serious allegations. Uh, uh, it's uh, your opportunity to respond to them. The Scottish Government didn't assist the case and never asked to assist the case. So there's <clears> a kind of factual flaw in that uh, hypothesis to start with. Um, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, convener, uh, the Deputy First Minister said there may be more information on the assisting consideration yet to come to the committee, but assisting was considered at an early stage. And again, I suppose from my non-expert opinion, given the circumstances at an early stage of this, when there was a, a, a criminal investigation also underway or at the early stages, I think it would have been extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary, if the question of assisting hadn't even arisen in our considerations. Um, but certainly my memory of those early discussions, and by early I'm talking, you know, over September, early, mid-September, maybe a, a bit longer than that. Um, the, the preference seemed to be, if I recall it correctly, in favour of reporting restrictions as opposed to assisting. And ultimately, and I think this was the end of September, I, I, the 27th of September uh, is the one that comes into my mind right now, the, the, the lawyers for Alex Salmond made a motion to the court for reporting restrictions and the Scottish Government didn't oppose that. So that kind of, at that point, put the assisting thing, which from my memory, and obviously I wasn't part of every discussion with lawyers, was never a really serious thing that the Scottish Government was intending to do. And I don't have a recollection. Again, I can't sit here and say it was never discussed or I didn't ask any questions about it, but I don't recall at a later stage assisting was ever something that was being considered in any <coughs> sense by the government. Um, and the fact is we never made an application to assist. But generally, this idea that we were gaming, and these, this, these are my words and I'm just using them for shorthand, that we were gaming the timing of the judicial review to allow uh, a police investigation to overtake it um, is absurd and bizarre and just completely uh, without any evidential or factual foundation. Firstly, I think as you can see, and the committee can take a view on whether they think our decisions on the judicial review were right or wrong, but you can see from the advice, the process that was being gone through. And the idea that we could have done that, it would have involved the police, us knowing what was going on in the police investigation, what the timing of that was, and the police being prepared. And it's just absurd. And anybody who suggests otherwise is, I think stretching the credibility of even the most devout conspiracy theorists. Um, and the evidence that was put forward for that, I, I use evidence loosely, the assisting thing, which I, I just don't think happened in that way, um, and then messages. You know, the, the four messages, and I'll be careful because the convener reminded me of this earlier on, but they were put forward in evidence to this committee as somehow you know, substantiating this idea. I, I, I looked at these four messages. One, as I say, the committee, I think, has seen, and uh, as part of what it's seen before, um, I think a couple of them were right around the time the whole thing became public, before the judicial review had even got properly off the ground. And if memory serves me correctly, I might be getting the one and two around the wrong way here. The other one was after the judicial review, I think it was two after the judicial review had already collapsed. You know. I'm sitting here as, as if I'm you know, having to kind of go through step by step to debunk this. I mean, it is just, it's absurd. And I don't think absurdity should probably be given the amount of time I'm taking to debunk it. Thank you, convener. Uh, Margaret Mitchell, please. Uh, convener. First Minister, can I refer you to your written submission and the entry date fifth of July 2018, where there's a discussion with Alex Salmond about arbitration. He says that arbitration is rejected because the Scottish Government is confident 
in the legality of the process. My senior counsel believes it is unlawful. That's the whole point of the arbitration. The, the legality will have to be resolved in either private, in a confidential and binding arbitration, or in public at the court of session. The Scottish Government and you have everything to gain from arbitration. If my legal advice is wrong, I will accept that and the current process proceeds. If the Scottish Government legal advice is wrong, you, um, if the Scottish Government's legal advice is wrong, you discover that without losing in a public court. Adopting an arbitration process also guarantees confidentiality from, for the complainers, regardless of what happens. Can you explain why these arguments were rejected? Um, I, it wasn't my decision. Um, I can give you a view on the appropriateness or otherwise of arbitration, but it wasn't my decision. That was part of the process of the handling of the investigation that I wasn't involved in and, and didn't intervene in. So I, I, you know, you heard from the Lord Advocate, who's much more uh, qualified to, to comment on these things than me. I, I think there is a question, I'll put it no more strongly than that, about whether arbitration would have been an appropriate process to resolve issues that actually should be resolved in a court. These are public policy, public law issues. Arbitration, and I'm simplifying here, tends to be about settling private disputes between companies, for example. So I do think there is a very big question um, about whether arbitration would have been appropriate, but the government, in, as part of the uh, investigation and part of the process of that, were considering that. The, the question for me, because that's a, I think from what you read out there, that's a, a message from Alex Salmond to me, uh, suggesting that I should be intervening to help bring about that process of arbitration. So on that point, put aside whether you think arbitration was a good thing or a bad thing, that the government should have done it or not have done it. The point is, I think it would have been highly inappropriate for me to intervene on Mr Salmon's behalf to try to bring any particular outcome about. This was an investigation that I was not part of, I had no role in, I wasn't even supposed to know about it. And I would have been intervening on behalf of a friend and a colleague and an associate. The complainers didn't have the ability to come to me to ask me to intervene to get something that they wanted to happen in the process. I don't know whether they would ever have wanted to do, but that, I would have been given him privileged uh, influence in a process in which I wasn't meant to have part. Now, I tell you something, people have strong views about my conduct and that is perfectly correct and I'll defend that and I will, you know, take people's judgment of that. But if I had done that, if I was sitting here right now, having done that, I think the criticism that would be raining down on my head would be absolutely and utterly justified. Here's my problem with that, First Minister. Um, we've got the former First Minister of Scotland who has had a reputation for knowing procedure for running a very competent government. And he's coming to you, he's told us on record, that he was reluctant to take the government which he had been First Minister of to a judicial review. So he's explaining to you there is another way. And it seems to him, apparently, that if, as First Minister, you're taking all the considerations into account, including that you are custodian of the public purse. You do not have a blank cheque just to, to write um, to, to pursue what might not be necessary action. So it seems then his argument that that would save the taxpayer a whole lot of money and that would be prudent. It would establish if the procedure was lawful and if it was lawful, then the the complaints, et cetera, could, could go ahead. But crucially, too, it would also have protected the anonymity, the anonymity of the complainers. Now, you said that's rejected. And what I'm wondering this morning, in all the evidence we've heard and all the mistakes, somebody surely has to be held responsible. And what I'm not hearing is where the division of powers is from our independent uh, civil service to 
the ministerial responsibility you very graciously seem to be taking um, re responsibility for that all. But that doesn't help accountable, transparent and open government. People need to know how this happened and why that was rejected. And can I just say, lastly, you would have been criticised because you hadn't brought this forward in a public forum. That suggests to me that political considerations outweighed the, purpose, but the public purse considerations, the anonymity of the complainers and the reputation of this Scottish government and by extension the parliament. I feel very strongly about this aspect and people are entitled to different views, but I'll, I'll give you my view straight. Um, mm -hmm. And I do think it goes to the heart of uh, the appropriate exercise of power and not abusing power. And uh, it goes to the heart, therefore, of trust and integrity in government. Can I, first of all, though, I can't let pass the opportunity to thank you for uh, your verdict that the government uh, in which I was Deputy First Minister for all these years was a competent uh, government. Um, I'm sure that uh, we will reflect well on that. Um, I think, I think we helped you out a little bit when you were a minority government. <laughs> and minority and minority governments, uh, anyway, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, so, putting that slightly flippant up point aside, um, you, you make a lot of assumptions there, and, and with respect, you conflate a lot of different things and a lot of different roles, and I, I understand why, but I'm going to try and unpack them a little bit, if that's okay. Um, you make an assumption that arbitration would have avoided all of the problems that occurred, because, that, that occurred in this process. I think that is a massive leap of logic. Nobody knows that. Uh, the government, in a process that I was not part of, because I was expressly excluded from it in this procedure, was undoubtedly considering the arguments that Alex Salmon's lawyers were putting forward in favour of arbitration, and they decided for... Uh, the reasons that they decided that arbitration was not an appropriate thing to do. And um, I, I think you probably have canvassed this with the Lord Advocate and the Permanent Secretary, but the Permanent Secretary would be the one that would uh, make that judgment. The question for me at this point, because this was not a procedure, a process of investigation I was involved in, is would it have been right for me to intervene? Now, you said, you know, he's a former First Minister. He's, he is a former First Minister. He was a former First Minister when he was asking me to do this. But he was also the person who was subject to complaints that were being investigated. And he was seeking to get me to intervene in that process of investigation on his behalf in a way that would have uh, departed from the terms of the procedure and would have been trying on his behalf to put the investigation down a track that he hoped would avoid the complaints, the, the decisions, the, the complaints ever come into a point of decision. Now, even if you think Alex Salmon's legal advice, and, and that's all he's putting forward, his legal advice is right, and even if you think that arbitration is something the Scottish Government should have done, um, I think both of those points can be uh, rebutted strongly. The point for me is, would it have been appropriate for me to intervene on behalf of my friend and colleague and former boss in a process of investigation that I wasn't meant to have part in. And as First Minister, I think if I had done that, whatever you think about the merits of what he was arguing for, if I had used my role, my influence, my power to get him an outcome he wanted, not as a former First Minister, but as the person who was subject to these complaints, I think that would have been an egregious breach of my power. I think it would have been wrong and deeply inappropriate. And, you know, maybe had I done it, an arbitration had happened, and maybe if you turned out to be right and I had made it all go away, we'd never have found out. But say we had found out. I was saying I'd still be sitting here. I don't think I'd still be sitting here because I don't think anybody would have accepted that that was a reasonable, legitimate or acceptable way for a First Minister to behave. And I think, frankly there would have been a lot more justification in that criticism than, if I may say so, in some of the criticisms that are being levelled at me. And I'm sorry, there is, in all of this, there's been a lot of personal angst for me and others, uh, you know, me least of all, um, in all of this. But for me, one of the hardest things, which is maybe why I, I, 
I let him down more gently than I intended to on that 2nd of April meeting. Sitting and saying no to a friend who's asking you for help is a tough thing to do. And, you know, it has had big implications for me and my relationship with him. But was it the right thing to do? Absolutely. And I will maintain that for as long as I live. I think the difficulty with that, um, convener, is you're the First Minister of Scotland. You're the most powerful person in Scotland and you should be acting in the public interest. But the public interest, it seems to me, would have to be establishing whether the legal advice that you'd got, now that wasn't 100% certain that that was fine, and the legal advice that he'd got from very credible and um, experienced lawyers, so it wasn't like you know he'd put his finger to the wind and, and said, um, we think this is what it is. He was making material points, and you seem to have absolved yourself of any responsibility to take these points on board and act to protect well, the public purse, to protect the anonymity of the complainers, all to make sure that you weren't accused of covering up. That doesn't seem to me credible. No, to make sure I didn't abuse my power as First Minister on behalf of a friend who was accused of serious uh, sexual misconduct. Um, and I, we're going to have to agree to differ on this. Um, and, and, but remember, all of the legal arguments and legal advice he had, it wasn't that because I wasn't agreeing to intervene, the government didn't have them. The government had them. They were being properly considered in the process of the investigation. The point here is that this was a procedure, rightly or wrongly, you can have your views on the procedure, that excluded me from the process of investigation. Now say that, say, say and I, I apologise to them in advance for naming them in this way, but it's just to illustrate a point. Say these complaints had not been against Alex Hammond. Say they'd been against Jack or, or Henry McLeish. They wouldn't have had the same access to come because they, you know, like both of them and respect both of them, but they, they wouldn't have had the same access as Alex Hammond uh, to, to me. Uh, so I would have been using my power to help a friend in a process of investigating serious complaints. And I, Ms Mitchell, I, I will maintain for as long as I live that had I done that and had it come to light, probably you included would be sitting here telling me that I had acted completely inappropriately. I think I would have weighed up the arguments, but the point is there was a route and arbitration was offered to the permanent secretary and she rejected yes. it. Now, that's the process that regardless of political party, anyone could have followed, and it's what he did follow. And, and he made that others, argument. If you, you excuse me, First Ministers, it's for others to, to, I think, look out the case I've set out and what you've said effectively, which sounded, forgive me, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, I was going to make sure that it was exposed and he didn't get off with this. And that was my overwhelming uh, motivation, rather than acting in the public interest at this very early stage, where, yes, um, if he'd been found right, you would have had to have gone back to the drawing board. Didn't mean it was the end of the matter. It could have been looked at again. Um, a new procedure could have been put in place. It wasn't the end of it, but you choose to do something else. I don't think we're going to agree on this, but I think we've set up enough of the boat balancing arguments for others to make their own determination. If, if, if the committee's uh, conclusion is that I should have intervened, then the committee's entitled to do that. And, you know, well, I will, my view of, propriety in these things will uh, be severely challenged um, at a fundamental level. But can I say, you, you, I think you were putting something to me there that I, I wanted to see them exposed at all costs and, and it not, I, I, I think there is a public interest. If somebody has serious complaints made against them and there is a procedure in place to allow those to be investigated, that, that procedure is allowed to, to happen without interference, political interference from somebody's powerful friend to try to, to, to divert the course that it would take. I, I think that is absolutely in the public interest. Um, and that's the judgment I made. People can decide whether it was right or wrong, but I decided that if I had done what he wanted me to do, I would have been acting 
uh, in a way that was improper because I was his friend. And I, I just don't think anybody right now would be patting me on the back if that is what I'd chosen to do. But the idea, I never wanted, I can't tell you, I can't find the words to express this strongly enough. I never, ever, ever, ever wanted to face a situation where Alex Salmond, a man I have revered, had revered since I was 20 years old, or probably younger than that actually, was facing serious allegations of, of sexual misconduct. I didn't want him exposed. I didn't want any of this to happen. My conduct in all of this is rightly under scrutiny. I have no complaint about that. I have no right to have any complaint about that. But the idea I ever wanted any of this to happen, this situation, however people judge I handled it, was not a situation of my making. And I tried to handle it in the way that I thought was best overall. And I think it would have been deeply wrong for me to have intervened in a way on behalf of Alex Salmon to try to engineer the outcome he wanted. He was not some objective bystander. He wasn't a former first minister coming to me in some matter of public policy saying, Nicola, do you think you should think about this? He was a party in this whole issue and he was asking me to intervene on his behalf. That would have been deeply inappropriate had I done so. Do you have one? <coughs> Excuse me, do you have any other questions? No, I don't. That sets out both arguments very um, clearly. Uh, we'll move then to Andy Whiteman. Thanks, convener. Um, just a few questions on just a few questions on the judicial review, and thanks to my colleague Murdo Fraser for walking us through uh, much of the process. First of all, the, the petition uh, was um, against uh, Leslie Evans, uh, the first party, and the second party with the Scottish ministers. Can you confirm that at all stages this petition was defended as essentially one petition? There were no separate decisions made or separate considerations given to the two different parties? Um, I think the answer to that is yes, um, but there's, there may be kind of technical issues to that sure. in terms of the consideration that Laura's made. I don't know of anything that was that. I do know at the early stage, um, and I, I can't recall all the ins and outs of this, but there was uh, some legal consideration about uh, whether it might be appropriate to have the petition amended so it was just the Scottish ministers and not against the permanent secretary individually, but I don't, I don't think that went anywhere okay. legally. Fine. Would it be fair to say, in response to Murdo Fraser's line of questioning, that the, the critical tipping point, the thing that changed everything, uh, was the period 6th December to the 19th of December? That's the point at which Council were saying, concede or press on regardless. Um, and then there was clearly problems with the uh, disclosure of documents, and indeed on the 19th of December, at uh, para 12, Roddy Dunlop says, first we are now, uh, he said in, in 11, uh, this gives rise to two concerns. Uh, first, we are now in a position where we think that maintaining a defence of the appointment of the investigating officer may be unstatable. Given the time scales, we are reluctant to take a final view on this, but there is a real risk that we so conclude. So 6 December, 19th December was the, would you agree, the critical period? Uh, yes, although I would probably narrow it a bit okay. more than that. The uh, quotations I uh, used earlier on summarising the view of the law officers were from the 11th of December. So up until the 11th of December, there was a belief that the case was statable with credible arguments. So I think, um, I'm looking at my notes here to see if I can find this, and I'm failing at the moment, but I think it, certainly from the 11th onwards, the, the 14th seems, I, I can't remember if that's when the, the commission process started. So I think... Um, Certainly, the period 11th to the 19th, I think, would be more accurate. But for some reason, the 14th to the 19th seems to be, in my mind, is when it really started to go badly wrong. OK, that's fine. No, it's not, it's not particularly important. Um, I want to move on now just to the process of the concession. Um, Scottish Minister has decided to concede this case. And as I understand it, uh, the, there was discussion um, um, discussion at um, four o'clock on Hogmanay 2018. I'm sure the Lord Advocate was appreciating that. Um, discussing um, how it should be conceded, the basis on which it could be conceded. Um, also saying it would be useful to have Council's input in these matters before the decision goes live. 
and ideally before final decisions are being made on handling. I just don't note we, if there were any further council's input, we don't have that, but that may well be, be, be coming, but I'd be interested in that. Um, the grounds on which ministers decided to concede this was on the basis of the inability to defend the fact that the documents had been produced after it was promised that everything was, and that related to the questions around section 10 and the procedure. Did the petitioner have any comments on the proposals that Scottish ministers made um, as to the joint minute? Um, I, I would think the answer to that is yes. I, I wasn't involved, so, and I would have to check the precise dates here, but the, once the government had taken the decision to concede, there was then a process of lawyer-to-lawyer -lawyer discussions about so I think a bit like pleadings, I think the, the joint minute was probably discussed between the, the different legal teams. Council, uh, I think the, the council that had been involved in the case, I, I think, were the ones who did that. Um, but I'd have to check the detail. So it went into effectively a legal process then about the terms of the concession, uh, the joint minute. And of course, that you know, led to the, uh, the interlocutor of, of Lord Pentland. Yeah, so you agreed a joint minute. Lord Pentland then basically just issued that joint minute as an interlocutor, if in effect. I, I assume so. I wasn't okay, in court. No problem. So I, 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 I am not going to try to speak for Lord Pentland. No, no. But well, we know what Lord Pentland did say, because it's in the interlocutor that I have before me, um, that uh, having heard counsel on the petitioner's motion of consent and in terms and in respect of the joint minute for parties, uh, I finds and declares that the decisions of the first named respondent, Leslie Evans, as set out in the decision report and as set out in a letter from her to the petitioner's solicitors dated 22nd August 2018 are unlawful in respect that they were taken in circumstances which were procedurally unfair and in respect that they were tainted by apparent bias by reason of the extent and effects of the investigating officer's involvement with the aspects of the matters it goes on. So ultimately the decision was made by the court that it was the decisions, those two decisions of Leslie Evans that were unlawful. I am not in a position. Uh, yes, I, I assume. Okay. What, what I'm trying to get yeah. at was: was there any suggestion? And you, I don't think you know the answer to this mm -hmm. question. Um, but was there any suggestion in this winding up period when you were you decided to concede? Was there any discussion or any approach from the petitioner that they may have wished to you to concede on? not just the application of the procedure in terms of the decisions that Leslie Evans had made in this particular case, but a wish to include in that joint minute and therefore the inter in the interlocutor some um, uh, legal grounds relating to the procedure itself. Were you aware of that or not? Uh, I not, I think, as far as I am aware, and uh, I'd have to check that, and I, I wouldn't I wasn't party to those lawyer to lawyer discussions around the settlement of that, but I am not aware that that is the case, but I cannot sit here and say definitively that none of that happened. Okay, thanks, convener. Okay. Maureen Watt, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, members of this committee, uh, First Minister, um, were allowed to read the report by the former Director General of Organisation and Development and Operations, uh, Sarah Davidson, and the Permanent Secretary said that after reading this report, and I quote, the decision that I took was to concede. Indeed, that was also the advice that was given to ministers. So, can I ask about that decision-making process? Did the Permanent Secretary discuss this matter with you prior to making a rec recommendation to concede? Uh, we, we discussed it uh, on an ongoing basis over that few, day, few days period, you know, in terms of her commissioning that note when we got that advice and then the, the decision that was, was taken. So we were, you know, I, I was in touch with her. Uh, that was over the Christmas and New Year period. Um, so, yes, I mean, I, I can't sit here and tell you exactly on what day a lot of that was by phone, obviously, given it was over the, the holiday period, but she was fully... You know, th this, I think, has been described, and it is, and she has said it here, it was the Permanent Secretary's uh, decision. I, in no way, whatever the technicalities are, I'm seeking to dissociate myself from this decision. I was involved uh, in the deliberations. I uh, was in agreement with it and absolutely stand behind the decision the Permanent Secretary took. 
Okay. And in um, the Lord Advocate's evidence, he highlighted the importance of focusing on the complainers when it came to con decisions to concede to the judicial review. So I suppose my question is, um, was the protecting of the complainers and their complaints, did that play a role in it taking quite a while to decide whether to concede the judicial review? So I don't think you can separate that and forgive me, I'm about to speak to, in answer to a question about complainers here in a way that will sound quite dispassionate, but this was a decision making process in uh, a judicial review case. So, and I, I recall, I think the evidence that the Lord Advocate gave on this point, as long, and Alec Cole Hamilton asked me something similar here, as long as this case was statable and we thought we had an arguable, credible case, even although our prospects had deteriorated, then the wider public interest came into play. And that was the, the desire, if possible, to get a judicial determination on all of the grounds of challenge. And also, in addition to that, if we thought we could, we had a chance of successfully defending this and prevailing both on the legality of the procedure and the process, then that would have been in the interest of the complainants because it wouldn't have meant that the whole process was, was set aside in the way it ultimately was. So that was part of that. But you can only, in these decisions, really take account of those wider things as long as you have a statable case. So we, we carried on deciding that for as long as that was the case. Um, and when that ceased to be the case because of what happened uh, in terms of the uncovering of information that then suggested that the IO had had greater involvement with the complainers and that then changed the judgment we'd made about the, being able to, to defend the interpretation of, of section 10, that's when the, the view to concede came. So, you know, a view of uh, the complainers was an integral part of that. I think Alec Cole Hamilton put the, the alternative view that it might have been better for the complainers to concede earlier and allow a new process. Now, people will take different views on that, but the the interest of the complainers was part of the wider consideration. As long as the case was statable, we should continue to defend it. Okay, thank you. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener. Um, it feels like a long time since we last spoke, First Minister. Um, so let, let me try and rattle through this. Um, can I, can I, sorry, I missed that one. I said you misquoted me the last time we spoke. <laughs> but so you corrected me. Perhaps, well. And you clearly have I, lots of resources to do I, that. I, I well, hope let, I don't have to do it again, me, well, Ms Well, let Bailey. me try and make sure that you do. Could you two just okay. get on with it, please? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> We've been doing it, this for I've years. I've noted that throughout today, throughout today, you've talked about a litany of failures. You've described them as catastrophic. <laughs> sorry, I rest my case. There is, well, you have. Okay. You've talked about errors in the investigation, you've talked about errors in the judicial review, you've talked about errors in the supply of information, um, and I absolutely appreciate you apologising as the head of the Scottish Government and taking responsibility, but you're not directly responsible, are you? Uh, look, every single day, uh, Ms Bailey, things happen in the Scottish Government in my not experience explicitly in my name, but things happen that ultimately I'm responsible for. So most of them go well, some of them don't go well, and I can't pick and choose what I take responsibility for. But in the sense of I wasn't directly involved in the problems that led to the judicial review collapsing, then no, I wasn't directly involved in those. But there'll be lots of things that happen in the Scottish Government that I'm not directly involved in. It doesn't mean I can sit here and say uh, that I bear no responsibility. I don't think I've ever heard you really describe um, your stewardship of, of any particular problem as catastrophic. I mean, you've described these errors perhaps not as publicly. catastrophic. Okay, perhaps not publicly, but then you don't confide in me. But you have used that word. That's a strong word. Tell me why then nobody has resigned, nobody has actually taken responsibility for this. Because at the heart of this, two women have been really badly let down. They've had no closure in this at all. I'm going to give you a, a sort of personal answer to this and then give you the sort of government answer. And forgive me, I, I, it's about four hours in, I'm possibly getting too tired to safely give personal answers. Um, so I think firstly, just technically, and 
Murdo Fraser will correct me if I'm getting this wrong and correct my, uh, me for the official report, but I think I was responding to Murdo Fraser putting the word catastrophic. I, I didn't disagree with that, I agreed with it, but it wasn't my choice of word, it was Murdo Fraser's choice of word. Yeah, sure, so I'm just, you know, we both like to be accurate on these things. Um, there's, I suppose there's two things. The personal, I feel very strongly and rightly or wrongly, um, this situation of complaints emerging against Alec was horrendous for everybody that had to deal with it. It's, I'm not saying it's, it's obviously not unprecedented, but it was, it was really, really difficult for everybody. Um, I didn't know about the, at the time people were in it originally dealing with it, but this was an invidious, difficult situation and people got things wrong. And, and maybe that's made me uh, too likely to be understanding of people who made complaint, uh, made mistakes. Um, but the more, the more governmental answer is we are still in the process of investigation and inquiry um, into all of this. Uh, the, if you remember back to the day that uh, we conceded the judicial review, I think I said in Parliament that day that we, we were going to be instructing an independent process of investigation, which Laura Dunlop was then charged to do. We're awaiting that. We're awaiting, obviously, the, the recommendations and conclusions of, of this committee. Um, and I think that is, is right and proper. My, my problem with that response is that you are the head of government. You have responsibility. The policy lies on a shelf gathering dust. You know, two women have been failed by this. What happens in the intervening two years that you've taken to look at this for any woman who suffers sexual harassment? Well, in much of the intervening two years, there has also been um, a, a police inve a criminal investigation. Now, I'm not saying that constrains internal things we do. The policy, to use your description, lies on the shelf. The policy is still extant. It is, has not been declared uh, unlawful. Um, and fairness at work, although we've talked previously about the perceived or actual deficiencies in fairness at work that led to the new procedure is still there and available for uh, those within the Scottish Government who want to, to come forward. Um, I have, and I, I think this is probably something we all share, I have profound concerns about the impact all of this and some of the, the way the narrative has developed around it, the allegations that have been made. The, all of this, I have a profound concern about what it means for the confidence women in Scotland have in coming forward. And the government's actions are part of that. I don't yes. deny that. But I think all of us, and I say this deliberately, I think every single one of us, after this is all over, have to think about how we repair some of that and build a culture again in Scotland uh, where women do feel confident to come forward. And I don't shy away from the government's big responsibility in that. Yeah, might be useful to have a policy in place that, that people there can apply to. There is a policy to. in it, place. Which, well, we can debate that. Can I well. move on to information and, and let me genuinely say how frustrated I have been as a member of this committee. And I don't think I've ever felt quite so frustrated in my 22 years of being on parliamentary committees as with this one. And let, let me tell you why. We've waited for information from the Scottish Government. The stuff we've received has been partial. It's been late. The complaints handling phase was due in August. We received it in December. Um, the legal advice has taken two votes in Parliament and a motion of no confidence in John Swinney before we saw it last night at six o'clock. Last night at six o'clock. And let me say to you, there's information missing. References made in the documents to communications with Christine O'Neill. None of them are there. The information is not provided to us. Reference has been made to an urgent consultation meeting on Friday the 2nd of November. Nothing's there. It's not been given to us. Your meeting on the 13th of November, which I think is critical, as the First Minister, with the Permanent Secretary and the Chief of Staff and external legal advisers, there's nothing. Where is the consultation note of that meeting? It's not been provided to us. Now, I have to say, we've waited to the 11th hour for the legal advice. We get partial legal advice. Do you understand the frustration of the committee? Do you understand that it looks as if the government doesn't want to give us critical information? And what will you do to rectify that today? 
today, I, I'm not sure what Why you not? want me to do. I'm, look, I, I could sit here, as I have done on certain legal advice, for example, and it's not going to uh, remove your frustration, nor would I expect it to, but I've given you um, a, an explanation of the, the factors that lie under that, and we can agree or disagree on that. I would also uh, take issue with some of the characterisation of uh, delay in, I don't think this was your word, uh, prevarication and you know trying to avoid giving information. There have been really complex issues behind the provision of some of this information. Sometimes it's quantity, uh, but often the, the legal constraints uh, and the the particular legal orders in place. I think the government has fully cooperated mm -hmm with the committee and I think it has provided information um, in a, a proper way. But I am not going, as First Minister, uh, that you know, absolutely respects committees of this parliament, I'm not going to sit here and say, listening to what you've just said to me, that I'm not going to reflect seriously on that because of course I will. Um, I, I think I said this earlier on, for different reasons I know, I share a lot of this frustration because some of the information that hasn't been available, some legal advice that's down to the government, but for the reasons I've set out, other you know, categories of information, it's not down to the government. You know, Things handed over in criminal trials, it's not in the government's gift to give that. But every time, and I would actually argue this with the legal advice, that there has been information that a lot of mystique and intrigue has been built up around once it has been published, or in the case of some of what the committee got, from the Crown Office wasn't published, but you were able to look at that yourself and see that what had been said about it wasn't actually the case. And I think with the legal advice, while people can take different views on the decisions we took, you look at the legal advice in, in the rounds and see some of the things that were being said about the government's position are just not borne out in fact. So I, I get some of the frustration. I share some of the frustration, even if I don't accept the characterisation on all respects of what lies behind that. But I will... With any committee uh, that is uh, saying that it feels that way, I will reflect on that. If there are particular pieces of information that uh, I can today uh, see if, if the committee still feels it needs and hasn't got, if that information is available, I will undertake uh, to do what we, we can to provide that to the committee. Can I say to the First Minister that the time for reflection has actually passed? We've been asking for this information for months. There have been two votes in Parliament that as far as I can recall, you were present for. Two votes in Parliament demanding the release of legal advice. Endless letters from this committee to John Swinney, your deputy, asking to see legal advice. We didn't want to see it all. We wanted to see council's opinion. We wanted to see the notes where council were involved in providing advice to ministers, to the Lord Advocate, to whoever. We haven't got that today. We simply do not have it. And what I would ask you there, then, is what is the legal basis for not giving us the consultation note from the 13th of November with Council? I... What is the legal basis of not giving us the note of the meeting of Friday the 2nd of November? What is the legal basis for not giving us the communications with Christine O'Neill? Because I just don't understand that. I genuinely don't. Well, firstly, I know the Deputy First Minister has uh, said there will be further information coming to the committee. I, and I'm crossing this line today because I'm sitting in front of the committee, I have deliberately recused myself from the handling of that. So I don't know exactly what the different arguments are in relation to every single bit of information, but that process is still underway and I'm not going to get into the detail of that when I am not, uh, and it may have been developing as I've been in here today, so I, I'm not equipped to do that. But do you accept these are critical bits of information that would have well, been so useful I, to talk to you about? I, I have spoken. I spoke at length uh, to Murdo Fraser, not per perhaps at length on this particular bit, but in my exchanges with Murdo Fraser, I talked about the consultation on the 2nd of November, which I wasn't at. I mm -hmm. talked about the Solicitor General being at that and the outcome of that. So I'm not going to get into specifics there because I am not uh, in... Uh, possession at this point and all the information about what exists and what can and will be passed to the committee. That is a process that is, uh, I understand it, underway. On the general issue, you know, I am not going to sit here and, and rehearse all the arguments about legal advice. Uh, the 
The, the position on government legal advice is long established and there for good reason. And I, sitting here right now, I'm glad you've got the legal advice so that I could talk about it openly today. But I have a concern about getting into a situation where government legal advice is routinely asked for and published, because I think that will undermine the basis on which governments properly inform their decisions. But I'm not you know, going to rehearse that. After the, the parliamentary votes, the committee went through a process, I understand, with the Deputy First Minister that resulted in the committee at that point, not quite as unprecedented as what we released yesterday, but at that point was also quite unprecedented of showing the committee uh, substantial information summarising the government's legal advice. So it's not true to say that the government didn't respond to that, but we have genuinely held views and concerns about the, the, the basis on which governments need to be able to take confidential legal advice. And incidentally, when Alex Salmond was First Minister, he held those views um, as strongly as I do now. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, to intervene here just to say uh, the committee generally shares that frustration um, that Miss Bailey has expressed. And uh, we will be meeting later today and considering the legal advice we have received compared to the motion that we passed unanimously uh, some time ago to see whether the terms of that agreement of the committee has been met and we will then get straight back on to the government to discuss these issues. And it is noted that Mr Swinney, Deputy First Minister, has in fact said that more information may be available. So that is ongoing. Ms Bailey. Thank you very much for that um, helpful point of information, convener. Um, but you know, if you take a decision to release legal advice, I am very clear that this doesn't meet the terms of the committee's request, and it is partial. You've taken that decision to release it, not some of it, but actually the legal advice, and we have not yet received that, and I find that really disrespectful to the committee. Let me move on, um, and I will try and be very quick in terms of, of areas that Murdo Fraser has already covered. Um, the Council's opinion of the 27th of September, um, quite clearly at paragraph 6, 58 and 60, questions whether you would succeed on the basis of one particular ground um, that was suggested in the original petition, and that was ground four, procedural unfairness. And I think you would accept that paragraph 6, 58 and 60 question whether you would succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Me, I, I missed at the start Sorry. which one you were talking about. 27th of September, the very uh, first. And which paragraphs are you Council's opinion, 6, 58 and 60. 6, 58 and 60. Okay, Karen. Okay where they note that the vulnerability arises from the procedure itself and not from its implementation in this particular case. So their concern is not just a question of implementation, but the policy itself. And the reason I am so interested in that is because it calls into question the policy you've still got there. It, this is a piece of legal advice, and I, I did try to address this with Murdo Fraser. I have never, I don't know if I can say that in an unqualified sense, I don't think I have ever seen a, a piece of legal advice about a government decision or a, a government, uh, a litigation that government was involved in that was absolutely unqualified and said 100% there are no weaknesses in your case. So that, I, if I had read this and it said there's no potential weaknesses, I, that might have created more of a question in my mind than, than it did. It, the, the, this, the, particularly this point of a litigation where it's prospects of success, it's an early, they, they point out the, the things they think are of greatest vulnerability. That was what they said was of greatest vulnerability in the case. It didn't mean they thought it was really, really vulnerable and we were definitely going to lose. I guess it's relative as well to the other grounds that they thought were much stronger. So that's kind of, that's how legal advice tends to be presented. Here's the really strong bits and here's the bits that are less strong. It's relative and you take that overall. That does not mean, and I'm not going to sit here and speak for Roddy Dunlop and Christine O'Neill, but certainly I didn't read that as saying uh, you're definitely going to lose the judicial review on this ground. Just relatively speaking, this is your greatest risk and greatest vulnerability. 
Okay, let me just quote to you from paragraph 60. This aspect of the case does seem to us to be the most difficult, and we cannot say that there is anything other than a material possibility that the court will agree with the petitioner's complaints in this regard. Isn't it the case that if one, just one of the petitioner's grounds of challenge are found to be legitimate, then it could lead to the quashing of the decision made by the permanent secretary, it could lead to the quashing of the procedure too. It could have done, yes, I think that is uh, evident and factual. Um, I think also it could have been the case, and I put it no more strongly than that, that a judge may have taken an overall view and come to a decision that there may be weaknesses, but overall the procedure was fair. But the operative word in your questions to me there was could. And can I say genuinely, if the government was on, on legal advice like this, of, you know, here's your grounds, here's where we think you're strong, here's where you might have a, a, a weakness. If the government was to decide not to defend legal action on the basis of opinions like this, the government would never defend any legal action ever. Because you never get a, an opinion, I don't think, that says you have no vulnerabilities, there is no possibility of losing. So if that's the test you apply, no government anywhere would ever defend a legal action. And I'm not sure you are suggesting that's the position no, we I'm should not. be in. No, I'm not. But it was an interesting explanation. And I agree that when you consider the 27th of September, they are suggesting that other grounds are quite weak. So I could see why you would proceed on that basis. But when I come to the opinion of the 31st of October, I find no such positive news anywhere in any of the paragraphs. You know, here was an opinion written by Roddy Dunlop QC on Halloween at 10 to 11 at night. It was urgent, it was genuinely urgent. I mean, you get the sense of that from both the submission and the emails surrounding it. In virtually every paragraph, in fact, in every paragraph, he concludes that the prospects of winning are incredibly slim. I, I don't see any positive balancing paragraph. Do you? Um just as, and again, I'm probably straying into trying to speak for Roddy and Locke, which I, I suspect is really uh, unwise to do. But, and it was Halloween and it was late at night and he was clearly seriously concerned. But he also says, you know, my apologies for the hour, I'm being unavailable, I'm engaged in a three week proof. So just to give a bit of context there. But to go back to a question I was asked earlier on, I can't remember who by, is it the case that council had to threaten to resign Council will not, lawyers will not pursue an unstatable case. And so if Roddy Dunlop or Kristen O'Neill had thought at that point the case was unstatable, they would not have agreed to continue. They thought there was a problem. There was then a consultation two days later where the, the, the discussion uh, ended with thinking, actually, this is arguable. This, in, this section 10, yes, it is open to the interpretation that led Roddy Dunlop to write that note, but equally, it's open to the other interpretation, and we think we can argue the alternative interpretation. These are the kind of judgments and decisions that are made in litigation, I imagine, all the time. And I go back to what I said. Fast forward uh, to the 11th of December, and you've still got the law officers, and I'll, I'll read again uh, the summary of the position of the law officers. They tested most of the arguments, including the appointment of the investigating officer, and concluded that we have credible arguments. You know, weeks after the 31st of October, the law officers still thought we had credible arguments. Now, there is always going to be a balance of judgment and differences of opinion about what the correct time, if you think you, if ultimately you lose a court case, what would have been the optimal time to concede that. But taking everything into account, the point at which the government should have conceded this case was not the 31st of October because that and you know if, if you're going to make that argument it's much more credible to make it it's still not right to make it in my view but it would be much more credible to make it on the basis of the 6th of December note than it would on the 31st of October note. now that's just my view um, and that's the view I appreciate the you took. guiding me on the questioning but let me return to the 31st I wasn't of October you on the question. I was just giving you my answers to your questions absolutely well let me return to the 31st of October and quote to you from paragraph 14 um, uh, where Roddy Dunlop says, it makes little sense to continue to defend the indefensible. Now, previously you spoke about um, the interests of the two women in this, and I absolutely agree with you. And here is what he goes on to say. Um, the upside to such an eventuality, the procedure would simply be reset 
safeguards could be put in place to minimise the risk of a further challenge to the renewed investigation. Wouldn't it have been better for the two women if you'd followed that advice? Um, I'm not... So, ultimately, with everything we know now, uh, you can certainly make that case. But, you know, on the 31st of October and around about that, and let me just quote the last paragraph of it, all of that is, however, presently hypothetical. A, vi a final decision will require to await the information discussed above. This note is simply provided to ensure that the main decision makers are fully cited in advance of Friday's consultation. Friday's consultation looked at the whole thing and decided actually there was a credible argument that could be made. And at that point, so you, you, you're sitting here with, yes, a weakness in the case that hadn't previously been known, a significant weakness, serious problem, I think, is the term Roddy and Lop used. But the consensus view, supported by the law officers, is that there was a credible argument. And actually, this didn't happen, which is why you can apply the hindsight and get to the point you're reasonably making to me. But actually, at that point, I think it was a reasonable judgment to say that it was better for the complainers to try to defend the case and hopefully prevail on the case so that they didn't have to go through a different, a, a revised and rerun procedure. But we, we don't know what happened at the meeting on the 2nd of November because we don't have those papers in front of us. You've made okay. That well, point, no, yeah. I'm making it again because there is the obvious difficulty. I have nothing to test your response against. Um, can, I, can I go to one of the obvious areas that they were wanting further information? And that's the role of the investigating officer. Why did it take so long to find out the investigating officer's prior involvement with the complainants when, according to her um, evidence to the committee, it was widely known? So at this point, um, it was believed that the degree of contact uh, between the investigating officer and the complainants uh, was not such that it meant we couldn't argue the interpretation and the fact that the degree and nature of the con contact was such that it didn't make the process unfair. Later information came to light and I cannot definitively answer the question as to why it took so long for that information to come to light, but we were basing, you can only base decisions on the information you have at the time and, and that is uh, the, the broad summary of the position uh, that pertained on the 31st of October. Of course, this was something, and, and a, a large part of the 31st of October note is talking about the obligation of disclosure on the government. So this was disclosed by the government and then became one of the formal challenges in the judicial review. So at each stage, you can, you can and it's, it's part of the committee's job, is to, to look at the thing in the round, to look at it from the perspective of the outcome and work, its, work your way back and come to a view on what we got right and what we got wrong. But when you're in the decision-making process, you take the decisions on the basis of the information that is in front of you at the time. And that is, and I think at each stage, the decisions that the government reached are absolutely defensible on the grounds of being legally sound and sound in that wider context as well. Was she spoken to by the Scottish government's legal department? And if so, when? Who, sorry? Um, the investigating officer. Was she interviewed by them? I don't know. Okay. Um, she was interviewed by junior counsel on the 17th of October. Oh, sorry, in the context, I, I understand that uh, statements and, and affidavits were taken from the investigation, investigating officer, so I think I'm Okay, do you know when that was? Uh, I don't have the dates of that. Okay, no. that would be useful to know. Um, she did meet with junior counsel, we understand, on the 17th of October. Again, we don't have a note of that meeting. Would it be appropriate to supply us with that too? I don't know. Um, and uh, see, I am not involved, not least because I'm sitting here right now in the process of considering what further information the committee uh, will be sent. So I'm not going to answer those questions, yes or no, because there will be considerations that are uh, no doubt being and will be undertaken. Okay. Can I move on um, to the duty of candour? Um, because that, of course, requires full disclosure of information by the Scottish Government. Um, why was the Commission on Diligence needed? Why, why did the Scottish Government not hand over the information that would be required and, and expected of it? Well, my understanding is the Scottish Government did hand over the information that it thought it had and was complying uh, with the duty of candour as it thought. Information came to light, regrettably during the Commission on, on Diligence, uh, that then 
had the result that we have spoken about. There was, to the best of my knowledge, no intention on the part of the Scottish Government to withhold information, um, but the process uh, demonstrated that there had been information that was not handed over in the proper uh, and timely way. Okay. Um, I mean, I have to, to, to say this mirrors the committee's experience of trying to get information from the Scottish Government. Um, you may recall there was a search warrant issued to the Permanent Secretary from the Crown Office to ingather material for the criminal trial. Um, the committee itself asked for information um, on the complaints handling phase. Um, and in addition to a number of documents, we got 40 documents not previously seen before, either at the criminal trial or indeed at the court of session during the judicial review. Um, should they have been revealed? Um, I, to I the court of session I, in the Crown Office. I, I don't and know what docu oh, Sorry, I thought you were finished. Okay, no, no. Um, breaching the terms of a search warrant, I had understood as a layperson, was quite serious. Have I got that wrong? Uh, it would be serious if that is what had happened. I, it, it's a bit like some other things that have been put to me. There is a, a, an assumption underpinning that question that I don't uh, necessarily... I accept. I, I think there has been a suggestion made that, uh, I think from Mr Salmon, that 46 documents were inappropriately withheld from the warrant in the criminal investigation. Uh, Scottish Government officials have reviewed the documents that were listed in the submission he made to the committee. Of these, 13 of them were in fact released under the warrant uh, and others didn't meet the specific terms of the warrant. Uh, the government, certainly ministers and the permanent secretary had no role in determining which documents were in scope of the terms of the warrant. There was a, a rigorous process undertaken, but crucially, the warrant process is uh, included oversight by an independent commissioner that was appointed by the court. Uh, so where documents weren't handed over, that would have been because a judgment was made that they weren't within the scope of the warrant. But that was not a process I had any direct involvement in. Okay. Um, can I move us on to sisting? Um, and you earlier said, I think in response to, might have been Alistair Allen, um, about the, the nature of the attempt to assist the judicial review, which... No, to the best of my knowledge, there was no attempt to assist the judicial review. Okay, but, but there was discussion about it. I would, be, I would have been astounded, <clears throat> given the circumstances, if there wasn't even a... Dis we're talking here about a judicial review uh, where there was a, a criminal investigation. You would, you would consider, and I think the government did, whether there was any case that there should be an application for assisting. That didn't happen, and instead there was an agreement um, on the part of the Scottish government not to oppose the motion for reporting restrictions. And certainly from my memory of those discussions, there was always a sense that reporting restrictions would always be preferable to assisting because it would allow to go forward. But this idea that the government was trying to get this judicial review assisted is, is not the case. Well, we were told by the former First Minister that he had a precognition statement which suggested that a special advisor was encouraging civil servants to come forward as they were out to get him and that would assist the assisting process. So I'm going to go on to what I understand from that precognition. Because I, you know, like, oh, I hear these things. Uh, neither have I, um, and, but I've, I've made some inquiries. But can I just say, you were told a lot of things by the former First Minister, um, just as you will be uh, applying uh, you know, your critical faculties to what I'm telling you, I'm sure you're doing the same to, to his as well. So the government did not try to assist. And, and, that, you know, and to the best of my knowledge, there was no, after the early stages in September, that led to reporting restrictions being imposed. There was no, as I said earlier on, I, c I can't sit here and say nobody in the government ever raised the word assisting again. I can't even be sure I didn't raise the word assisting again, but there was no serious attempt at any point on the part of the government to get this case assisted. So this kind of theory seems to fall apart on that really inconvenient fact. On the, the precognition statement, and I, you know, I have to piece these things together, I, th I think, Forgive me, I think there has been um, an implication, or not an implication, that's putting it too strongly. I, I think some people perhaps have wanted it to be assumed that the special advisor in this particular um, 
fragment of the conspiracy theory, if I can call it that, was my chief of staff. My understanding is that's not uh, the case. The special advisor uh, that allegedly said this, I think, was asked about it by the police and is adamant that that was not something that was said. But this is also a special advisor that would have no real knowledge or insight into what was happening in the judicial review. Now, I can't say any more than what I've said there because it's just me trying to piece fragments of information together. But probably the most important thing for me to say is, you know, if, if somebody wants to genuinely argue that the government was trying to game the timing of the judicial review in order to allow it to be overtaken by a criminal investigation, there's a lot of things that really have to be established, a lot of very unlikely and implausible things that really have to be established there that nobody, as far as I can see, has come within a million miles of doing, probably because it simply did not happen in that can way. I, I, I absolutely hope the First Minister's right, but you'll not be surprised to hear that we don't have the paperwork that relates to that. We've been promised it, still to appear. But if the government had made a, an attempt to assist the case, presumably that would be, I'm maybe getting this wrong, but presumably that would be known through the court proceedings that there had been an attempt to assist the case. We've, we've nothing from the government, despite requesting it, and they've promised to deliver it, so maybe you could hurry them up. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Ms Bailey. Now, I think there's um, a small question or so from Mr McMillan on the judicial review, and then I will ask him to move straight into the ministerial code, for which he also has a couple of questions. Mr McMillan. Thank you, convener. I just want to uh, follow on from uh, a couple of uh, Jackie Bailey's questions, and it was touched upon a moment ago that the Scottish Government uh, didn't uh, send anyone to the... Uh, the, to the uh, uh, the, the lodging of the, 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 the complainers um, process. Um, can you explain why the Scottish Government didn't send anyone to that place? Uh, forgive me, Mr McMillan, I'm not 100% sure. Is this about the... Yeah, that was the motion. The, for the reporting motion. restrictions? Yeah. yeah. As I understand it, and I'll stand to be correct if I'm getting this wrong, it's because we weren't opposing it, so mm. there was no need for the government to turn up to say we're not opposing it. Um, as far as I understand, that is not that's not unusual in court proceedings. If a motion is unopposed, then there's no need for everybody to be there in court to do that. So I, my understanding is that is what that, that's the explanation of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, in your time as a minister, um, have you ever seen any legal advice uh, from council that predicted defeat uh, for the Scottish Government, but that the Government uh, then went on to win? Um, I'm conscious here of... Uh, we have waived legal privilege in the legal advice in this matter. We have not waived legal privilege, so the Ministerial Code still applies in terms of legal advice on all other issues, so I could not uh, confirm or deny <laughs> the content uh, or provenance of legal advice on other matters. So I'm not, I'm not doing that, because that would be taking me into difficult territory. Um, but I, I commented in general terms that you will get, you know, you'll get a spectrum of opinion in any litigation on any issue. And sometimes in the course of a litigation, it will move backwards and forwards in terms of we're really confident or we're not so confident now and, and back again. And, and that would not be unusual. And I use minimum pricing because it's the one that I've uh, been most closely associated with and involved in, um, obviously, these matters aside in my ministerial uh, career, and also because it was a very long, protracted um, litigation, went all the way to the Supreme Court, if I, if I recall. Um, and I, I use that to illustrate that point, but I, I can't go into the content of any legal advice on any particular issue. OK, thank you. Um, both the uh, Lord Advocate and the uh, former Director of Legal Services were quite candid uh, about the government's failings in locating and sharing uh, all relevant documents with uh, Mr Salmond as part of the judicial review. Uh, how can the Scottish Government procedure change so that, uh, that the Scottish Government are in a much uh, better position to uh, make the, the information uh, more available, certainly in terms of future documents, uh, which are necessary in any litigation? Uh, look, the Government will be learning lessons on all of this. I'm, I have no... I know that. Um, 
I can't give you specific answers to that right now in the terms of the technical things that no doubt the government is trying to improve around document retrieval. Um, these are never simple things. The, the sheer volume of documents that go through government systems on a daily, weekly, monthly basis is, is you know, massive. Um, and part, you know, I'm not making excuses here, but that will have been part of the issue here. I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on how, you know, these kind of searches are done, but you use keywords and phrases and such like. So given the volume of information that the government has, it's, it's a, a complex process. It didn't work at all times here the way it should have worked, and that's had the consequences that we've been talking about. So, uh, you know, these will be things that we will be seeking to improve and, and learn from in the future. Yeah, thank you. And just one final question in this area. Um, it goes back to the, the document that was published yesterday, uh, the legal advice on the, from the 27th of September, which uh, Ms Bailey uh, touched upon. Um, do you have any comments or thoughts about the, uh, the Council's advice in that document um, regarding the, the retrospective element of the, uh, of the case? What? The procedure? I'm not sure which document you're referring to. Uh, so it's the, the legal advice that was published yesterday, the one uh, the 27th of September. The, the note of prospects. Yeah. I, I, would, I would say nothing in addition to what I've said already. Well, I'm about to say, repeat what I said already. You will, the, that note of prospects was covering all the grounds of challenge and looking at what uh, the, the view was uh, around all of them. Um, I'm not, I can't immediately recall exactly what it said on the retrospectivity ground, but all of that would have been taken into account as we, we considered our prospects. I, I, I don't know whether you want to point me to uh, the paragraph. Uh, it's the paragraphs 39, 40, 47 and 48. Uh, the reason why I asked the question is because of uh, certainly the, uh, the Mr. Salmon discussed uh, at length uh, when he was in front of us on Friday. Um, and viewed uh, the aspect of uh, the retrospectivity as a, a strength for his case. However, the Scottish Government's Council uh, stated that, and I quote, uh, there had been an increased public focus on historical allegations of harassment and on the failure uh, of those who had experienced harassment to make complaints uh, at the time of the, the alleged harassment changes, i.e. changes in, pr in procedure are often retrospective and legitimately so. Well, thanks for helping me out there. I couldn't find the... I mean, that goes to the heart of it. Mr Salmond has a view uh, that he says was backed up by his legal advice, which it may well have been, that retrospectivity was inappropriate and, and would have been a legal flaw in the procedure. Uh, my view and the, the government's view is different, both on the, the legal basis, but also on the appropriateness of allowing complaints of a historic nature to be investigated. Thank you. I'll move on to the Minister report. Yeah. Um, so in your opening statement, uh, First Minister, um, and also with your written evidence, you provided an account of uh, why you met or had contact with uh, Mr Salmond. Can you briefly take us through these reasons? Um, basically, because I was being, in, in summary, I can go into as much uh, detail as you want. In, in summary, because I was being told that he was facing an issue. He was distressed. Uh, he, as I was told, uh, and I don't know what the basis of this was, he may be considering uh, stepping aside, resigning from SNP membership. So as a friend of Alex, as a party leader, that was the basis in which I, I chose to meet him. Um, and you know, I've set out in my opening statement, I've set out in my written evidence that that, that was the basis. Um, the, the decisions I then took from that around not immediately notifying that under the ministerial code, and I, I suspect I'm slightly responsible for this myself because I, I talked a lot about the party basis of that. That decision wasn't really based on the classification of, of the meeting. That was down to a consideration of how best I protected the independence and the confidentiality of the process. And I go into that in my written evidence and I touched on it in my opening statement today. Um, what, in your view, was Mr Salmon's motivation for attending? Um, I think when he uh, 
got there and, and we had the discussion on the 2nd of April, it is as he has set out, he wanted me to intervene initially to try to bring about a process of mediation. Um, I believed that I was seeing him, I, I didn't believe, I knew I was seeing him in, in the party personal space, um, but he clearly had a different uh, objective uh, coming into that. Uh, and, you know, when we had that discussion on the 2nd of April, it very quickly became clear to me that what I had thought he might be about to do was was not the case. Um, and I thought it was not appropriate for me to intervene in the way uh, that, that he was asking me to do. You know, th th this whole issue of, I mean, I, I heard him rebut it and, and perhaps, you know, he, he never had any intention of resigning, uh, but it was put to me that he was potentially considering that given that he was handling a, a difficult situation. Um, I don't know whether Jeff Aberdeen, who told me that, was telling me because Alec had told him that or whether it was just Jeff's uh, surmising, but that was something that I thought uh, was a, a prospect or a, a possibility. Um, you know, knowing Alec as I, I did, and knowing Alec as many of you do, the one thing you always have in your mind about Alec is that he doesn't do the, the expected thing. So initially, facing a difficult situation, did I think it credible that he would decide to handle it by saying, I'm going to stand down from the party to clear my name? I thought it was credible. To be perfectly honest, that was something that, that stayed in my mind uh, for longer, that although after speaking to him on the 2nd of April, it was clear that he wanted to deal with it in a particular way so that it didn't become you know, public or anything. There was always a, a thing in my mind that if Alec had got to the point where, you know, he thought that was just not going to be possible, it was always a prospect. He would just decide to take control of the narrative and and handle it in a different way. And and that was, you know, just a factor that, that was in my mind throughout, you know, that period from him, uh, from that meeting on the 2nd of April through that summer. Thank you for that. Um, you've described meeting... Um, Mr. Salmond, on more than one occasion, and certainly on one of those particular occasions, um, you uh, and you've put in your evidence that you didn't want to be cornered by Mr. Salmond at uh, an upcoming uh, party conference, uh, which you thought uh, might occur if you hadn't discussed the matter uh, with him beforehand. Uh, what do you mean by cornered? That might not have been the best word to you. You, you know what SNP conferences are like. We were have so just to deal with the chronology of this. This was uh, after uh, I had become, uh, certainly the, the prospect in my mind had become much more serious that he was contemplating legal action against the government. And that was the point at which, uh, notwithstanding my reasons for not telling the permanent secretary beforehand, I decided I had to tell the permanent secretary because of that threat of legal action. And, and that's what I did in, uh, I think on the 6th of June. Uh, I told her in uh, the letter I wrote her that I would make Alec aware that I had uh, told her and reiterate that I, I wouldn't intervene. So that was the purpose of that meeting. I also knew that we, we, we had our party conference at the end of that week. I assumed he was going to be there. Actually, as it turned out, I don't think he was planning to be there, but I assumed he'd be there. And I just didn't want that decision, that discussion potentially to happen, you know, un, you know in, a, in a sort of... Uh, ad hoc way, I, I wanted that to be planned. So I, I arranged to meet him uh, to, to effectively say, I've told the permanent secretary, I'm not going to intervene. Uh, I'm summarising here, obviously, that was the meeting at which he, he wanted me to take away a draft, uh, a draft petition for judicial review, I think, which I, I didn't think was appropriate for me to do. Okay, no, thank you. Um, according to your evidence, the, the first time that you actually saw the allegations uh, against Mr Salmond under the Scottish Government's complaints procedure, it was uh, in the meeting. Uh, on the 2nd of April in your house. Uh, you described him, obviously, as a friend of some 30 years, as you've done so numerous occasions uh, today. Uh, and uh, I think you've, uh, you've described uh, learning of the, and I quote, the gory detail. I think that's from a, a press report, some uh, alleged press comments from you, uh, of these allegations. Can you expand on that, please? I will not expand on it very much because I suspect the convener will stop me because we'll be straying into territory that is not the remit of the committee. He showed me the letter he'd had from the permanent secretary which set out the details of the complaints that had been made against him. They were 
distressing and you know upsetting details. Uh, but he then, and it goes back to what I said earlier on, this was one of the incidents was an incident he was aware of that he had apologised to somebody for uh, at the time. So he gave me his account of that incident. I, I should be very clear, he denied the specifics of, of the allegation in the sense that there was anything that wasn't consensual in it, but he gave me his account. And my view is that his account constituted behaviour that was not appropriate for, uh, for the First Minister. Um, but I probably shouldn't go into any more detail than that. Thank you. Um, Mr Sam's account of what happened when you met and uh, he brought up the complaints against him uh, was that uh, you said, and I quote, I want to assist, uh, which you took that to mean that, uh, that you would intervene uh, to advocate for mediation in the first instance. Uh, what's your response to Mr Sam's comments? I think I answered this in response to Andy Whiteman. I, I just want to paint, or not paint a picture, but give people the context here. I'm sitting in my house... Uh, it was East, we talked about the 2nd of April, it was Easter Monday. Um, the man that I had worked with, been friends with, you know, in my earlier years, had looked up to so much, had just told me something pretty shocking. I, my head was spinning, I was dealing with kind of complicated emotions. Um, you're sitting with a friend who's saying, ah, you know, I'm facing this terrible situation. Things like, you know, I'd love to help if I could, kind of thing. It's entirely possible you say these kind of things. This is a human situation. We're, we're talking about it now as a, a political scrutiny situation, which is absolutely proper. But in the moment, this was a human situation between two people that knew each other really well. And I was, I think I described this to Andy Whiteman. I was, I, from the minute I saw the, the letter, I knew that it would not be appropriate for me to intervene. I probably was trying to, you know, soften that for him, maybe from his accounts, I softened that too much. I was also thinking about, you know, in, in real time, um, you know, is there anything I have to do? Do I, do I have to report this to anybody? So all of that was going through my head um, as we were, were having this discussion. And But I did not intervene because for the reasons I set out very vehemently to, to Margaret Mitchell, I don't think that would have been appropriate for for me to do. Um, the other thing I would just say is what I've just described to you there is also kind of demonstrates this was not, the detail of this was not something that I had three days to, to kind of think about because I was thinking about it really in, in real time. So from the, the human perspective, is that the, the reason why that you met Mr. Salmond uh, on a few occasions after? Well, I met him uh, twice after that, the 7th of June, uh, ahead of the SNP conference. I think we've already talked about the, the third and final time mm -hmm. I met him. In fact, I think it is the final time I met him, uh, full stop, is uh, the 13th of July, round about that, yeah. that, that July date. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm being very uh, reflective, you know, that's probably the meeting I think. Why, why did I, I meet him again here? It was still, it was very much in the personal party space. I go back to what I said earlier on, and he, if he was sitting here right now, he'd say, don't be daft, I'd never do that. But there was always this thing in my head. If he gets to a point where he doesn't think he can stop this in the ways he's trying to, he just does the kind of, you know, Alex Salmon press conference. And so I, I guess I just wanted to, to know that I wasn't suddenly facing that at some stage and you know this is maybe the most ironic bit of all probably at that stage I was still a bit concerned about him so I'm sitting here facing all of this uh, and being accused of being part of a grand conspiracy against him actually some of what probably has led me into trouble is I was concerned about him so that's why I'm I kind of met him in July um, you know he has taught he at that point was putting to me a belief, um, and I don't know whether it was a genuine belief he had or it was a device to try to draw me in, that I was blocking arbitration, um, which was not the case because I wasn't part of, of the discussion. Thank you. Uh, and my final question, convener. Uh, last week, Mr. Salmond uh, said, and I quote, uh, my view is that there are times in life when, as First Minister, 
you cannot assist your associates because that would be diametrically opposed to something that you have to abide by. Do you agree? Oh, yes. And, you know, not surprisingly, he was putting forward the view that this was an occasion where that wasn't the case, and I should have done, but I, you know, I, I'm not going to rehearse everything I said to Margaret Mitchell. I, I feel very strongly that it would not have been right for me to intervene, however much I might, you know, in my heart uh, have wanted to, to help a friend, although, you know, the nature of this was more complex than that, but it would not have been right for me to do it, and, and that's why I didn't. Thank you. Thank you, Camina. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Camina. Um, First Minister, I too would like to focus on the meetings of 29th March and 2nd April 2018 and their immediate aftermath. All of my questions are around that. Can I just start by confirming something you told us in your written evidence, that you had no idea that you were going to meet Jeff Aberdeen until he appeared in your parliamentary office on March 29th. Is that accurate? I didn't know for certain. Um, I had been told that Jeff wanted to see me, that he might be in Parliament that day. I think that was probably the night before, it might have been the morning of, um, but it was a, he might be in Parliament and if so, he wants to have a word with you. I didn't, I didn't know it was certain that he was going to be in Parliament. But you were partially prepared for it. Um, and Mr Aberdeen said nothing of the actual investigations at that meeting, uh, but did hint that Mr Salmond might be facing allegations of a sexual nature. That... My, my rec as you know, and it's, it's been the subject of <coughs> comment and scepticism, and I understand that, I didn't remember this meeting. And my recollection of this meeting is still not as vivid as I would like it to be. We, uh, it was, I, I won't go into the detail, it was a colleague's birthday there was a and we stepped into my office he he indicated there was a harassment issue to the best of my recollection it was in general terms um the what i remember most strongly is how worried he was about alec and the main purpose of the discussion as i recall it was to get me to agree to see alec now the, the bit where um i do agree and it's Part of Alex Evidence and Friday seemed to be suggesting that I wasn't agreeing. I did agree in that meeting to see him. Um, so, in a sense, the 2nd of April meeting was agreed in, on the 29th of March. I, I don't think the date was uh, confirmed until over the, the weekend, but I did agree to see him. But that's what I recall. There was an issue, it was serious, he was really worried about Alec, and I needed to see him. Um, but my best recollection of that is that it was in, in general terms. Well, um, despite, uh, so despite limited information from Jeff Aberdeen on the 29th of March, you agreed to drop everything and meet Alex Salmond four days later. And you've just said that that was for two reasons in particular. One was personal. He was in a profound degree of distress. And the second was that you'd been told by Jeff Aberdeen that he might well be about to resign from the SNP. Now, when I asked Mr Salmond about this, he was very strident in stating that resignation was the last thing on his mind. Can you tell us what reason did Jeff Aberdeen give you for suggesting otherwise? I, I don't really, that's, I said, I, I can't recall <clears throat> whether Jeff even said, Alec has told me this or, or I just am worried about this. It was just something he said, I think he might be, you know, I think he might even be about to, to resign. And that was what gave me the sense that this was a, a serious issue and I really needed to, to speak to him about it. Let me be clear, within a very short space of Alec being in my house on April the 2nd, it was clear to me that that was not his intention. Um, I still had this, you know, that that could always change with Alec. You know, I don't think I'm describing something here that's not recognisable to people. Expect the unexpected was always something you should do with him. My, my final point is just dropping everything. April the 2nd was Easter Monday. I was due to be at home. My friend of 30 years wants to see me. I agreed uh, that that would be the case. I was due to be working at home. My chief of staff who was at that meeting was due to be there to see me because I was off to China the f later on that week. So it wasn't I can drop everything to see Alec. It was just a, a meeting that I agreed to have and that was the first available and convenient date to do it. Forgive my poor choice of words. Uh, First Minister, yet yeah, this massive and devastating fear and belief that you had, that your mentor of 30 years was about to quit your party, came from a meeting that you claim to have forgotten all about. I'm sorry, First Minister, but do you realise how unlikely that sounds? So, yeah, I do, actually. And, and that's part of, of my difficulty to hear, I, I do get the kind of views of that, but it is, just happens to be the case that that wasn't 
the big significant meeting. And I'll, I'll try to explain that with reference to two things. Firstly, my recollection is that that discussion in terms of the, the detail uh, w was general. It wasn't a detailed discussion in terms of the substance. And it was very much, you need to see Alec. Will you agree to meet Alec? He's really distressed. He might be uh, about to, to resign. And, and actually, given the nature of my relationship with Alec, um, you know, by that point, we weren't seeing each other as often as we had once. But my relationship with Alec was such if I thought there was a big serious issue he was facing. I'd want to hear it from him. I, I wouldn't want to hear it third hand. But the other point that, that I think helps explain, certainly helps explain to me, because I've asked myself, how could I have, you know, forgotten that? is that general concerns, it was not the first time I was hearing a general concern. The Sky Edinburgh Airport thing had, had created that lingering suspicion. The other thing is, you know, what happened in my house on the 2nd of April, in my dining room with a man, you know, that's been all these things to me for 30 years, was so significant that that is the thing that will live with me forever. And did that maybe slightly obliterate in my mind what came before that possibly but that's the fact of the matter sitting there being told not just the complaints but what he told me in terms of his version of that incident is ingrained in my mind though you said repeatedly um first minister i want to ask you about peter murrell um, he told us that as a rule you don't discuss government government business with him but it's a different story when it comes to party business. Indeed, you told the Daily Record yourself in 2012 that of your relationship with him that you just end up talking about it all the time. You never leave it outside. You've been very clear that you met Mr Salmon because you've been told by Jeff Aberdeen that he was about, or possibly about, to resign from the SNP and you would have to prepare the party for that. Those are your words. But you said nothing to Peter Murrell of your concerns and he just thought that Mr Salmon was popping in for a chat. Is that correct? Um, I think it probably merits slightly more explanation. And if, if the, did you say it was 2012, the Daily Record article? Well, maybe we'd learned by then that we shouldn't spend all our time talking politics, that it wasn't good for yeah. um, a relationship or, or health or anything else. Um, I just say that flippantly. Um, the fact of the matter is, I, and you've, you've posited this, I heard you posit to Peter and, and to others, that surely, you know, if, if I thought that he was coming to resign and everything, we'd have to have a handling plan in place and everything. I didn't. I worried that something like that was the case, but I wanted to speak to him before I said, here's running with anybody else. I, I wanted to speak to him confidentially. If he had come into my house on the 2nd of April and said, Nicola, I'm about to resign from the SNP, then of course I would have told people in the party so we could have prepared for that. As it turns out, he didn't tell me that, and I decided I wanted to hear from him what it was he wanted to tell me. First Minister, there's lots of things that the people watching um, probably don't understand entirely whether that's court orders, redacted evidence and so on, but they do understand marriage. Um, I gen uh, if you genuinely thought that you were meeting him in a party, I do, so in, in a party personal space um, and thought the, f the party was facing potentially one of its biggest threats in its history, the resignation of the man who'd effectively built it, can you see how hard it is for those people to believe that you would say nothing to your husband, the SNP chief executive, who you have said previously you talk about about party business a lot with. Can you see how hard, hard that might be to believe? Look, I can see how hard all this is for people to understand. All I would say is there's lots of different emotions and factors and considerations. Um, I had been given the impression by Jeff resignation was a possibility. I didn't know, I certainly can't recall exactly what the basis of that was. I didn't think it was a certainty. It was one of the things that meant I wanted to meet him and hear what the situation was. I wasn't going on the basis of having not actually heard whether that was a reality, it set my party into sort of crisis mode, preparing to deal with this. Had he sat in my dining room on the 2nd of April and said, I'm going to resign, that would have been very different. But I wanted to hear from him um, before I started to tell anybody else whether there was a problem we had to be dealing with. And I, I'm not sure that's impossible for people to understand. Again, so you've said before, um, is it not a more plausible explanation, though, First Minister, to those watching that you actually knew this was government business? That's why you didn't discuss it with your husband, the chief executive of the M SNP. Uh, no, I don't think that is necessarily a more... I can see why people might make that assumption and, and you know, I, I guess... Um, yeah, I do understand that. I'm, I'm only able to tell you, you know, 
from my perspective, it was something that I had been told was a problem. I had, I think in answer to you earlier on, I talked about the, the lingering general concerns, which were clearly strengthened and, and underlined with the conversation with Jeff. But I wanted to speak to him. I wanted to hear directly from him before I, I started. So it was, it was something that I, I thought was confidential. And obviously after I spoke to him, I was even more concerned about respecting the confidentiality of the process. I appreciate that this is, you know, I, I, I hope many people, I hope there's not that many people, certainly in politics, that find themselves in the position of having to deal with serious complaints like this against somebody that was so close to you. But, you know, did I deal with all of this perfectly? Did I deal with it in a, you know, a clinical kind of way that with hindsight, everybody can get absolutely? I mean, maybe not, but I dealt with it the best I could. Um, and you know, people will draw their own conclusions and make their own judgments about that. But talking to someone you share a house with is not a clinical way of dealing with. I, I, I'll move on, First Minister. I think you made that, that very clear. I want to just turn briefly to the question of why Mr Salmon left your house with the impression that you were going to help him. Um, now, you answered very clearly to Andy Whiteman um, in his uh, discussion around the conflicting evidence we've now received from yourself and from Duncan Hamilton QC around whether you had made the offer to assist. And you said to, I wrote it down, you said to Mr Whiteman that you perhaps let him down more gently than you intended to. Those were your words. Um, but your evidence to us could not have been clearer. It said, I made clear to him that I had no role in the process and would not seek to intervene in it. That doesn't sound like letting him down gently at all, does um, it? I did make clear to him that I had no role in the process. He could see that himself because uh, I think he had a copy of the, the process. And I think I made it clear that I wouldn't intervene. Now, I am given what he said, given what Duncan has said, you know, yeah, I... Did I make that clear enough? Did I, in discussing with him and hearing what he thought should happen, did I make that clear enough? And I'm not, so in, in sense, disputed evidence, I'm not saying if Duncan says I said something like that, but when I look at the things that I am, I am being uh, accused of saying, they don't strike me as being, yeah, yeah, I'm going to intervene. It's things like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll help if it's appropriate or if it comes to, I don't know if it comes to what, uh, the permanent secretary's got to tell me. The permanent secretary under this procedure wouldn't tell me till the end. It sounds as if I was uh, not actually thinking of intervening. Um, but, you know, if he left there with the impression that I was, then, you know, that clearly was not the impression I, I wanted uh, to give him. But the crucial part in this, or a crucial part in this, is I didn't intervene. I didn't intervene. And I've, I've heard it put to me today that I should have intervened, but I didn't. And that, so, you know, whatever way I was expressing myself and whatever discussions I was taking part in, I did not intervene in the process. With respect, that's not what we're looking at here, First Minister. We're looking at what you've told this inquiry in your written evidence, juxtaposed with what Duncan Hamilton, who is a QC, who has also suggested he'd be willing to repeat these assertions under oath and knows full well what that would do to his reputation in the Faculty of Advocates and everything else, where he said explicitly that, and I quote, my re clear recollection is that her words were, if it comes to it, I will intervene. That is not um, any suggestion of letting Mr. Salmon down gently, I, I and nor is it uh, along the lines of what you've written to us. Um, I don't know what that would mean in the context of what we were dealing with if it comes to if it comes to what we were there was a an investigation underway so I, I don't know all I'm trying to explain here and I, I it's imperfect and I get that is I'm in this discussion where you know I've been told something shocking and upsetting I'm trying to process it all in my mind as I go um, and you know maybe I express myself in ways that I shouldn't have done um, I'm I'm not sitting here saying I didn't, but I, I believed that I had been clear that I could not and would not intervene in this process. But with respect again, First Minister, you're focusing on the wrong set of words. You know, if it comes to it, it's not that important, as, as important as in I will intervene. It doesn't matter I, I don't the context. So those particular well, we'll words... We'll move on. I, I don't... I, 
I appreciate mm -hmm. we're not going to agree on this. I'm just coming to an end convener. If I appreciate your patience with me. Um, the problem is, First Minister, that actually Duncan Hamilton's statement here is actually borne out by some of the facts, not least Mr Salmon's messages to you bear out Mr Hamilton's uh, version. He certainly left with the impression that you were going to help. My uh, he said on the 3rd of June, my recollection of our Monday 2nd April was rather different. You wanted to assist. Now, I understand that you have told us that perhaps you left him with the wrong impression. And, and I don't think anyone's suggesting that you did make good on that promise, but this is the impression he left with. But the other thing that really sticks with me is the delay in you telling the permanent secretary. It was, uh, you finally told Leslie Evans about the April meeting on 6th of June. That's more than two months later. That's over 60 days of you seeing the permanent secretary in government on an almost daily basis. We know how often you meet with her. Um, and yet, while you spoke and texted to, uh, with Mr. Salmon from time to time, the, you said nothing to her. Now, wouldn't you suggest that the transparent thing to have done would have been to say to the permanent secretary from the outset that you'd had this unsolicited approach from Mr. Salmon? But isn't it right, though, that you didn't do that because in, initially you were minded to help him? Uh, no, that's that's not the case. Um, if I didn't express myself clearly enough, then that's something I'll have to you know, hold my hands up to. But that is not the case. I was in my own mind absolutely clear from the outset that I could not and would not intervene in the, the process. In, in terms of the decision around not notifying this to people in government, I've set that out in my written evidence. I've set it out again today. And again, people can, can decide whether they think I made the right judgment or the wrong judgment. I, I looked at the ministerial code. The ministerial code imposes different ob a range of obligations on ministers sometimes in situations they can feel conflicting and you have to make a judgment the the relevant sections of the code in terms of notification the 422423 are about a situation where you know i'm at a party conference and a company lobbies me about a decision that i'm actually involved in it's about guarding against undisclosed influence on decisions you're taking this felt to me the opposite. This was a decision I was not party to, I wasn't meant to know. And actually, the, the risk that, that those sections are meant to guard against would more likely arise if I, uh, if I told people within government. You know, any conversation that started with me saying, Alex Ammond has told me about this, even, even unintentionally and inadvertently, does that make the people doing the investigation think that you know there's a particular thing I'm trying to to bring about that was the first reason the second reason if you read the code in that respect notifying meetings in that way uh, involves publication and you know you you might all uh, tell me I'm wrong here but if a meeting had suddenly appeared in my published diary Nicholas Sturgeon and Alex Salmond people would have wanted to know what that was about so there would also have been a risk to the confidentiality that's the judgment I arrived at that's and that's what I mean this committee is looking at it but that is one of the issues James Hamilton has to make a, did I get that judgment right or did I not but the ministerial code also at other sections says I have an obligation to respect the impartiality of civil servants and respect the confidentiality of government business so I, I weighed up all of that and I came to a judgment you know it's for other people to judge if if I was right or wrong but I think I made the best judgment overall. And I think I made a judgment that was, in that respect, uh, de certainly defensible. And in my view, I think I made the appropriate one. And final question, convener. Um, and when you finally told Leslie Evans of the April 2nd meeting with Mr. Salmond, did she instruct you in any way to sever all contact with him, to not meet him again or speak to him again? No, I, I wrote to Leslie Evans. I think the committee's got a copy of that letter. I think I'd indicated to her verbally in passing that something of that nature was coming so that it didn't just land on her uh, without any, any warning. Um, and she replied to, to acknowledge receipt. Um, I advised her in that letter that I was going to make Mr Salmond aware that I had told her and reiterate again that I wouldn't intervene. Thank you, Convener. Maureen Watt, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just following on from um, Alec Cole-Hamilton's questioning, Mr Salmond said to us that he thought you should have informed officials in the civil service as soon as it became clear that the meeting of the 2nd of April was related to a government matter. Did he say this to you at the meeting on the 2nd of April 
or at any time uh, later? I don't recall him quoting the ministerial code. Um, if he had done, I would have been as surprised as I was when I heard him talk about having copious knowledge of the fairness at work policy, but that's another uh, matter. So I don't recall him uh, quoting the ministerial code at me, but he wanted me he wanted me to tell the permanent secretary I knew so that I could use my influence to bring about a process of mediation. I don't, I don't think I'm saying anything here that he's not saying himself. He's been, you know, to be fair to him, he's been perfectly upfront about that. And he is making a case and, and people have got a choice to make as to whether they agree with that. He's making a case for why he thinks I should have done that. I'm not saying there's no, to use the phrase we've been using, I'm not saying he doesn't have a statable case. I just think it would have been the wrong thing for me to do. So if he didn't sort of say to you at the time that you should be doing that then, why do you think he's saying that now? I'm not sure he is saying, forgive me, I, I, I didn't watch all of the six hours on Friday, but the bits I, I, I saw and I've, I've read through, I, I'm not sure he's saying he expressly quoted the ministerial code to me. I think he was saying he thought I should tell the, the permanent secretary and, and saying that he thought that was part of my obligations under the, the ministerial code. But on the 2nd of April, to the best of my recollection, he wasn't couching it in the ministerial code. He was couching it in the sense of, you know, this is an outrageous thing I'm being subjected to, this procedure is wrong, uh, there should be mediation and you should uh, help me bring that about. His, and I think some of the, the text messages are, to be uh, accurate about it, they are WhatsApp messages. Um, I think some of those show that later on, the sort of ministerial code issues uh, that he was bringing into the discussion were around uh, making sure the government was acting legally and, and lawfully, which I, I believe I did. Yes, he, he did say to us, and I quote, the First Minister is duty bound to act if she has a reasonable belief that our government is in danger of behaving in an unlawful fashion. Um, what's your response to that? And again, did he communicate this view to you at the time? So I, I knew, because he told me, that his lawyers were corresponding with the government. So therefore, I had a, an assumption that the government would be engaging in the legal points that his lawyers were putting across. So I didn't uh, you know, just ignore that. But I, I weighed up the different obligations that I thought I was under. That had I intervened in the way he wanted, uh, that would have satisfied what he thought my obligations were, but I think I would have been acting improperly by intervening on his behalf because of our relationship in a process that I wasn't meant to be involved in. Now, when we got to the stage where it was clear that he wasn't talking about legal action in sort of the abstract, but was very seriously considering legal action, I then it took the decision to inform the permanent secretary um, that he had said that to me as, as I suppose, part of being sure that the government had awareness so that they were taking the proper steps to to ensure that the government was acting appropriately legally so i you know life as a minister would be much easier if if these things were all binary and you could point for every situation to a a provision in the ministerial code and it answered the question for you it doesn't you we face every day complex decisions that we have to balance the different factors and, and act in a way that we feel is appropriate overall and aligns with the, the, the multitude of obligations that the ministerial code place on us. And that's what I, I sought to do. Okay, thank you. I move now to Myrtle Fraser. Thank you, Camilla. Um, I wonder if I can follow up some of the questions we had from um, Alex Cole Hamilton around the meeting on the 29th of March, because initially um, when you were asked about this, in Parliament, you, you, you didn't acknowledge uh, that meeting had taken place. Subsequently, you said it had. And in your uh, written um, evidence to this committee, you say initially you essentially had forgotten about it until you were reminded of it. And you say, I think it did cover the suggestion that the matter might relate to allegations of a sexual nature. I think I, I, you know, I'd have to share Mr. Cole Hamilton's scepticism about your forgetfulness in this respect. If I can try and put this in parallel terms, um, at the time you were deputy to Alex Salmon, I was deputy to Annabel Goldie. If somebody had said to me in a meeting that Annabel Goldie had been accused of uh, accusations of sexual harassment, 
I think that would have stuck in my memory. I don't think I would have just have forgotten about that. I, I, I would have been so shocked and appalled by news like that that I probably wouldn't have slept a wink that night. It wouldn't have just gone out of my mind. So yeah, I think you'll understand why we're struggling to believe that the, the story that you just forgot about this meeting. It's not a story, it's, it's an account of what happened. And I do understand that, I'm, which is why I'm trying to explain the, the relative import and significance of, of the two meetings. Uh, the other factor around the 29th, as well as to the best of my recollection, it was a, a general discussion focused really on getting me to meet Alex Ammon so that we could talk uh, directly on the issue. Uh, by that time, and I, again, I set this out in in my uh, written evidence, the, the whole uh, episode around, if I can call it that, around the Sky News Edinburgh Airport query had left me with a kind of lingering fear, suspicion, concern, call it what you want, that something might appear. So in a sense, that kind of general concern, that general kind of general discussion, if that had been the first time I'd ever heard any suggestion of complaints of sexual uh, misconduct against Alex Hammond, that might be true, but it, it wasn't. And then on the other side of that, April the 2nd, in terms of sitting there in my own house, reading a letter with all of the detail, and hearing his account of it is what is the, the strong memory in my mind. I, I appreciate that people might think, how could you forget that? But I'm, I'm trying to set out here uh, what actually happened. And I, I have struggled a lot with, you know, how did I, why did I not remember the, uh, the 29th of March? I'm, I'm, I've been struggling to, to try to remember as much as I can about the content of, of that discussion. One of the, when this first came to light, and I was in my own mind uh, trying to think, when, when was it I found out about this? In, in my mind, just instinctively, it wasn't a choice between the 2nd of April and the 29th of March. What I would try to, and I remember doing it when it first became public, I was checking the date of Easter Monday, because it was Easter Monday that we met, and I was like, what, what date was Easter Monday? So, rightly or wrongly, to use your words, you know, people can be sceptical about that, but I, I hadn't remember the 29th as being the big significant factor in this and 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 you know in, in many ways I really wish I had because if I had I wouldn't be sitting here I'd be sitting here answering a lot of these questions but I wouldn't be sitting here trying to explain that to you and I'm trying to explain it to the best of my ability and the best of my recollection. Okay you, you claim that the meeting on the 29th of March was a, effectively a chance meeting an informal meeting it wasn't pre-arranged that is contradicted by Jeff Aberdeen, and we know that because that is reflected in the evidence we've had from Mr Salmon, we had it last Friday, uh, and also corroborated by Duncan Hamilton and by Kevin Pringle. Now, I asked Mr Salmon explicitly about this when he was here on Friday, sitting where you're sitting, and he said this, uh, it is absolutely certain that the meeting on 29th March in the Scottish Parliament was pre-arranged for the express purpose of Nicola being briefed on the situation with regard to me and complaints. I, I don't, I can't speak to what Alec thought or what Alec was told in all of this. I can only speak to, so I, I said earlier on, I knew that Jeff, so in, in the sense that I didn't walk out of my office and find him there and I didn't know anything about it. I had been told, I think the night, I'm, I think it was the night before, uh, this was a, a Thursday, so usually on a Thursday morning I'm focusing on uh, other matters, that Jeff may well be in Parliament the next day and wanted to see me. So in that sense, if, if, if that is what, if Jeff thought that was, re was pre-arranged, then that's the basis on which uh, I understood it. What is definitely the case is that in that meeting, I agreed to see Alec. Uh, so I'm not disputing that. I'm not disputing that the genesis of the, 20, uh, the 2nd of April meeting was in the 29th of March meeting. I think the claim is the meeting was set up by your office. Uh, my understanding is that Jeff had asked uh, to, to see me uh, Clearly, it was through uh, people in my office that that request was conveyed. Um, so the meeting was not at the request of your office? Uh, not as far as I am right. concerned. Because that is directly contradicted by the evidence we've had from the former First Minister. And, and his version of events is corroborated by uh, Duncan Hamilton and by Kevin Pringle. So I may have missed something. I, the idea that I, I thought his Alex Ammon's evidence was that Jeff had wanted to come to see me to brief me, and I, I wasn't asking to be briefed on matters. The request was Jeff wanted to to come and see me and might be in Parliament the following day. 
Well, I think if we read the, the evidence that's here from Duncan Hamilton, corroborated by Kevin Pringle, it's, it's clear that they're supporting the former First Minister's version of events. On what point? Not, I, I, I'm not, not your own. I don't I have it in here, but I'm not going to waste time hmm. digging it out. But in terms of the meeting on the 29th of March was requested by my office. Um, I'd have to just double check what Mr. Salmon mm. said in the official report about that. Um, he certainly said the meeting was pre-arranged. So I've, I've explained that bit, but the, I, I, I may be wrong here, I, but I was not of the view that he claimed it had been requested. Right, I will... Anyway, I'm uh, happy to yeah, come back. I, I can come back to that, I think. Can I suggest, exactly. Mr Fraser, that um, you go on to your other questions yeah. and we can ask our clerks to check that. Yeah, fine, I will, I will, I will do. Thank you, Convener. Um, you see, but this all comes back to the question of corroboration. I put this to you earlier because we, we had a conversation this morning about the claims that the name of a complainant had been passed on to uh, the former First Minister to Jeff Aberdeen and then to the former First Minister. Uh, and you said, well, you basically denied that, and I pointed out to you that these claims were corroborated by the evidence we've had. You've, I mean, why would, why would people like Duncan Hamilton and Kevin Pringle band together to make these claims I'm, if they I'm, weren't true? I'm not suggesting anybody's doing that. All I'm saying is Duncan and Kevin weren't in either of the conversations that, so what they were told about them, I can't speak to. There was a third person in the room on the 29th of March. I, you know, again, it would be somebody the committee was able to take private evidence from. Uh, so in a sense, how do I corroborate that? There was a third person in the, the room. Um, on the 29th of March, so I'll come back to something I said in my opening statement. I just, I absolutely accept that my, you know, forgetting about the meeting and then genuinely my recollection of the 29th of March not being as clear as I, I would like it to be is, is not helpful to me, uh, let alone anybody else. But I come back to this, why would I have gone to such great lengths to, to conceal the 29th of March? I don't think, if, if I had known everything on the 29th of March, the fact I was being told that he was in distress and might resign, I, I think I would probably still have agreed to see him. And my decisions around notifying, as I said, were not actually based on the classification of the meeting. They were based on my considerations of the independence and confidentiality of the process. So I don't, I don't think, had the 29th of March been something more than I am remembering, that it would have changed the course of things. So I come back to this. Why would I have gone to such great lengths? And the jeopardy of that to to sort of conceal that it happened. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make sense in, in my mind that I would have done that. I've now found the quote I was searching for and couldn't lay my finger on a moment ago. It's in paragraph 75 of the former First Minister's evidence. Uh, and he says this, I'll just quote it to you. He told me the meeting was going to take place on 29th March, as you know. Mr Aberdeen had been approached by another official who had brought him into the process. The meeting was taking place with a view to briefing Nicola and arranging for the meeting for 2nd of April. Again, we're getting into territory here that we were in earlier on where I've got to be um, c careful what I say, but it is not my uh, understanding that the meeting on the 29th of March was requested by my office. It was okay. uh, Jeff Aberdeen uh, wanting to come uh, to see me. Again, you know, these are people that can be heard from by the committee in private. Um, there was one other point I... Uh, I can't remember the other point I wanted to make, right. so it might come back to me. Okay. My apologies. Um, can I move on and talk briefly about the meeting on the 2nd of April? Um, because when we had um, Peter Murrell, your husband, in this committee sitting where you are now, I asked him about this meeting, and he was very clear in his view that this was a meeting on Scottish government business. And I pressed him on that because I was quite surprised that he was so adamant that that was his view, but that was very clearly his view. Now, perhaps when you got home, you had words with him, but uh, that was the position he took. I wouldn't have had words with him because I might have uh, thought doing so would have jeopardised me getting my tea uh, that night. So, um, look, he didn't know the basis of the meeting. So uh, he's also, uh, you know, appearing in front of a parliamentary committee like this one is not normal for any of us, but it's, it's more normal to sit in front of a parliamentary. He's not, you know, practised at sitting in front of a parliamentary committee. That was his 
I guess, assumption based on the fact I, I wasn't telling him what, what was going on. He didn't know the basis of, of the meeting, and I think he said that he was drawing from my, my evidence. But can I emphasise this point again? I think it might be the third or fourth time I've done it, and the reason I'm doing it is because I actually take responsibility for the confusion here. What I decided to do and not to do as a result of that meeting in terms of uh, notification under the ministerial code was not down to my classification of whether it was party or government. Um, I thought it was the meeting was, uh, I, I agreed to the meeting on party personal grounds. Clearly what he came to discuss with me was a, a government investigation. What I decided to do then though wasn't, I've got to say this was a party meeting and not a government so I don't have to notify it. My decision on that was based on what I've already set out my view that by telling people in the government that I knew would potentially compromise the independence and the confidentiality. So that is a bit that I think I have managed to convey properly, which is why I'm, I'm trying to, to explain that uh, today. So in a sense, this, oh, but if it was government, not party, so you must have breached the code, that was not the basis for the decisions I took around notification under the ministerial code. Well, you say that Mr Murray wasn't clear what the meeting was about, but he was very clear when he answered our questions, that he thought it was a government He meeting. was also, I've read, I've read all of the evidence, I've read his evidence. He was also, I think, uh, in fact, I know he was making the point that he was basing his answers on his interpretation of my written evidence. Um, but the point of the matter is, he, he wasn't in a position uh, to judge the basis of the meeting. So he was making assumptions uh, on the basis of of evidence that he had, had read. Do you think people giving evidence to a parliamentary committee under oath should make assumptions when they answer questions? Um, I think like I am doing today, people should try to, to be helpful. And, and I believe, uh, having read his evidence, that he did, he did uh, what, uh, he appeared before this committee on two occasions, and I believe he answered the questions okay. uh, appropriately and, uh, and truthfully. Okay. Um, after the former First Minister gave evidence here on Friday. A spokesman for the Scottish Government said there was no evidence to back up the claims he made. The committee has now found evidence. The committee has had corroboration of various statements he made from Duncan Hamilton and from Kevin Pringle, as we've pointed out to you. Would you withdraw your or would you withdraw the Scottish Government statement there's no evidence? It's quite um, clear there is evidence. Well I, I I wouldn't accept and this is not me questioning the the, the sincerity of the, the statements that have been made, but I don't believe that it adds up to, to what you're saying. You're, you're talking about people who weren't in either of the discussions, so they are reporting things that they were told. Now, you know, part of and it is hugely frustrating for me that, for reasons I t entirely understand, the people who were in these discussions, apart from me in relation to the 29th of March, are not able to give their accounts. Now, they can't do that publicly here for, for reasons that that we're all aware of. Um, they can do it to James Hamilton and you know, he will reach whatever conclusions he reaches. And I, as I say, it would be open to the committee to speak to them privately to get, to get uh, their accounts. So I, I don't accept uh, the, the assumptions and characterizations you were making. Um, I think when I was speaking last week um, about evidence, I, and you know, I would add to this more generally, but you know, I was specifically in many occasions, not many, a couple of occasions last week, talking about the complete lack of evidence of the suggestion that all of this was some plot that had been dreamt up against Alex Hammond, which there is, in my view, zero evidence of. OK, um, I, I don't want to get into plots. Well, I'm not, not interested in, in, in pursuing that. Um, but you, you being a lawyer will be well aware that contemporaneous statements count towards corroboration and therefore the evidence we have from Duncan Hamilton and Kevin Pringle points to contemporaneous statements. But can I just make the point, I, I, I'm not really making it as a lawyer, just as a, a, a person, you know, having contemporaneous statements from people who were told things when you haven't heard from the people who actually supposedly said them would seem to me to be a bit of a, a missing bit. Well, but, but you're still alleging, First Minister, that the source of all this, that Jeff Armbardine, is giving a false I'm, set of events. I'm not. I, I don't. I haven't heard Jeff's evidence directly. Jeff, you know, one of the the, the distressing personal things for this is the the relationships that have been collateral damage. Jeff is somebody that uh, I 
you know, think very highly of. I am fond of them. We've not uh, been able to speak because of, of this. So I'm, I'm not here to cast aspersions, but there are different accounts. And I think, you know, I was present on the 29th of March. I wasn't present in the other one. But, you know, the, the views of the people who were there to explain whether these are just clashing accounts or whether there is actually an explanation for a misunderstanding. I think hearing from the actual people is really an essential part of a process. If you're then, you know, you, you don't have the, the account that you are seeking to corroborate um, before you, you get to the corroborating evidence. Okay, you, you've accused Alex Salmon on a number of occasions of spreading dangerous conspiracy mm -hmm. theories. Aren't you effectively doing the same yourself by painting this group of individuals close to Alex Salmon as being part of a conspiracy? No. I haven't. I, point me to where I have said that. Well, you're suggesting you've just done it. You've just suggested that the, the evidence that we've been presented with I, I, may I, not be correct. I am suggesting I have not heard the direct account from Jeff Aberdeen. So I, I, I'm making the point that there are often different accounts of conversations, and unless you have heard from the people who had the conversation, there's a really big hole in the, the picture you're trying to construct. I am not here accusing anybody of anything. Um, I'm not doing that. I'm saying I have a different on one, I have a different understanding based on, on what I have been uh, told. And on the conversation that I was a party to, I've tried to the best of my recollection to, to give you an account of that. The uh, two other people in the room, Jeff Aberdeen and another individual, I, I, I don't know what the committee's seen from Jeff, but uh, on the other one, uh, hasn't heard from, so I'm not accusing anybody of a plot or a conspiracy or anything. I think there's probably been enough of that in this whole okay. episode. Okay. F finally, uh, Kamina, um, you you've said some very harsh things about the former First Minister. Now, as a, as a political opponent, I've said some harsh things about him myself, and others around the table have, but that might be expected from us. But, you know, you're an ally. You've been a close political friend of his for 30 years. You were his deputy when he was First Minister and succeeded him as, as leader of the SNP and First Minister. And all through that period, you told the Scottish people we should trust Alex Salmon. But he was a man of integrity and honour, not least when he was leading uh, your party to try and win the independence referendum. You're now telling us that we shouldn't believe a word he says. So when did you decide that Alex Salmon was no longer the Charles Stuart Parnell of Scotland, but was in fact a liar and a fantasist? I haven't used those words. And so I did all of, you know, this is where you get into deeply personal um, territory. Um, I've learned things about Alex Salmon over the past couple of years that have made me rethink uh, certain things I thought about him. Um, no doubt he would say the same about me because he's heard, said harsh things about me as well. And I've had to go through a process of, of reassessing all sorts of things around that. Um, and as I was watching him on Friday, lashing out, that's my words against us, I don't know whether he ever reflects on the fact that many of us, including me, feel very let down uh, by him. And, you know, that's, that's a matter of deep personal pain and regret for me. I, um, I think I probably should stop there. Um, well, fi finally then, I mean, do you not think, given that you asked us all to trust him for so long, you owe an apology to the people of Scotland for asking us to do that? I trusted him, and I am not going to apologise for the behaviour of somebody else. If I have things in my behaviour to apologise for, I will apologise. But I do not think it is reasonable to ask me to apologise for the behaviour, some of which he will deny, of course, of Alex Hammond. I think the only person who should apologise for any behaviour on his part, which he was asked to do on Friday and failed to do, uh, is Alex Hammond. Thank you. OK, thank you. I think this is an appropriate... Uh, time to be saying time has run on and I still have three members, First Minister, who wish to, to question you. Um, but I'm also at the point uh, where in line with the agreed mitigations to allow us to meet safely in person today, I have to suspend the this, this session. Uh, so I think we should reconvene at half past four and aim to be finished for five o'clock. 
Can I remind members and everyone else to observe social distancing when leaving the committee room and during the break? And I suspend this session.
Uh, welcome back, everyone, to the 15th meeting of this committee in 2021, to the evidence session with the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, MSP. I can confirm that Ms Sturgeon took the affirmation at the start of this morning's evidence session. Uh, we have three question, questioners left um, to talk about the Ministerial Code. Um, I intend to finish this meeting at five o'clock, so I would ask the three questioners all to bear that in mind in their timings and to be fair to each other. I first of all have Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, just um, two, maybe three brief points. In your written submission to the <coughs> Committee in Annex A, um, page six, you say, this is in relationship to the 29th of March 2018 meeting, you say, Mr Aberdeen was in Parliament to see a former colleague and while there came to see me. Do you know who that former colleague was? Um, I, I do. I'm not going to name somebody, a, a colleague who had been a colleague of his, a civil servant, I should say, um, a colleague of, of mine who had a significant birthday. Um, and it, that is what I had been told that meant he, as well as wanting to see me, may also be a reason for him being in the, the building. So two meetings that day that you, at least, that you knew? I, I have no idea. I just know that he was uh, there at the, the kind of okay. birthday celebration for the, the colleague. Thanks very much. Now, turn to the Ministerial Code itself. This is your version of the Ministerial Code, uh, 2018. Um, must confess I hadn't read the Ministerial Code in such detail until recently. Um, but given the significance that's attached to the independent panel, the independent advisers, and Mr Salmon told us last week, of course, that he'd established the independent panel, which seems to me to be a good, a good idea to investigate breaches, and alleged breaches of the ministerial code. It's curious that, um, and this is just a general observation on the ministerial code, that at 1.7, this is the only reference to um, referring matters to independent advisers. It's just four lines long. Um, I'm just wondering whether that's appropriate because, um, and you might want to reflect on this, it's not directly related to the, uh, this inquiry, but it is direct, well, it is actually quite directly related to this inquiry because in the, in, when you self-referred yourself to the independent advisor, um, it was set out in an inspired question on the 3rd of August 2020 by Claire Adamson, that, um, which John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister, responded to, that uh, the self-referral was on the grounds of 422 and 423. Um, later on, uh, following a letter from my colleague Alex Cole Hamilton and others, um, uh, questioning whether in fact Mr Hamilton should also look at 1C, um, my understanding is that Mr Hamilton came back and said indeed he was looking at it all. I'm just wondering about the propriety of having a process where someone refers themselves to the, an independent advisor on one ground. Uh, should it not just be the case that uh, as a matter of course, as a matter of routine, as a matter of policy, in fact, in the ministerial code, it should be a reference to an alleged breach of the code, and it's up to the independent advisor to decide which, if any, their grounds have been breached. Um, yeah, I think that's reasonable. Um, I, what I don't recall is whether, uh, I'm certainly not aware of any uh, deliberate change to the provision in this version of the code versus previous ones, there may be, but I, I, I'm not aware of them. Um, and, but yeah, I think I, I can't, obviously I'm not going to try and sit here and speak for, for Mr. Hamilton, he'll speak for himself, but my understanding of how he is doing this is, yeah, if he sees anything relevant that he thinks is engaged with the ministerial code, he will, he will look at that. Just to maybe remind members that the, the reason originally the 422423, if, if you cast your mind back, and I, I don't have the official report of this sitting in front of me, but... The, the week that the judicial review uh, was conceded and I made the statement and set out the contacts I'd had with Alec, the, the First Minister's questions uh, time that week, um, I think from memory it was uh, Richard Leonard that posed these questions, was specifically on uh, my failure to, to notify the meeting and that was the request for it. So that's the genesis of the, the referral being on these particular points. But, Look, there's no, I have no interest in constraining this review. I, I want to be able to set out the actions I've taken and get uh, a view on my conduct 
in terms of the ministerial code. I don't want people to be able to come back afterwards and say, no, no, but it didn't look at the right thing. So my view is that Mr Hamilton should uh, be completely unconstrained in anything he wants to look at or say. And just finally, in your foreword to the ministerial code, you say, I will lead by example in following the letter and spirit of this code. And I expect that ministers and civil servants will do likewise. Can you confirm that following the report from Mr Hamilton that you will indeed lead by example in following the letter and spirit of this code in respect of any findings that he makes? I will, in everything I do as First Minister, seek to do it appropriately and properly and by the, the highest standards. And it's for other people to judge that. When I've been asked this question before, will you do X? If he uh, says, no, I know that, but, but I'm, I'm trying to explain. I am not trying to dodge that. I, I just think it is not, or it is not unreasonable for me to say, let Mr. Hamilton do his work and report, and then I will respond to whatever his report. No, I understand says. that, but you've made a commitment in the foreword here. I, look, I will I, lead by example in following the letter and spirit. And I'm just inviting you to agree that that's indeed absolutely. what you will do. Absolutely, I. I believe that. I try to do my best to do that every day in this job. It's for others to judge whether I fail, succeed or fall somewhere in between. I take very seriously the, the, the obligations and the privileges and uh, the, everything that comes with this job. And for me, um, the Office of First Minister um, and all that comes with that is bigger and more important than any individual incumbent of it. Thanks. Give me that. Thank you. I have Jackie Bailey and then Margaret Mitchell, and please bear in, time, in mind the time that we have left. I, I will certainly try, convener. Um, can I start with the precursor meetings to the 29th of March, where Jeff Aberdeen was told by a senior member of your team about the complaints? Were you aware of those meetings? I have answered these questions already today, convener, to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can add anything within the legal constraints I am under to what but I have already said about, about these matters. No, there are no legal constraints to you telling me whether you were aware of the meetings. Uh, no, to the best of my knowledge, I wasn't. You weren't. So a senior member of your team had meetings um, that you knew nothing about. Uh, that will not be um, as unusual as you might think it is, Ms okay. Bailey. I don't know what every member of my team is doing every minute of the day. OK, but a senior member of your team talking about complaints against the former First Minister would be quite significant, I you, think you would agree. We're, we're going back over previous ground here. Yep. I am not accepting the, the premise of your question, that what you are claiming it happened at a particular meeting, actually happened. And, and that's where I, I'm going to start repeating myself and we're going to go over all the same ground. No, I'm, I'm not talking about complainers or the names of complainers. I am, I'm talking about the fact of complaints. Um, look, I, I, um, I was not at these meetings. Um, the people who were at these meetings have not been heard of and therefore I'm not going to comment on meetings that I was not party to beyond what I've said already. No, no, I, I understand you weren't there. I understand you weren't party to those meetings. What I'm asking, I'm not asking about the complainer. What I'm asking about is, did you know that there were meetings to discuss the fact that there were complaints? Uh, no. You didn't? OK. The 29th of March meeting was pre-arranged. We understand. Oh, um, I've checked it. It was jointly arranged by a senior member of your team, along with Mr Aberdeen. It was, according to the evidence we've received, to discuss complaints. Were you aware of that in advance? I was aware, I, I think I've set this out already today, I was aware that Jeff wanted to see me, that he might be in Parliament the next day, and I was given a broad indication that it was about concerns about Alex Salmond uh, that he wanted to see me about. OK. A broad indication was given by a senior member of your team? Yes. OK. Um, did the indication at any stage say that there were complaints in train? Uh, in terms of specific complaints, that was not, uh, I've, I've gone through this, that was not uh, what I uh, was aware of at that point. I uh, had an awareness uh, that Jeff wanted to see me, that it was about you know, concerns about Alex Hammond. I've gone through what, the, from my recollection, Jeff uh, then told me, and I've also gone through the, uh, what happened on the 2nd of April in terms of uh, Alex Hammond showing me the letter from the Permanent Secretary. OK, I'm going to come on to the 2nd of April in a minute, but, but I'm curious to know that, you know, according to Jeff Aberdeen, he was coming on the 29th of March to discuss complaints. You're telling me you didn't know that that was the case? 
It depends what you mean. If you mean by complaints, as in the specific complaints, I knew he was coming to see me about a general concern about Alec. I've said on the uh, 29th of March, he shared with me that the, there was an issue around a harassment uh, concern um, and that he wanted me to see uh, Alec. I, have, I, I keep saying this not because I'm uh, trying to be difficult here. I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I have not seen Jeff Aberdeen's account. So I'm being asked to comment on something I have not directly seen. Um, but my understanding is Jeff Aberdeen's account was given in court under oath. Um, I wasn't in court. Uh, it was widely and, reported. And I, well, so what I have heard in terms of Jeff Aberdeen, I've, I've seen something reported in uh, the media that I believe to be an account of Jeff Aberdeen, but I don't know that for sure. Um, and I've heard Alex Salmond's account of uh, the, the 29th of March. I have not... I, I don't know what this committee's had from Jeff Aberdeen. I have not seen it. OK. But given that he gave this information on oath in court, and knowing what you know about Jeff Aberdeen, one could safely assume it's true. Look, I, I can I interrupt here? I think this is starting to become inappropriate because it's referring directly to the court case. Uh, and I'm not but convinced it's adding any value to this. And we have heard the First Minister many times give her view on what happened on the 29th of March. Thank you very much, convener. The difficulty is I'm not entirely um, satisfied with the responses that we've received. I, I was not in court. I didn't hear the evidence I accept that, that. Jeff I wasn't, gave. I wasn't and therefore, I, you say Jeff said things in court on oath. I, I, don't, I didn't hear that evidence. I said openly in my opening statement, if the accounts that I have heard attributed to Jeff are the case, then it is clear I have a different recollection to the level of detail of that discussion. And okay. I, I said that okay. I said it openly in my opening remarks, and I've said it uh, so far uh, in several occasions since yeah. then. Can I ask you about the meeting on the 2nd of April, where, um, according to Duncan Hamilton QC, he notes in his evidence that the only matter discussed at the meeting were the complaints against Mr Salmond. Is that correct? At the meeting, once yes. Alec had taken me into a private room and showed me the Permanent Secretary's letter, that was the, the focus of the meeting, yes. OK, so there was no discussion about him leaving the SNP or anything like no, that? No, I, I said, I think, in response to uh, somebody previously, that I had believed that that was possibly something he was going to come and discuss with me. I think I said openly, it was very clear to me, very quickly in that discussion that that was not actually what he was going to suggest. So uh, there wasn't a discussion about him uh, considering resigning. That was one of the things, though, I thought in advance of that meeting was a possibility. OK. In advance of the meeting, you thought he would resign for what reason? Uh, the way it was put to me uh, from recollection is that this would be part of... he was being accused of something serious to my, what I took from it I can't remember clearly how much of this was expressed was that he may be thinking of resigning from the SNP to, as he handled this what I took from that would be to try to protect the party from the the implications of it is what my assumption was to be clear though that was not uh, as it turned out what he wanted to talk to me about but you had to have made that assumption in advance if you thought that he was yes. going to stand down from the party to clear his name. Yes. You knew prior to the 2nd of April what the problem was. I knew there was a problem, um, and I, it had been suggested to me, on what basis I don't know, that he might be... Mm -hmm. Part of how he might handle this problem would be to, to resign from the SNP. Um, and actually, that was the re one of the reasons why I was being asked to and that I agreed to meet with him. As it transpired on the 2nd of April, it was clearly not what was in his mind and therefore not what was the, the subject of discussion. Okay. But you said to Stuart Macmillan that you thought he would stand down from the party mm. to clear his name. So you needed to have known in advance of the meeting on the 2nd of April exactly what he was trying to clear his name from. No, I, I think that leap of logic is quite something. Mm, I, knew I don't think that so. I, I had a belief that there was a problem. He was being accused of something. Um, I, I've been open about that. I had that belief going into the 2nd of April. But he sat me down on the 2nd of April and showed me the letter from the Permanent mm. Secretary. So I had a general idea that there was something that he... And clear his name is my 
my description of this right now, which may be part of me kind of looking back on this, I'm not saying that is what uh, Jeff said or was the terminology that was used, but there was a problem. I knew there was a problem on the 29th of March. I knew the general nature of it, and it was suggested. I don't know, or I can't recall whether Jeff said on exactly whether it's because Alec had said it or whether Jeff was just surmising that that might be something that was in his mind. Okay. You, you framed a number of responses to different members of the committee as um, what did I think and do as the First Minister after Alex Hammond asked me to intervene. That was entirely on the basis of it being wrong as the First Minister, but you told us, you told the Parliament that you were there as party leader. Was it just that you were there as First Minister? I went, no, I went to that meeting um, on the 2nd of April, uh, and I, you know, I said, people can now read, and no doubt lots of people will have listened to my opening statement. The reason, the basis on which I agreed to the meeting on the 2nd of April was firstly, Jeff was, seemed very concerned about Alex's state of mind and well-being. Um, I was at that time his friend. I, I wanted to, to see him on that basis. And there was this sense that there was a, a serious issue that might affect uh, his, his status in the party. So I agreed to meet on the party uh, personal basis. Uh, clearly what he showed me was a government, uh, a letter relating to a government investigation. If I had been intervening, I would have been doing so as First Minister. I would have had no locus to intervene at that stage in that procedure as party leader. I'd have been doing that as First Minister. So clearly my decision on whether or not to intervene in the way he was asking me to would have been as First Minister. But, but you would have been clear by the end of the meeting, surely, that this was a government matter and not a party matter. So why then didn't you report it to the civil service? I, so I've gone through this, I think, uh, two or three times now, um, and I, you know... I'll do I, it for a fourth. I'm going to, because it Good. is a really important point. My decisions about notification were not based on the classification of the meeting. I didn't think, if I say it's a party meeting, I don't have to report it. And I, I, I can maybe take responsibility for giving the impression that, that that was the case. The reason I didn't report it was because... I think if I had reported it, I would have compromised the independence and the, the privacy, the confidentiality of the process. So that was the basis on which I, I took that decision. And, you know, people can look at the, the relevant sections of the ministerial code. I, I doubt very much that anybody involved in writing the ministerial code had these particular circumstances in mind when they, they wrote it. That perhaps is an issue that should be dealt with in the ministerial code, a situation of this nature. These provisions in the ministerial code are to guard against undisclosed influence on decisions a minister is taking. I judged this was the opposite of that and that I would risk the independence and the confidentiality of the process more if I intervene, if I made my knowledge known, uh, than I would if I didn't know. That, that is a matter, that is absolutely a matter that James Hamilton has been asked to uh, consider and to give his view on. But Duncan Hamilton reported, and he was in the room, that if it comes to it, I will intervene, were the words he used. Now, sitting silent could be entirely misconstrued. I mean, I think you would accept that, because you sat silent, and my understanding of the ministerial code is that there are no exemptions. It doesn't say if you're likely to breach privacy or confidentiality, then don't report. It requires you to report. And actually, the breach of confidentiality was achieved at that meeting on the 2nd of April. With the benefit of hindsight, would you report something like this again immediately? Um, no, I'm not sure I, I mm. would. In the, uh, and... You, you've all spent months on this committee, so you've thought about uh, years. Yeah. Um, is that true? Years. Yeah. <laughs> of course it's true. Um, and you'll have thought about all of these things. I'm prepared to, um, I, I'm prepared to go out on a limb here and say that you probably haven't thought about these things as often and as much as, as I have over the period. I've agonised over every decision and every step I took in this process. I have searched my soul on this on a personal level, a political level, a government level. But on that particular decision, I did not intervene. I didn't try to influence this process. If I had picked up the phone or 
told the civil service I knew, my worry was that that act in itself might have been influencing the process because suddenly you've got civil servants even just subliminally thinking, oh, what does she think we should be doing about this? And the, the publication requirements of that, potentially, you know, when people, as they would have done, would have said, what were you meeting Alex Salmond for? Potentially the confidentiality is, is breached. So that, that was the, the decision I took. James Hamilton will come to view on whether he thinks that was, was right or wrong. I simply point to the fact that there are other parts of the ministerial code that also put responsibilities on me to respect the confidentiality of government business and, the, and respect the impartiality of civil servants. I, I, you know, before this year, I would have said this was the most difficult set of decisions I've ever had to take. I think after this year, that is probably not the case. But the personal, political, governmental nature of all of this made this a really invidious situation. I, I don't say that to ask for a free pass. I, you, you expect First Ministers to deal with difficult situations properly. But it really, the combination of all of this was horrendously difficult. And I tried to reach the best judgments. Maybe people decide I didn't. But that, you know, I have to be able to satisfy myself that I, I did the things that I thought were right at the time as well as I could. And that's what I've tried, uh, I've thought a lot about. And I believe I'm sitting here saying I think I've reached the best judgments I could. Ms Bailey, please questions. leave space convener. for the deputy. Yeah, I, I am trying, but I hope we can just run over. I think we should exhaust well, the questions. Well, no, I have to say, then. I think an eight-hour meeting this goes, is um, pretty this, fair. This goes um, to an issue of judgment. Um, please. You met Jeff Aberdeen on the 29th of March. You met Alex Salmond on the 2nd of April in your home. You had telephone contact with him on the 23rd of April. Messages were exchanged on the 1st of June. The 3rd of June, 7th of June, you met in Aberdeen. Meetings in July, including one on the 14th of July in your home. Given what you are saying about his behaviour, why did you keep meeting him? Yeah, I think these are reasonable questions, and you're absolutely right. This does go to issues of judgment. I think I made the right, appropriate judgments overall. Other people in the same situation as me might have done different things. That's the complexity of, of these situations we face. Thank you for... Uh, reminded me of something I came in here after the last break meaning to do, which was correct. I think I referred to a meeting earlier on as being on the 13th of July, when in actual fact it was the 14th uh, of July, um, which is set out previously. Look, I, I was dealing with a situation that involved somebody who was, you know, the former First Minister facing a government investigation, uh, the former leader of my party, where this potentially had huge, has had huge implications for my party, and somebody that was a really close friend of mine um, that I, you know, I cared about. And all of these things led me to, to make these decisions and try to balance them overall in a way that I thought was appropriate. Um, I've ex I've, we've talked a lot about 29th of March and 2nd of April. I've set out the reasons why I decided to meet on the 7th of June. I think the 14th of July, you could actually say, why did I do that? And I've that's the one I've said, why did I do that? And, you know, I think, I know why I did it. I, I, was, I still had this worry that this might be about to erupt. And I, I, I was still concerned about him. And I felt, and I'm, I'm just going to say this, I felt, I still felt, despite everything, a, a loyalty to him. Um, and, and that's why I made these decisions. And... You know, people will have to decide whether they think I was right or wrong. But I tried to, and the the, the thing I was absolutely adamant about is that I would not, on his behalf, despite all I've just said about loyalty and friendship, I would not try to influence this process in the way he wanted to me to, because I think that would have been inappropriate. And, and that is the touchstone on this uh, that I believe I, I was right to do. I know I've heard... This afternoon, different views on that, but I believe that was the right decision to make. Finally, convener, um, you said to Andrew Ma in 2018 um, that, that you had not heard any complaints about Alex Salmond. It was an unequivocal denial. Yet you've told us today about an alleged incident that you had knowledge of at Edinburgh Airport in 2017. Did you just get it wrong? Um, 
so I, I think I've set this out already today. I, in that interview, I, I think two things have been conflated now. I think from how I remember that interview, I was answering that question. I can't speak for Andrew Marr about the basis on which he was asking the question. I was asking, I was answering the question about the, the government complaints. The Sky thing, yes, I've set out the, the suspicion and the lingering concern that left me with, but that had never, you know, at that time materialised. I was also at that point, um, and this applies to, to the period, uh, quite a long period after that, I was aware there were other proceedings potentially underway. I was trying on this issue not to say any more than I, I had to. So, you know, look, these are all things that I, I accept. I accepted at nine o'clock or after nine when I made my initial statement. I, I'm not, I've never been, um, maybe this is one of the differences between me and Alex Salmond. I've never tried to pretend I'm infallible. I've never tried to pretend I don't get things wrong. So there will be things on this that I look back, I think, and you know, maybe I, I wish I'd done that better and, and done it differently. And if that's the case, I, you know, I'm sorry about that. I tried to do these things as best as best I could. Thank you, convener. Okay, uh, Ms. Mitchell, we only have a few minutes left, so if you could be brief. Please. If you don't mind, this is important, convener. Ms. Mitchell, um, I have just asked you to convener. be brief. Would you please do so? I was quite right. clear when I felt the meeting should close. I can allow a couple of minutes leeway, but I'm not going to well, allow another 15, 20 minutes. I won't minutes. be able to put the same questions I would want to to the first minister. Well, we'll could you see please what progress carry we'll on instead first of wasting minister, time? Transparency, openness, and accountability is what we established at the very beginning is essential for any government to establish trust with the electorate. And responding to the fact that no one so far has taken any responsibility at all for the catastrophe, catastrophic fallout um, from the com government's complaint handling that cost almost a million pounds to the taxpayer. Your uh, response is perhaps you've been too understanding to those who made mistakes. Now that includes very highly qualified individuals with gilt-edged um, pensions earning what the normal Scot would, uh, would um, deem as eye-watering salaries, who under oath have had or developed collective amnesia, uh, have managed to forget about texts and other correspondence, have had to come back to the committee repeatedly and correct their evidence. The independence of our civil service matters, but what appears to be here, either we've got the most incompetent civil servants under the sun, some of them look like the head, and that's doing such an injustice to our excellent civil service here, and that's, that's regrettable. Or after 13 years, the independence and the lines have been blurred. Is that a possibility? Does it concern you? If you don't mind, I'll leave your questions to the end, given the constraints, the, uh, your answers to the end that the convener has put on me. We've also heard evidence, and this is definitely abuse of the ministerial code, from the former First Minister that there has been an abuse of power in leadership. And to substantiate um, the abuse of power allegations, your response has been well, where is the evidence? Can you turn you to the official report and um, just exactly the problem with providing that evidence, which our committee has also experienced? And this is what Alex Salmond says. I be here before you under the explicit threat of prosecution if I reveal evidence for which the committee has asked. Not to fulfil my oath and tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, would be contempt. But the Crown Office says it might lead to prosecution. I put it to you, First Minister, anyone looking in isolation at this process would assume that this was an inquiry process put in place by some tin pot dictatorship. Furthermore, it's deeply damaging to the proud and um, well-respected system of justice in Scotland and it leads it into disrepute and open ridicule and it's taken by the decision of the Crown to establish that 
Jigsaw identification is an absolute which could possibly lead to um, a breach of Lady Dorian's order and a contempt of court. And this is underdeveloped. It's a concept that was rejected at Westminster in 1989 when they were drafting and implement implementation problems. So one thing to you now, um, First Minister, is you're saying what matters to you. Well, Alex Salmond laid out quite clearly what matters to him. And it should matter to everyone here, because what people are asking is if the former First Minister can find himself on the, the dock and in the kind of situation where he's almost um, facing imprisonment because of what he um, alleges is a, bruce, bruce, uh, uh, a breach, um, an abuse of power, then he says, and I agree, the independent civil service matters, the independence of the Crown and officers acting in the public interest matters, acting in cordons with legal advice matters, concealing evidence from courts matters, the duty of candour of public authority matters, litigation at any cost but to assist the court in reaching the correct um, result and thereby improve standards in public administration matters. And above all, democratic accountability through Parliament matters. And what we found is the Parliament cannot and does not have the power to hold the Scottish Government to, um, to account. So collectively, these events and this inquiry has shone a line on what I think is uh, a worrying deficit and a centralisation of power. And it matters when we've got a pandemic and police have got exceptional powers and you, First Minister, have got exceptional powers. And we're shortly to have an election. And if the uh, SNP were, were to be elected again, there would be no checks and balances on these powers. Ms Mitchell, I'm going and to stop matters. you there. Could you respond, Mitchell, please, no, First Ms, Minister? Ms Mitchell, I'm going to stop you there. because I, Ms Mitchell, I think some of your remarks have been inappropriate. And I think there's an awful lot in there that was your own rhetoric rather than questions. It was in the official report. Yes, I know, I you read it out. For. I'm telling the question. Miss Mitchell, would you please let me as convener Certainly. say what I have to say? Thank you. I think some of the language you used was inappropriate, whether it was in the official report or not. I think your tone was somewhat inappropriate at times. I think it was difficult to see what questions were actually being asked. So I will ask the First Minister to respond to anything she picked up that she feels she is able to respond to. First okay. Um, firstly, who wins the Scottish election is a matter for the Scottish people. Nobody else. Um, Secondly, I sit here in front of this committee today, as is my duty. You know, we've sat here for many hours. I've tried to answer all of the questions as fully as I can. Um, but, you know, in advance of my uh, evidence today, yesterday, um, I read comments uh, from uh, others in the parliament that literally said it didn't matter what I said today because they had decided I was guilty. So forgive me if I think there are comments around due process and, and proper process that I could perhaps make in, in return. But I, I just say that and I will, I will stop there. Um, let me just take a few points. Um, the civil service, the civil service made very serious mistakes here. And, you know, we will see what comes out of this committee's recommendations and the internal process that is underway. And if there are decisions that need to be taken as a result of that, they will be taken. I am not defending the mistakes that were made, but the civil service in Scotland acts properly and impartially at all time. And I am going to say this very bluntly. I am privileged uh, to have a, a, an impartial, independent uh, civil service uh, serving this government. And if the people of Scotland on May the 6th take a decision to have another government, that civil service will serve uh, the new government just as professionally as and impartially as it does this one. And I, I think the, the accusations that have been made about the, the, the lack of independence or impartiality of the civil service are deeply unfair and more importantly, unfounded, notwithstanding mistakes that are made in any organisation at times. Similarly with the Crown, the Crown acts independently of government. 
Uh, the Crown has, in respect of evidence, uh, shared in a criminal trial that was not uh, disclosed, not handed over, has been operating within the law. The law passed by this parliament that said the information shared in a criminal trial could not be. That was an absolute, there weren't exemptions, but this committee has had and has exercised the right to use Scotland Act powers to get that information. Again, I would suggest that is a system working, not a system not working. And I also think the attacks that have been made on the independence of our criminal justice system and the Crown Office are also unfair and deeply unfounded. In terms of uh, issues around uh, contempt of court order, uh, that is an order that was put in place by Lady Dorian. Um, that order uh, has to be uh, abided by and interpreted and you know, the Crown Office have a duty there to, to uphold the law. There are issues that have been raised in the course of this and this Parliament in the next session may well want to look at this about whether there should be greater privilege and immunity for this Parliament in terms of contempt of court, more akin to Westminster. I think that is a perfectly legitimate issue. But anybody who's suggesting that any of these things have happened in a way that is untoward, I think is, is wrong. These are uh, examples of the law operating, which takes me, I suppose, to my final point in answer to, to Margaret Mitchell here. Um, I know what Alex Hammond has said. I know what version of this Alex Hammond wants people uh, to, to believe. And I know why, because I suppose when, uh, well, I know why. But what happened here with Alex Hammond is no different to what would have happened with any individual. People came forward with complaints, first to the Scottish government, then to the police. They did so of their own free will, um, and I've said before, you know, these people, I don't know the identities of every single one of them. The police investigated those independently as they would have done regardless of who these complaints had been about. The Crown Office, as it does every day, assesses the evidence and decided that there was a case to answer and then a court and a jury did its job. There have been mistakes made in this and I think there is a lot of learning to be done, not partly because of the narrative around this, but I would put it to people that when it's seen in the terms of what actually happened, this is an example of the institutions of the country, the independent institutions of the country doing their job. And actually out of this comes the message that no matter how powerful you are or were, no matter your status or connections, if you are accused of serious uh, offences, then they will be investigated and you will have the chance to defend yourself in court. And that is how these things should work. Mistakes have been made by government and that is undeniable. But the idea that because somebody doesn't like what happened over the past couple of years, we allow this attack to be made on the very fundamentals of our democracy, I just find deeply distressing, deeply unfair. And actually, whatever you think about me, the SNP, the Scottish Government, uh, I think deeply injurious to the, the health and well-being of our democracy. And I, I really think all of us uh, should think long and hard about it. No. Um, First Minister, can I um, take that? You see these as your closing remarks? I think I probably should take those as my closing remarks. Yes. Can I thank you then um, for your evidence today, for spending so long with this committee? Uh, thank you very much. And the committee will now have a short break and reconvene virtually for a private session. This session is suspended. <laughs>